Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Second day of our uh, APELS course. Um, actually, I think today's introduction should be run by um, Dr. Rao. TV. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the APELS course being held in India. APELS is an organization that was started with an idea to train and also to identify talent in this part of the Asia Pacific region. The entire thing has been the brainchild of our chairman, uh, Professor Michael Lee, who has been spending days and nights and months and years uh, to make this a very good organization to train and also identify talent of young surgeons who are interested in endoscopy and laparoscopy and take this speciality of endoscopy laparoscopy to a next level. Uh, on behalf of all the board members, actually, uh, sincerely, we all thank uh, Professor Michael Lee for his untiring efforts to make this uh, association. Uh, started very recently, a very naive organization, but it has become very popular among both endoscopists and surgeons. And I see a lot of endoscopists who are already in association because of the amount of viewership that we get on this and the, uh, the quality of uh, presentations that are being made and the quality of transmission that are being done. Thank you so much, Michael, for all the uh, positive things that you keep telling us to, and you're the driving force behind all of us. Uh, the first day of transmission has been uh, uh, very well. Actually, both the lectures and the live demonstrations have gone off well and uh, we've got good feedback. There are some uh, things actually which we will try to rectify the thing. Uh, all this is basically because of uh, good faculties that were chosen both from India and abroad. And uh, uh, thank, uh, we sincerely thank all the faculty for putting in those lot of effort to make sure that the content that is delivered is optimally uh, useful for all the viewers, uh, up, especially the upcoming surgeons and endoscopists who are interested in this. And uh, again, it's a, it's, the credit goes to Professor Michael Lee, who is uh, now who identified this endolaparoscopic cooperative surgery as a new specialty. I mean, it's his concept that this is going to be an upcoming specialty. And already we see that uh, it's, uh, it's become part and parcel of almost all the conferences that we hold. Interoperative endo endoscopy, as uh, Michael has pointed out as, uh, yesterday, actually it is another big thing that is going to be make a very big impact in the uh, practice and I, I'm sure it is going to become a separate speciality and we'll have sessions dedicated to this in the upcoming conferences. Uh, thank you, Michael, for this. Uh, so today's the second day of session. Actually, we have uh, uh, a lot of people logged in. Uh, we have very good faculty chosen to give the best of the lectures uh, in relation to endoscopy, laparoscopy, and some sort of endolaparoscopy cooperative surgery. And we also have some live demonstration in the afternoon. I hope uh, we'll enjoy viewing the different types of procedures that are being done in endoscopy, uh, which are both competitive and complementary to laparoscopy. Now it's no more competitive. We are talking about cooperative surgery right now. Uh, with these few words, actually, uh, I think uh, Tadora will run some slides. Uh, Tadora, you have any slides to run through just to as a warm-up session? Yeah, uh, this is actually, uh, we wanted to get some feedback. Apples as an organization. Uh, we're trying to reach as many surgeons and endoscopists in Asia Pacific region and also across the globe. So we just wanted to know, uh, where did you hear APELS live webinar course? Where, where are you hearing this from? Are you from the Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, APELS website, or your supervisors or from colleagues or friends? And uh, the question two, Fantastic, actually. Again, actually, we all knew about it. Actually, uh, uh, Apple seems to be very popular on Facebook and the quality of transmission and uh, quality of uh, information or the tweezer, uh, tw uh, tweezer that are put up about the, about the meeting are quite excellent. Actually, we congratulate the entire Apple Secretariat for put putting out those beautiful teasers for the meeting. Actually, thank you, the entire Adora, for this uh, beautiful uh, tweezer. Uh, messages that we have. Now, what is your expectation joining April's live webinar? Uh, can I see the entire thing? Actually, I'm not able to see the entire. Uh, you're right. 
Now, basically, the questions asked were to increase my confidence levels, improve complication management, learn about latest technology and skills, make connections with experts and friends. Like all, all of these things are important, actually. But again, you see this, this thing is very important. Learn about latest technology and skills. Actually, again, Michael, this is what your brainchild again, endolaparoscopic surgery. So that's what they want to learn about now. Latest technologies that you want so that they can uh, implement their, their clinical practice. Uh, uh, do you think COVID-19 has changed surgical training program forever? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. We have learned a lot of things uh, during COVID period to see how surgeries have to be done, how patients have to be managed, how infections can be controlled. Actually, something uh, dramatic that has happened in COVID period is actually because so much of precautions being taken. All these days, we are trying to protect ourselves. We wear masks and uh, this thing to protect the ourselves from infections. But now, see, once you started protecting these patients and once so much of sanitization measures are being taken, the infection rates in COVID patients seem to be dramatically decreased. I think we should say, uh, continue to practice similar thing in the current day uh, surgical practice so that the patients are the ultimate uh, beneficiaries of this. Uh, thank you, Kadara, for those questions. Actually, with this, actually, I would hand over the mic to our chairman, Michael Lee, for his introductory remarks. And then we go on to the live transmission and we go to the initial talks, uh, which will be moderated by Professor Philip Chiu from Hong Kong. Michael? Philip, you're on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> it's my great uh, pleasure to uh, chair this uh, session. Um, so uh, now I think uh, uh, we'll start um, the uh, talks. Uh, so uh, I think I wish to uh, introduce the first uh, speaker, um, who, uh, who is uh, Professor uh, Makhar uh, Ingo, uh, who is uh, currently um, the uh, head of department uh, of uh, gastroenterology at the uh, Lok Manya uh, Tinak uh, Med and Municipal Medical College and General Hospital in the Sion, Mumbai. And uh, he is going to tell us about the uh, basic endoscopy for surgeon. Professor Ingo, please. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Philip for that introduction. Uh, I at the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers of APLS for uh, inviting me to this uh, endolab surgery in GI practice uh, live uh, webinar. And uh, uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, uh, start my talk. So uh, uh, my talk was, uh, is basically basic endoscopy uh, for surgeon. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Nageshwar Reddy has, uh, without doubt, uh, emphasized and told us the importance of why the surgeon, uh, lab surgeon or a GI surgeon or a general surgeon should know uh, flexible endoscopy. And uh, once we have uh, 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 confirmed that thing, we need to now go ahead with how the surgeon or what should the surgeon know in endoscopy? And uh, yesterday's talk only, Professor Eddie uh, told about the basic endoscopy and advanced endoscopy for surgeons who would like to take endoscopy as their uh, uh, primary skill. So for basic endoscopy, uh, I would be discussing about what the surgeon should know the least he needs to know for his day-to-day -day practice so that it can he can uh, enhance his uh, skill of surgery as well as his uh, patient management. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, what actually is endoscopy? Well, it comes uh, from Greek word. Everything that we use in modern uh, medicine has generally come from the Greeks, which means endo means inside and scoping means to see. And uh, 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 physicians or surgeons for centuries have always been uh, interested in knowing what is uh, inside the human body. And endoscopy allows us 
to see the examination of a hollow viscous by a special instrument endoscope in real time and it is actually a minimally invasive uh, medical procedure used to evaluate the interior of an organ we all know that uh, it got started off as a rigid uh, instrument has now become a fully uh, uh, flexible instruments with attachments of uh, microchip cameras at the at the tip which allows us to see uh, a, a greatly magnified image and what started actually as a predominantly diagnostic modality has now gradually become a very important therapeutic tool in the management of gi disorder and surgeons are involved in therapy more than diagnosis so for surgeons this is a very important and i would say a tool which now in the coming era the surgeons especially lab or the gi surgeons can't do without before we start Certain landmarks like uh, in uh, therapeutic uh, endoscopy, like ERCP, polypectomies, uh, uh, were evolved in the late uh, 1900s, and most of it, if not all, were developed by surgeons. It was gradually that the surgeons became more busy with their surgical practice that medical gastroenterologists or endoscopists started taking after the therapeutic part of it. However, the initial diagnostic and basic therapeutic uh, uh, modalities should be known to the surgeons in today's day and age in the next in this slide i would like to show various procedures which were earlier done by surgical modalities however have been taken over by uh, by endoscopic treatment uh, for example just to name a few is endoscopic foreign body removal uh, stricture dilatation uh, bariatric endoscopies uh, removal of cbd stones pancreatic fluid collection drainage which were predominantly uh, a surgeon's uh, preview has now been taken over by endoscopists and that's why surgeons should know basic endoscopy this is how a, a flexible endoscope looks like uh, i'm sure most of us are aware of the various parts and the knobs of the endoscope what is important in a flexible endoscope especially now with the charge coupled devices is the distal end which has various uh lenses biopsy channels as well as the air water nozzle for cleaning the scope so coming to what is the basic type of endoscopies that a surgeon should know well endoscopies are traditionally divided into two types uh, upper gi endoscopy a scope inserted through the oral cavity which can be the standard esophago gastroduodenoscopy small bowl and endoscopy and to advance a little bit ERCP or endoscopic ultrasound, and the lower GI that is the colonoscopy and the sigmoidoscopy. So uh, when we say basic endoscopy, I would mean that a surgeon should know at least an upper GI endoscopy or esophageal gastroduodenoscopy and a colonoscopy. So when we say upper GI endoscopy, what are the indications? Well, the diagnostic indications remain more or less the same. Evaluation of persistent dyspepsia, dysphagia, upper abdominal pain with alarm signs like weight loss or GI bleed or anemia or an imaging showing a, a, a lesion in the upper GI, which needs to be evaluated and we need to tissue by the biopsies or diagnosis and surveillance of neoplasia in high risk groups like uh, family adenomatous polyposis or Peutz Jeghers syndrome. The common therapeutic indications. uh our evaluation of an upper gi bleed and management which would include the management of portal hypertensive bleed dilatation stricture dilatation foreign body removal achalasia in yesterday's and today's uh, live workshop we will be seeing or we have seen achalasia surgeries however pneumatic dilatation does have a role and if the surgeon knows how to do a pneumatic dilatation especially in a post op recurrence he can uh take care of the patient what is shown in the red are actually uh, advanced therapeutic endoscopies like endoscopic curd surgeries bariatric surgeries which if the surgeon or the endoscopist wants to develop his advanced skills uh, he can venture into will to require a little more training and patience however what is shown in white is the one that can be uh, that is basic and what the surgeon should know uh one of the slides shown by professor reddy uh yesterday was when he was talking about the endoscopy skills he used two terms 
technical skills and cognitive skills well we know surgeons are uh, have good technical skills that's why surgeons are surgeons however what is important especially when you are going to practice endoscopy or you want to use endoscopy is the cognitive skills what it means is the ability to recognize the abnormal from the normal and also as time goes by the ability to assess the seriousness or the severity of the abnormalities that we recognize that is what is meant by the cognitive skills and that would come with a little bit of practice for example here i would like to show is uh, these four images of the same condition esophageal varices the one on the top is actually very early or small varices which can be easily missed and this is important because it shows signifies the presence of a developing significant portal hypertension and as we go on the slides uh, we can see that the varices have increased and the larger varices if we recognize two important one we can uh, offer therapy to this patient if there is evidence of bleed or as a secondary prophylaxis and it also tells the surgeon that this patient has significant portal hypertension and if any surgery is being planned he needs to be uh, extra careful about this patient similarly is the ability to detect gastric varices which can sometimes be missed as just second fold so this if a patient can recognize especially if for example if there is a patient with phenicillin thrombosis might not have significant esophageal varices but has gastric varices and recognition of these is important so this is where the development of the cognitive skills would come into similarly uh, if you have a patient of gi bleed i would like to suggest on a small video uh, who comes and uh, we do the endoscopy and recognize these uh, gastric varices uh we just come back and see whether there is uh there are no significant esophageal varices so uh, uh management of this is re really very ba basic and simple and uh, if a surgeon is uh, trained in basic endoscopy he can easily man manage this uh hurting gastric varices which would take less than a minute to manage and it is very simple and easy so you will not get too worried about it and uh, uh you do not have to call your uh, physician colleague when this same patient is bleeding on table uh, you would see the catheter with the needle coming out and uh, in a few seconds you can see the glue being injected in the varix so this is the glue being injected into the bleeding varix and after a few seconds if you look at the image the bleeding has stopped so this is very easy to manage on a uh, with basic knowledge and also the ability to detect similarly the ability to assess the the ulcers and grade the ulcers and if possible manage them with simple devices like clipping or in large cases the otc tool another important uh, aspect of upper gi is foreign body removal now this can uh, uh, this can be uh, either an uh, uh, de novo foreign body what i'm showing on the left is actually a uh, a gossipo bioma or a gauze piece which uh, we had removed a few months back this was a gauze piece left after a gallbladder surgery and it had eroded from the gallbladder fossa into duodenum causing gastric outlet obstruction to the patient so this was a large piece of gauze which was left which we pulled back into the stomach separated out and then we removed with the help of foreign body forceps similarly the uh, stricture dilatation again uh, either benign or post operative stricture which is very easy to manage uh with or without the use of fluoro and uh, these are some things which a surgeon should know what is important especially from the surgeon surgeon's perspective is pre operative uh, assessment of tumors or malignancies which will help them to exactly determine the site if you are going to operate yourself and plan the surgery and also allows for definitive histopathological tissue diagnosis so these are the few examples of esophageal g malignancies or gastric body malignancies important also is detection of early gastric cancers and advanced gastric cancers and to differentiate between the two and so that you can plan your resection and surgeries accordingly percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy again developed by ponsky a pediatric surgeon is a way of uh, achieving nutrition for the patient and uh, has almost now replaced the uh, surgical feeding gastrostomy that is done and it's a very simple procedure and 
a surgeon with a basic endoscopy knowledge can easily perform this uh, therapeutic intervention which actually goes a long way in maintaining the nutrition of the patient coming to the small bowel endoscopy well small bowel endoscopy has now advanced quite a bit with various instruments like the double balloon enteroscope the single balloon enteroscope or the now the uh, the recent spiral enteroscope however uh, this is something which will require advanced skill and training and if a surgeon does not want to venture he can get away by not knowing the enteroscopy i will be discussing uh, a little bit about intraop enteroscopy which uh, which is very easy to be done with the standard uh, pediatric or a standard colonoscope uh, indication for enteroscopy there are various indications like diarrhea malabsorption what is important uh, from therapy point of view is to find the gi bleed of an obscure origin and manage it and occasionally a uh, foreign body uh, deeply seated into the small bowel coming to the next basic endoscopy that the surgeon should know is the lower gi endoscopy or the colonoscopy as we call it well indications are varied like hematochezia thickening on imaging diagnosis of surveillance of inflammatory bowel disease for surveillance of colorectal cancer polyposis post op surveillance of these patients or sometimes even unexplained lower abdominal pain what helps my surgical colleagues most is again the localization of malignancy especially the distal extent of the malignancy which can change the type of surgery that is being planned for the patient or the extent of resection that is being planned and for this if the surgeon can himself localize the tumor it helps also occasionally if the patient has come with a uh, severe colonic obstruction requiring emergency surgeries or diverting stoma after the patient has settled colonoscopy or endoscopy through the stoma or from below can help the surgeon to localize and to characterize the stricture and plan therapy one of the important modalities is endoscopy tattooing or uh, with india ink or spot which helps in uh, uh intra op or pre op localization of the small lesions and especially in laparoscopy it can help the surgeon to localize the lesion and can do a a thorough job and now there are studies which show that uh, uh localized lymph node uh, excision is much better in a tattooed specimen than in a non tattooed specimen this is how normally uh when you do endoscopy and tattooing you first create a mucosal saline blob and then do the tattooing also colonoscopy can be used to achieve hemostasis from bleeding uh, vessels or from non bleeding vessels angio dysplasias and diverticulosis commonly because surgeons deal with various cause of lia bleed lower gi bleed they would come to the surgeon first and if he is able to recognize this uh, condition he can even manage them with various thermal techniques or with the use of clips as in a upper gi tract removal of polyps is another important uh, uh function of colonoscopy and mind you it is a very easy procedure to do and uh, what is important is that it uh, also helps the surgeon to recognize whether there is a ulcerated or a cystite or indurated polyp which can be removed by surgery and not by polypectomy uh this is a quick video on uh, on uh, polypectomy i will just run through and if you see this is a, a very easy procedure to do does not require a, a great deal of or skill just uh, it's a few months of training and couple of uh, procedures done under uh, observation the surgeon can very easily uh do the polypectomy in a matter of minutes so we have first applied the endo loop with the blue thing which was a large stock and then uh this applied the snare for removal of the polyp this is how it would look colonic decompression again uh, in ogilvy syndrome or if a patient comes in with a volvulus is uh, an important temporizing measure especially it buys time for a good bowel preparation for an edic for elective surgery also it helps the surgeon to look for uh, mucosal viability uh, mind you the recurrence is common so endoscopy is not the definitive treatment but can be used as an uh, intermittent procedure 
fixed dilatation again in large bowel, especially after uh, an NAS anastomosis, can be done with minimal invasion and uh, uh, has got good results. Okay. Rarely, if uh, in malignant strictures, if the patient is coming in obstruction and you want to avoid surgery, stenting uh, of a malignant obstruction can also be tried. And another important aspect of endoscopy for surgeon is the role of intraoperative endoscopy, as was emphasized by Dr. Rao at the start of this session, which is probably turning out to be a new specialty in itself. And I also I firmly agree with that and believe that uh, intraoperative endoscopy uh, is a very essential tool nowadays, and um, it goes a long way in uh, uh, in improving your surgical. Uh, uh, results also helping in planning of the right therapy for the patient. And uh, there are various indications using the gastroscope for gastric surgeries, for resections, myotomy. Uh, we saw in yesterday's uh, session, uh, Dr. Patankar demonstrating uh, uh, live upper GI endoscopy after the fundoplication to assess the tightness of the wrap. Similarly, in myotomies, uh, it can be done to assess the adequacy of the myotomy. And uh, uh, it is now being very effectively used during gastric surgeries, especially for early gastric cancers or mucosal tumors, so much so that many consider it to be the modern stethoscope of gastric surgeons. Uh, intraoperative uh, endoscopy for achalasia, as we know and as will be discussed uh, in the sessions, also allows for uh, myotomy to be performed under visual control by transillumination, allows the evaluation of the myotomy, and uh, is how uh, uh, it will look like, sorry. Also intraoperative endoscopy as I demonstrated yesterday during GERD surgery helps to assess the tightness of the wrap. Intraoperative enteroscopy is an important tool uh, where the surgeon along with the gastroenterologist or the surgeon if he knows endoscopy himself can look for the entire small bowel and look for small lesions especially small lesions which are not accessible by routine endoscopy procedures and can manage them on table after the small bowel has been brought out uh, to an enterotomy uh, and the scope has been introduced to an enterotomy. This is just basically a, a, a flow algorithm of how um, an, an intraop enteroscopy is performed uh, uh, and it's a very simple and easy procedure. Uh, can it have complications? Yes, intraop enteroscopy sometimes can have complications like mucosal stripping or perforations and bleeding, but most of them can be easily managed. Uh, intraoperative colonoscopy is sometimes done to locate a small CRC if there are other con con concomitant lesions which have been missed on imaging. And uh, there are various studies which have been done for localization for observing the proximal colon if it was not done because of an obstructive lesion earlier. So intraop you put a scope and look at the proximal colon for look for a synchronous malignancies and also after the anastomosis for assessment of the integrity of the anastomosis. These are the few images of uh, intraop colonoscopy. Uh, so this is a basic endoscopy. If you want to go a step further, the surgeon can learn about ERCP is it is useful? Yes, for management of uh, uh, biliary stones because the ultimate uh, therapy would be uh, would be the uh, cholecystectomy, and uh, also for biliary injuries that can happen during therapy. So if the surgeon can do it intraop, we can take care of the mal of the injuries or also after. Pancreatic ERCPs are a part of advanced endoscopy. ERCP, as we know, can have some complication about pancreatitis. We are not going to discuss that. Bariatric surgery is an important uh, uh, concept. However, endoscopic bariatric therapy can also be tried, especially preoperatively, uh, to reduce the weight of the patient and make the patient fit for a definitive surgical procedure. And most bariatric surgeons now prefer to do their own uh, endoscopy, one to assess and also to put these devices for a short period of time and then do a definitive surgical procedure at a later date. Uh, so intra-op and pre-op, post-operative endoscopy, before I end my talk, again, a very important role for post-operative endoscopy and the surgeons can benefit, especially in upper GI to look for anastomotic strictures, 
leaks or uh, dispatches post uh, alerts procedure or uh, a gi bleed that has happened post operatively in uh, after a lower gi for surveillance post colectomy if you have operated a patient of crohn's to look for a recurrence or to look for anastomosis prior to a stoma closure <clears throat> to assess the viability or uh, and the uh, of the lower mucosa if you have done it for an ibd to look and develop a, a made a pouch for some reason uh, to look for uh, eval uh, evaluation of the pouch so these are all the indications where a surgeon can perform his own endo endoscopy of his patients and uh, uh, can do further management as i said in ercp it is useful in bile leaks cholelocolithiasis sometimes for retained stones or uh, secondary bile reduction stones that has that develop post surgery or for any picture that develop post surgery and if the surgeon wants to take up advanced endoscopy then he can go towards small bowel endoscopies and us in various us guided procedures which can also be done pre as well as post operative uh i have tried to cover this uh, topic in the time allotted uh i know there are various things that can be discussed further but with this i would like to uh, end my talk and uh, if there are any questions i would like to take it thank you thank you thank you uh, professor ingo uh, for your uh, excellent uh, lecture uh, covering uh, uh, a very wide uh, topic and uh, i think uh, there are polls uh, uh, on the um, on our web uh, so uh, there are a few questions so uh, so please uh, poll on this So which of the following is not the uh, current use for ERCP? Okay, uh, Dr. Ingo, can you elaborate on the poll yeah. polling results? Yes, yeah, so I can see the poll answer and uh, uh, more than three-fourths have answered it right that it is no longer used as a diagnostic modality. Uh, well, some have a doubt about whether it can be used for treatment of post-operative fixtures and yes, in fact, uh, it can very well be used for treatment of post-operative uh, uh, biliary fixtures and we can get away by doing a repeat surgery for this patient. Can we have the next question? So these are all questions uh, based on the talk for uh, surgeons uh, or endoscopists who are just about to start into the endoscopy practice and just to see uh, actually whether they were awake during my lecture or not. <laughs> Then we have the poll in this. Uh, Oh, so yes, uh, again, two thirds have got it right. Endoscopic ultrasound generally has got no role in obstetric GI bleed. Well, intraoperative endoscopy, uh, especially intraoperative enteroscopy, has got a very big role in in recognizing obstetric GI bleed, where you can recognize the bleed via small enterotomy, and you can, in fact, even manage these bleeds. A uh, small lesion can be managed by the intraoperative enteroscopy itself. I did not touch into capsule endoscopy. because of the time allotted for this talk which are the following modalities of hemostasis are the treatment options for endoscopic management of septic ulcer bleed all of the above the 
some people might have some doubt about uh, the use of band ligation. Well, it is used predominantly for portal hypertension related disease, but occasionally can be used in an ulcer also. I think uh, that was all for the Thank you. poll question. Yeah. Thank you. So we leave uh, some of the discussion later at the end. Uh, so thank you very much for your nice lecture. So I'd like to uh, introduce the next speaker who is uh, Professor uh, David uh, Lomento. And uh, Professor Lomento is a professor of surgery from National University, Singapore. And uh, also is a director of the Minimal Invasive Surgical Center there. And uh, also um, Secretary General for the ELSA um, organization. So uh, Professor Lomento is going to tell us about uh, the basics for the upper GI and uh, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, endolab uh, surgery. David, please. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Hello, Michael. Good to see you and all of you. I saw GV yesterday, all the group. Great job. A good, wonderful organization. Uh, time is a bit late. Let's move on on my talk. I think that uh, GV uh, asked me to talk about, uh, about basic procedure of endolap. I, I believe that uh, the combination of laparoscopic and GI endoscopy, especially in, uh, in, in the upper GI tract, I found the best, uh, one of the best uh, combination solution and alliance and collaboration. Uh, they usually work together and today uh, I think Michael will talk later on, but most of the, our OT since the last 10 years are equipped for a combination of both, especially when we do upper GI surgery. So we can divide about basic and advanced, even though uh, the, the, the limit uh, is not, I don't know where it will, will be, but let's talk about what that's a bit of experience about the, how we can combine and where we can combine uh, end all up together. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the most common today after notes, a uh, nice talk by uh, by Reddy yesterday and also uh, and, and GV yesterday was about specimen retrieval. We can retrieve uh, with endoscopy a big specimen that cannot be extracted to a 10 or 12 millimeter uh, because maybe uh, full thickness like in this case uh, can be done uh, in a laparoscopic fashion and the specimen can be retrieved with a true a, a total endoscopy, uh, allow uh, any probable of a seeding also that there was uh, uh, reported, especially in, in neoplastic series. Also, do we have a, a good collaboration, for example, like in, in case like this, in which we need to do a full thickness uh, resection of the stomach, uh, and then we can uh, proceed with a, the, with a more complex uh, procedure like uh, suturing, of the of the gastrotomy of the excision uh, the excited space but through a laparoscopic port we can use a, even a three millimeter for this uh, for this job today both camera instrument are quite reliable uh, we go faster uh, there are some other cases that we encounter in our experience for example like a bleeding of cameron ulcer uh, that we uh, was not easy to handle because of the position uh, in uh, at the at the level of G junction, and we did a, a suture ligation guided uh, through uh, the scope and through a, a laparoscopy. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know why. When I convert the video, I lost the part of the suturing. I only have the the CT scan uh, of the of, of this of the specimen of the of, the, of this video, and it, it identify the bleeding. Uh, with the with the G injection, then we can see at the towards the the end the ulcer that has been sutured then uh, laparoscopically. Of course, GIST uh, probably is the most common uh, procedure. Uh, I, yesterday, uh, GV did a great uh, excision on the small curvature. Uh, most of the time, uh, when it's a greater curvature anterior or posterior of the of the corpus of, of the body of the stomach it's not possible to do a simple excision uh, it may be more challenging when we approach the g junction of the lesser curvature the incisura because uh, sometimes maybe the risk of uh, uh, risk of uh, uh, narrowing down the, the lumen of the stomach even though we have different tips and tricks this procedure, even when we do uh, in a pure laparoscopic, still need a support for a, for a GI endoscopy. You can see this uh, 
big uh, uh, esophytic uh, gist tumor that has been uh, isolated from all the structure. And, and then we use, uh, sometimes we use a kind of loop to lift up, to reduce uh, instrument, because sometimes it's too big to grab. And then we do a full transaction on the LT tissue. It's important, the margin in this case. Uh, so it's quite simple and basic procedure that uh, we can start to do. Uh, in other case, we can still do a procedure uh, with the, the so-called, we can reduce the access, uh, like in this case, uh, for a GIST, and then mostly uh, we do uh, in, for location like a lesser curvature G junction, we do a procedure that goes uh, through the stomach, a trans transgastric approach. In this case it was done with a single pore with a very simple device and we go through uh, the abdominal wall of the stomach, we go in tragastic with the laparoscope and we do a, a excision of this, uh, you can see the tumor here. And uh, we, get, we have a, a kind of endoscopic view and we can uh, remove uh, using a harmonic a Thunderbeat, usually we use this as a whole movie and in which with the excision can be done in a, in a without stepper, but manually cutting and, and sectioning it. You can see the section, the transaction of the tissue. We can be sure that we go on LT tissue and then we do the suturing. Uh, this is the lesser curvature fat. So it gives a full thickness and then we do a defect closure uh, using this transgastric approach. Uh, we have a good series and as you can see, I want to show not the number, but just the most of the time are tumor that are within the EG junction. Uh, and uh, it's possible to remove almost on all the case with a very good outcome. Uh, other case that we can do when we progress more is, a, for example, cystogastrostomy, in which uh, we, we, we can do the same, uh, same way. We, we can use a um, uh, suspension suture to lift up the stomach, in this to, just to reduce. And then we use a special trocar with a balloon is a little bit, looks more, more complex, is, a, is, a, is a easy procedure. We go through the stomach wall, we insert the trocar with the balloon, the balloon will anchor the stomach to the abdominal wall. Then of course we go transgastric, we need to uh, isolate the cyst, uh, we use an endoscopic endo uh, ultrasonography, uh, laparoscopic ultrasonography, and then we do excision of the uh, gastrostomy using a thunder bit. In the past, we sometimes we use a stapler, but today I think we do, can do uh, easily with the gastrostomy. Uh, that's uh, all about basic procedure. So thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope we fulfill your request and in the right time. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, your lecture covered a lot of uh, usage in the basic uh, upper GI endolab and also uh, we are on time. So thank you so much. And I think we'll uh, leave the discussion to the end of the session. Uh, so uh, the next uh, speaker will be uh, our chairman of the Ape House, Professor Michael Lee, uh, who is uh, currently an honorary consultant of the general surgery and the director of uh, minimal invasive and robotic surgery department and uh, Hong Kong Sanatorium and Hospital. So, uh, Professor Michael Lee will be uh, telling us about the basic uh, lower GI endolap surgery. Uh, give, give me a minute, uh, a minute because uh, I have to insert the video. Okay, okay. So maybe then uh, I can uh, have a uh, some discussion with uh, Professor Lomento. So David. Yes, I'm here, uh, Philip. Yes, uh, David. So uh, I think you cover a bit, uh, especially on the uh, combination of the uh, endoscopy and the laparoscopy. So um, especially uh, I'm interested in the kind of a transgastric approach. Uh, so uh, that uh, would uh, require a uh, puncturing of the uh, stomach and then uh, through um, the uh, uh, stomach wall, you insert the port. 
So do you think, uh, so the role of endoscopy is uh, for just uh, observation or you can add, add more role on endoscopy so that you can have a less puncture in the stomach? No, I, actually you are, you are completely right. I think the role of the endoscopy is complementary. Uh, what, first of all, we'll be in localizing the, localizing the lesion and oh. providing you a good access. You, you, actually, you can inflate the stomach and you can directly puncture it with the choker. So minimizing also the, those sutures that we use. Uh, and of course, it can, it can be useful also in the extraction of the specimen. Uh, also retraction, for example, because in case of the gist, you can put an endo loop and then the, endos the endos endoscopy endoscope can help you to retract the specimen. So there are a very uh, a very important roles, I think, in uh, for uh, for the the two uh, skill to work together. I see. Uh, so. I can see Professor Maitoli is, uh, is uploading. preparing. So uh, maybe still waiting. So meanwhile, I think there's another question uh, from the floor um, that uh, what is the advantage of endolab approach uh, towards just laparoscopy for cystogastrostomy? Oh, the, the, what is the approach? I think it's a Compared to laparoscopy, yeah, uh, yeah. usually uh, it's, uh, it's give you a bigger drainage, uh, wider drainage compared to the, the stand, even though you put two, three stands. It can be an option in case of failure of, uh, of endoscopic drainage or can be in a primary, uh, primary treatment in case of a, a septet, a multi-sept uh, cyst. So yeah. uh, both of them, they, for simple cysts, small cysts, I think endoscopic okay. drainage okay. is still the gold standard. For more complex case I, or for failure endoscopy, I think laparoscopy has a role. Yeah, I, and, uh, and I think uh, so what they are asking is uh, whether you can just do a pure laparoscopy for a cystogastrostomy or you need an endolab approach. But, I think from my experience, uh, so uh, this, it depends also on the cyst location. Okay. So yeah. if the cyst is really uh, on the posterior uh, wall of the stomach, okay. it's probably good I mean, that you have the combined endolab mm -hmm. approach. Is that right? Yes, is that right? It also depends on the facility you have. Maybe you have a US and you don't have a laparoscopic ultrasound. So you can do endoscopic and do an ultrasound and can guide you. Uh, of course, you can do without. If the cyst is a bulgy, you don't need to do ultrasound. But if you need to give a, you need a guide, I think ultrasound, endoscopy can help you. Yes, I think fully agree. So I think uh, probably Professor Michael Lee is uh, ready. So um, Professor Lee, can you start? Yes. Okay, you thank me? you, thank you. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, my talk is on uh, lower GI endolab surgery. And of course, we all have to remember what we're talking about is you know, acid surgery. And um, there's a message from Ronald Marvick many years ago that surgical technique will more or less be combined techniques in the future. And I think this is what we are talking about. Immune access surgery is not a new surgery, but it's a new approach. When we talk about minimum access surgery, we're not just talking about laparoscopic surgery, but we must remember endoscopic surgery is also a minimal access surgery technique. That's why with the advances and maturity in the surgical technique, we now see limitation in either this modality, laparoscopic and endoscopic. But if you combine the two procedures together, we're talking about increasing the sphere of application of the minimum sex technique. So we have the concept of endolab surgery, endolaparoscopic approach to disease. Way back in 2005, I've developed a laparoscopic, endolaparoscopic OR, a user-friendly environment where both endoscope and lap laparoscope can be used simultaneously 
and in conjunction and what I call a plug and play system. Having had this OR running, we then did a study to show the advantage. And this was published in the surgical endoscopy showing overall workload reduction in setup time, turnover time, and time to require setup additional endoscope experience. So, conclusion is for MAS surgery, uh, integrated endolab OR makes it easier for the surgeon, simpler for the operating room staff, safer and better for patients. On table colonoscopy, that's been performed since 2005. That after any surgery, we would have around 70% of lower GI tract surgery using, using this technique. If you see here, uh, ranging from interruptive localizing, small lesion, removing synchronous polyp, assisted resection, and leak test after anastomosis. This is, uh, we study the usefulness of immediate intraoperative colonoscopy for anastomosis. And sure enough, if there's bleeding, we can deal with it straight away without having to face the postoperative complication of reactionary bleeding. So, with the development of the last 20 and 30 years MAS, many new tools and new approaches have also developed along with the application. Nooks came along about, uh, oh, more than 15 years ago. Um, started with a transgastric resection of appendicitis. But really it's a concept of going through single lumen that led to development of the trans umbilical, trans vaginal, and trans anal approach. To me, a trans anal approach of doing endoscopic operation was already in action back in the 90s. Good for T1 lesion in post surgical risk for upper rectum surgery. Of course, with the concept of notes technique, we thought about doing a hybrid surgery of, or colectomy. And this is our vision of doing laparoscopic colectomy without laparotomy for specimen retrieval. Here's this operating theater look of how we perform this operation. Small lesion, intracopsidly localized, in a sigmoid. Standard laparoscopic resection. This is a dissection of the inferior mesenteric artery. This work was produced in the late 90s. The TEO is introduced by the perineal surgeon and under vision, the rectum was divided after the and removed with first introduction of the envio for the anastomosis.
and the specimen is extracted. So under direct vision, the PO surgeon removed the specimen transrectally through specimen protected through the scope. And the standard intracorporal anastomosis performed. Okay, well, this is the first randomized trial that we did. And basically, uh, you can see there's no difference in disease recurrence in standard approach and in three years survival rate. So it's safe to perform on selected patients in this Now we move on to endolaparoscopic approach for obstructed colon. This used to be a uh, contraindication for a laparoscopic approach. But of course, you know, in, we're operating on emergency obstructed large bowel patient resulting in a stoma that might not end up having control of life in certain morbid patients. So this is a problem of obstruction. And uh, we combine a two approach and resulting in this sort of ability. Of, and we did a randomized trial and concluded that we can do this safely as a one-stage operation. And this is a long-term result that we publish. And it showed that with this technique does not affect oncological outcome of patient survival. So I think continue to innovate, develop, improve and discover new frontier to improve patient care is what we're talking about here. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. So uh, I think uh, you have uh, given us a uh, uh, important overview uh, from your experience about uh, application of uh, endoscopic laparoscopic approach. And uh, as you are the pioneer in this field, especially in terms of the colorectal application, uh, we can see a much uh, potential in the further application in this uh, technique to enhance the uh, colorectal resection. So. Um, uh, at this moment, I think uh, we have uh, we have uh, 15 minutes uh, for the discussion for the Q&A. So uh, I'd like to also invite uh, David to join us. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think uh, Professor Ingo, uh, who is a gastroenterologist, uh, he cannot join our discussion. So we'll have uh, us surgeon uh, discussing about um, the uh, application and the future um, practice and training of popery endoscopy and laparoscopy. So may I first ask uh, Mr. Lee, so um, you have mentioned about the NOCs and uh, you have mentioned also about the use of the TEO device, uh, which is I think the very first uh, practice of uh, endoscopic full fitness resection uh, uh, kind of approach. And now we also using uh, the flexible endoscopy for that. So how about the uh, latest uh, uh, concept of uh, trans, uh, trans uh, anal uh, com combined uh, with, uh, you know, the uh, laparoscopic approach for resection of the rectum, the TAMIS approach? Yeah, well, that's very promising as well. And uh, in effect, uh, that has been, uh, in effect, that has been going on for at least for, from a development about 10 years. And it's very mature technique now uh, advocated by Professor Lazy. Um, yes. Somehow, I felt there were overwhelming application. Originally, the thought was to deal with obese patient with narrow pelvis, with tumor down in the uh, uh, low down in the rectum, second uh, low, uh, middle to lower third lesion. But somehow, because of the 
I think is a uh, popularity and promotion. Pe people have been using too widely, I think, uh, for all rectal cancer. Of course, the higher the rectum, the likelihood, the easier to do this operation. But I think, don't forget that this technique involves a colo anal anastomosis by, by most, of the time, most of the time. And the stricture rate of these patients are higher than a standard laparoscopic approach. So we got to be careful how we look at a new technique. Uh, obviously, we still wait long-term randomized trial for the TAMIS technique, but I currently feel that one should reserve the technique for the right patient. Thank you, um, Mr. Lee. So uh, I'd like to ask both um, David and you about uh, the long-term development because <laughs> I am more like a <clears throat> in a transitional phase between uh, laparoscopic surgeon, uh, robotic surgeon to become an endoscopist mostly in a uh, lot of my practice. For example, in the upper GI, I can see that uh, the management of achalasia has been changing all towards a poem and, uh, and also some kind of uh, submucosal tumor in the upper GI. I can resect it by totally endoscopic full fitness resection without the need of laparoscopy. So what do you think about the future role? So do you believe there is a really a transition where we are waiting for a better endoscopic technology to uh, somehow overcome the current limitation uh, that in the future we can, can become total, purely laparoscopic, uh, endoscopic? Or you think that there's still some role for the laparoscopy? Uh, maybe David first. Uh, Philip, I, I think, yes, we are in transition. Uh, because if you look at the potential of an endoscopic treatment, uh, that goes mostly, I think I will, uh, 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 I will say for a benign disease, we will solve for poem. Uh, maybe for reflux, it's just a matter that uh, things are not working. But if we have a better aim, I don't know, radio frequency or other stuff that they can uh, tighten in the G junction. Uh, bariatric, for example, is a big area. Uh, probably today is 80% worldwide of the application and bariatric will be for sure. It's just a matter of finding the right uh, way. Uh, we do that, they do in those sleep, but the results are very poor. So we can, re if we can reproduce something similar, I think. Probably there will be a, we are far away for cancer, uh, for advanced stage, but uh, of course today for early stage maybe T1 and even T2 we are we are close for endoscopy to almost take over from laparoscopy. Yes. So uh, I, what, I don't what's... see I see the trend very not very good for upper GI surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> How about, how about lower GI, Professor Michael Lee? <laughs> well, I, I will answer for the upper GI as well. Uh, the reason I said that uh, the endoscopic technique is, is, is progressing very fast uh, is because of the um, advances we have made to the instrumentation. And we think endoscope technique advanced much faster even compared to our laparoscopic technique. Our laparoscopic technique had been replaced by robotic technique to a certain extent for uh, a, a particular type of operation that like you have to do a lot of reconstruction. But of course, I don't think endoscopic technique can do all the work that laparoscopic technique can do. So still, to me, it's a, uh, a, a combination or application of the technique, or we use the right technique for the right patient condition to their benefit. As for the lower GI tract, I think people are doing all sorts of EMR, EST, but you know, uh, you're talking about very early lesion that people can pick up on screening, but we still see patient with a big tumor. I don't think endoscope would ever replace our laparoscopic technique as a standard, gold standard for removing the uh, a, 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 a cancer. But obviously, benign lesion is a different matter. If you can safely remove a benign lesion, then uh, the endoscopic technique still has a lot of 
development to do in manipulation and research. Yes, I fully agree yeah. with you. Yeah, we, are, so. we are much farther than uh, a lower GI because of, uh, the anatomic condition, the stomach is thicker compared to the colon. So there are different reasons too. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes. Yes. So I think uh, there's an interesting uh, question uh, from the floor uh, about uh, the training in endoscopy. Would it become a standard or part of the surgical residency uh, program in the near future? What do you think about I, that? I can answer that. Um, yeah. We are very lucky in Hong Kong, as you know. We have very strong surgical training for endoscopy. In fact, for the advanced trainee out of the four years training, the first two years already they've been introduced to basic endoscopic training, including diagnostic endoscopy to um, basic intervention like injection of bleeding ulcer. In the third and fourth year, they also promote on to colonoscopy, ERCP if they're in the HPP specialty as future interest. So we're very lucky in Hong Kong. I'm sure this, app, this situation does not apply to other parts of the world, in particular Europe and America. But you know, the Americans are changing. Uh, sages are requiring surgical training to have endoscopy accreditation, right? Following the development of uh, endolaparoscopic uh, concept, and so is uh, 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 EAES in Europe. So I can see the train is changing. Well, whether in your own country you can get uh, the training, it depends on really um, how how the educational system is turned towards uh, 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 as a, you know. It turns towards uh, more open-mindedness. You see, most of the other countries look at this as a protectionism, as a gastroenterologist interest, surgeon not to go into uh, the endoscopy suite. And hey, if you've got endo level R, uh, you can do endoscopy in your uh, Yeah. I, I, I agree. So uh, from my perspective, I believe uh, that the endoscopy should be incorporated. Uh, because uh, not only because uh, the uh, technique and also the procedure is advancing, but also uh, there's an increasing application of a combination uh, between endoscopy and laparoscopy, especially when you are seeing earlier phases of the disease. Some of the disease are, in fact, are really small and tiny. So a lot of the time you may need endoscopy intraoperative to uh, locate the uh, lesion or the disease and to confirm a lot of things that we uh, not have the concept before when endoscopy is not so easily applied in the endolab concept. So if we have this too, and also when we are doing the uh, intraoperative endoscopy, we are using CO2 insufflation as well, so that uh, disturb less of uh, the bowel uh, distension. So that also causes uh, less problem. So I think in combination of this, uh, endoscopy should be uh, indicated uh, for training uh, our next generation of surgeon. So, uh, and I think there's another question about uh, the uh, use of ICG and MBI for surgery in ischemic bowel in emergency setting. Any experience from both uh, faculty? Uh, I, I have not got this experience for ischemic bowel doing emergency surgery. So, uh, David? No, me either. I don't, I don't have, a, but uh, uh, maybe actually in the concept may be there, may be there because it can give you some perfusion. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, the, 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 if it's useful or not, I don't know because you will see the color of the bowel and then you, you will tailor the resection according to the, the microscopic appearance. I so, don't think uh, reported yeah. literature either. Yes, I, I also don't have uh, the personal experience of uh, MBI in doing surgery during ischemic bowel because most of the time it's a it's an emergency. So, uh, I have also question to uh, follow up about the uh, training of a surgeon for endoscopy. So, uh, I guess uh, pretty much uh, there's uh, always question coming up if uh, during the training, starting from the basic you may go on to perform the diagnostic endoscopy. So uh, that means uh, you still need a, uh, so a 
uh, kind of uh, enough experience to do diagnostic. Uh, so before you go on for therapeutic, and uh, how many cases do you think is required for a basic uh, diagnostic endoscopy like the upper GI or colonoscopy? I think if you if you if you can do about hundred or so diagnostic, you're all right to move on. Yes. Yeah, I think probably depends for the for diagnostic. I think mostly is experience. I think probably fifty, but then until you become confident to recognize the lesion, maybe we take our hundred. So uh, and then the, I can, <laughs> I want to have uh, some challenging questions uh, for both faculty, for example, like the, the rise of the AI in diagnostic endoscopy. Do you think it's, uh, what's the impact to a surgeon who wanted to learn endoscopy for AI? <laughs> are we talking about the future, Philip, are we? <laughs> yes. Well, well, actually it's coming up. AI is already, you know, some system already coming up for practice. So, uh, do you think there's a challenge uh, in terms of the uh, training when we are trying to start endoscopy training for our surgical residents? Well, you know, they have been uh, using endoscopy nurse to do the procedure in other parts of the world, like yes. in UK they had. Uh, but I don't think the program is that successful. And of course, uh, as a surgeon, you want to do things yourself rather than watch what people do and, and then interpret the results. I still feel the skills will be there. Uh, I mean, you, you, you need to train for the skill. Yes, I, uh, I think uh, the AI may be actually helping us. And I don't think uh, in terms of the responsibility, they like to uh, you know, take over our responsibility. So because uh, so eventually uh, those uh, patients who require us uh, to uh, have the response, responsibility about uh, whether you are making the correct diagnosis during the endoscopy, not the uh, machine. So GV has some question. GV. Yeah, no, no. I, I think endoscopists must be happy having an endoscopic nurse doing some procedures. But as surgeons, we would like to do our endoscopy ourselves in the OR. <laughs> the other thing is, even if AI comes into O, I think the technique of colonoscopy or endoscopy still has to, we have to gain that training to do the procedure. It's unless until the pass, if the scope is past your particular location, I don't think we'll be able to make any diagnosis. So still the training in endoscopy or colonoscopy or any other procedures is the must. Artificial intelligence would certainly aid to improve your outcomes, but I think the technique still has to be learned. Yeah, I think it may actually help us, uh, you know, when we are not experienced in the doing the diagnostic endoscopy, the AI actually will remind us about uh, the uh, missing lesions. So we may actually uh, have a uh, quality control uh, for uh, our junior residents uh, who started to pick up the endoscopy. That may actually be helpful. Okay, I think uh, with that, uh, we are almost uh, time to uh, finish uh, this uh, session. So thank you so much uh, for uh, the uh, faculty, Professor Ingo, Professor David Lomento and uh, Professor Michael Lee for all the wonderful lecture. So I would like to hand over the next session to uh, Professor David Lomento. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a good talk. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, session. And it will be on the tip and tricks in, uh, in, uh, in Endolab uh, Upper GI. And the first speaker is uh, Dr. Naresh but Dr. Naresh Bhatt, let me have a... Dr. Naresh Bhatt is from Aster CMI Hospital, is a chief of gastroenterology and hepatology. Hey, what's happening? Somebody move my screen. And uh, is a member of the Asian Novel Bioimaging and Interventional Group, uh, former president of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology. And he will share with us about his uh, uh, experience, uh, his uh, current endoscopic practice and role of N NBI. Dr. Bhatt? I would like to ask all the speakers to be in the allocated time to avoid any 
delay. So, uh, is my screen know. visible yes. and am I audible? Yes, yes, Dr. Bhatt, please yeah. go ahead. So, good morning and uh, nice to have all of you here. I can see uh, very good friends in the uh, panel. And today what I'm going to talk to you about is why the endoscopists need to embrace NBI routinely. And it's time for a change from doing a routine endoscopy. We've spent the last few minutes trying to discuss why surgeons should start doing endoscopy. But it's also important that we exploit all the benefits of endoscopy and I'm going to focus today on the use of NBI in routine practice. We all know that most GI cancers arise in the mucosa. And we have good evidence to tell us that when we pick up mucosal cancers at an early stage, the five-year and 10-year survivals are excellent to the two of 90% plus. And this has been shown from Japan in Chile, and then subsequently shown across various countries in the world. So the important message is early pickup is the key word. We also have realized that early gastric cancer, for example, is not a different disease. It's only a precursor to advanced gastric cancer and perhaps predates it by at least three years. That means an advanced cancer was missed for three years. I mean, to put it very simply. And hence, it's important that we strive to pick up these lesions at a very early stage. And a fundamental fact that has been exploited by engineers is that angiogenesis or neoangiogenesis is an integral part of cancer and tumor growth. And hence, if you can pick up these changes in the micro vessels at an early stage, we may be able to pick up these malignancies very early. And engineers at the Olympus Corporation developed this technique where they used the entire spectrum of white light and split it into the, a narrow range of using the, just the blue and the green wavelengths. And they chose this because these wavelengths have a unique characteristic is that they penetrate only the very superficial layer of the mucosa and then get reflected back. So when you use this narrow band as an imaging feature, you are able to show in great detail the superficial structure of the surface pattern as well as the micro vessels in great detail, which is then exploited to make out whether there is a lesion and is the lesion possibly neoplastic in origin. So what do we need to use this technology? Obviously, you need an endoscope which has got the facilities for narrowband imaging. And this is not difficult. It is available to us on the handle of the endoscope at the tip of our fingers. So you're doing routine endoscopy, you can just press one button on the scope and you can get this narrowband imaging. You have other things that are important and I personally think a high definition endoscope with magnification and a high resolution monitor are equally important. So if you are able to have this, you can make a big difference in your day-to-day -day evaluation of mucosal lesions. Earlier, they used to use a lot of 
chemical dyes to highlight the mucosa. And we now realize that these dyes have a very small place in today's endoscopic world and has been largely replaced by so-called digital chromoendoscopy. Now, if you look at this lesion here in the esophagus, when you look at this thing, you find just on white light imaging, there's nothing that is impressive at all. The mucosa looks flat, looks reasonably pink, and uh, most of us would sort of say, okay, this is normal. But if you apply narrowband imaging, you can find that there is a change in color here or from nine to say seven o'clock, which is turned brown compared to the slightly greenish hue elsewhere. And also here between three to five o'clock, you can find out that there's a color difference. And this brownish area tells us that there is something that is cooking there. And in the days where you did not have magnificent endoscopy, this was good enough to suspect a squamous cell cancer. So if you add magnification to this on zoom endoscopy, to find that what you see in that brownish area are these micro vessels. And these micro vessels have these loop structures which are called IPCLs. And these IPCLs are definitely abnormal compared to the normal. The normal are somewhere on this left side, they're around seven o'clock position. So these are thicker, bigger, and more in number. And they have this brownish hue around it. And this tells us that these are looped IPCLs and this is high-grade dysplasia and of early form of squamous cell cancer. So on the right side, you find that these same IPCLs are now looking not quite like this, but are looking more open and larger. And this tells us that perhaps there is submucosal invasion. So what does NBI with magnification tell us? That yes, this is neoplastic. It also tells us what is the lateral margin of the lesion and to an extent helps us predict what is the depth of the lesion. Now let's look at the stomach. Here you have on these left and the right, you have two similar looking lesions, a small lesion here and a small lesion here. Both are quite subtle and it requires a good and committed endoscopist to pick up the lesion on white light. And then what do you say? Is this malignant or is this malignant? Are they both erosions, just benign? And for this, you see how magnification endoscopy with NBI helps. If you interrogate these lesions, you find here that this area is slightly demarcated and you find in this area that the surface pattern is lost and these vessels are certainly abnormal. While in the lower half, you find that while it's demarcated, this has got a fairly regular surface pattern. The vessels are not very well made out. And so you can predict and as rightly proven, this was a gastric cancer and this was a benign lesion, just intestinal metaplasia. So what looks almost the same in white light endoscopy, when you use this technology, you can predict and make a more certain diagnosis and pick up neoplasia or say, okay, this is possibly non-neoplastic and deal with it appropriately. So this is again to reinforce what we see in early gastric cancer is this kind of well demarcated area. So this is called the demarcation line. And within this, you find that this surface pattern is totally lost or obscured. And you find these micro vessels are definitely abnormal, a little thicker, irregular, and uh, don't follow any particular kind of pattern within these scripts. So this is typical of early gastric cancer. And all you need to take is a small biopsy from the cornea here, prove the diagnosis and go ahead with endotherapy if you're capable of doing it. Again, this is an undifferentiated early gastric cancer. You see that this is a slightly pale looking area in the stomach. And this is what I would like to emphasize 
is not all only about NBI. It is a good utilization of white light endoscopy. Look at it thoroughly. And if we know that there's some color change, maybe you can even make out there's a contour change, a little depressed area here. And when you apply NBI, you find again that this area looks reasonably normal. There's a demarcation line and you see these surface patterns there, but these vessels are fairly abnormal, irregular and a little thicker than normal. And if you look at this cartoon, you can make out that these are the normal areas where you see these fairly thin micro vessels, while here there's these irregular coiled vessels within the crypts. And so this is an early gastric cancer. But looking at the color and the pattern of these vessels, one can even predict whether they are well differentiated or undifferentiated, which obviously, you know, makes a difference when it comes to dissection. Now looking at Barrett's, again, white light endoscopy shows you that there is a hiatal hernia and certainly these tongues are sticking out into the esophagus. First look, easily uh, made out to be Barrett's. But what are we interested in Barrett's? In Barrett's, we are interested to find out is there dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, is there cancer? And if you look at it, from a distance, you can make out that perhaps there's something looking a little abnormal. You zoom into that area, you find out, yeah, there is a little contour change. And when you apply NBI with this magnification, you find out that this is certainly Barrett's. This is um, non-esophage, not scopus mucosa, but uh, columnar mucosa. And here, just like what we found in stomach, a demarcation line and certainly abnormal surface pattern, very clearly made out. So this is a little focus here of Barrett's with a carcinomatous change. So as again to emphasize how recognize an abnormality and interrogate it appropriately. Again, to show you what you can do with NBI, here this again Barrett's, you can use NBI and you can make out this rich pattern very clearly. And when you use acetic acid with this, you can find out that the surface pattern is brought out so beautifully. It's very easy to make a very quick assessment using uh, additional acetic acid, which you can just spray into the, onto the mucosa and make a very quick assessment. Look at this uh, patient, another patient of ours, that uh, we put acetic acid, and normally acetic acid, the whole thing turns white, as we saw in the previous uh, you saw this, this is what happens when you put acetic acid. But if there is high grade dysplasia or cancer, that whiteness disappears within a minute or two and it actually looks pink or red. And this clearly brings out that this is an abnormal area in this Barrett's. And uh, this tells us that this was uh, suspicious. We took a small biopsy showed that it showed high-grade dysplasia and uh, we went ahead and resected it quite easily. We did an EMR and you see this is the first piece and then um, you can see we have now resected the second piece and we've managed to resect this whole thing again just because we were able to pick up this high-grade dysplasia. We are able to give him a cure and now this patient has been followed up for the last three years is doing extremely well with no local recurrence. So the big thing about NBI and advanced imaging is, is utilization. It giving you a new area to do is to do endotherapy and uh, resections, either mucosal resections or submucosal dissection to get a cure. Moving on to the colon, this is a polyp just about a centimeter or less uh, seen there in the descending colon. And I'm sure most of us would say, I'm going to a polypectomy. Would someone do an EMR and tattoo it? Someone said for surgery, or do you think it's a neuroendocrine tumor which is, needs a resection? Now, 
what it really needs is surgery because if you look at this lesion you can find out here that the vessels are definitely irregular much broader and darker and you find that in a lot of areas this whole thing is obscured or what the Japanese call an amorphous kind of surface. Now this tells us that this is cancer and because it is sessile is possibly going down into submucosa and so this patient is what we classify as genet 3 and straight away goes for surgery. If someone tries to do an adventurous polypectomy or something one is of course that there may be big vessels and you may be having a bleed but worse is that you're leaving behind tumor and may have to go back again to resect it surgically. So if you can make a decision upfront, then you made the right decision most of the time. So how do we actually go on using this technique? Important to have, of course, the appropriate equipment, but you must have a well sedated patient. Um, an antimotility agent like Muscopan is preferred. You must have a clean field, so it's good to have a water jet to clean up all the mu mucosa with water to get rid of the mucus and air bubbles. But most important, and this is lacking in most of us, and that is patience. We need to be patient and make every single endoscopy count. It doesn't take a great deal of time a gastroscopy with a good evaluation for screening takes anywhere from 7 to 10 minutes. If you find a lesion, obviously you're going to interrogate it a little further. But a screening gastroscopy seldom takes more than 7 to 10 minutes once you have a reasonable amount of experience. The other thing that I would like to emphasize is that every endoscopist must get familiar with the Paris classification and when you report this, you need to report it appropriately. We know that we have polypoidal lesions which are pedunculated or sessile. We have the more flat lesions which can be just mildly elevated. They may be absolutely flat or they may be a superficially depressed or what we call the 0-2C lesion. Why is this important? Is that if you just look at this one slide, we know that polyps, the bigger they get, they're more likely to be malignant, right? While this is true with the polypoidal lesions or even the flat or the mildly elevated lesions, if you look at 2C lesions or mildly depressed lesions, you find even when they are sub-centimeter, they can have submucosal invasion in almost half the number. And it goes on increasing as the size increases. So if you can pick up a superficial depressed lesion, you know that it is more aggressive and so you can tailor your approach appropriately. So it's not only just picking up but recognizing these subtle things and then reporting it appropriately is absolutely important. So finally to close, these are all my good friends at the ANBIG and you have uh, Dr. Philip Chu here and Professor Yutaka and Raj and all of them here, all masters and they're all part of this group called ANBIC, uh, which helps foster education in advanced endoscopic imaging. And I'm sure uh, if you attend some of these meetings, um, you'll be able to benefit from learning these techniques appropriately and get very skilled. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, we, will, we will do, uh, is there any question now? Let me check. Uh, or we will move on towards. I think we have a we have a poll. Uh, I will ask all the participants, please, to to answer the poll. The first question is about N NBI interrogation of mucosa required mass use of dyes. So we will wait for the answer for for a comment later on. The second question, oh, this is the same question, second question. 
the use of, of NBI is based on uh, staining of the mucosa with dye, magnification, or use of a narrow band to highlight the superficial detail. We have 44 attendees today, so quite a good number. I think we can have some good data. Great. Uh, we have four percent. Uh, everybody, I think they. Do you want any, any comment, Dr. Bat? I think they, yeah. everybody reply. I think most of them have got it right that you don't need dyes and messy dyes. All you need to do is press a button, and you can get the superficial details. I think. Because yes, you did an excellent, excellent job. The next will be the benefit of NBI in daily practice include differential malignancy. Better pickup of superficial lesion in the esophagus, helping decision in strategy of tackling polyps of the colon and all, all the above. We are expecting a, a great success in this uh, question too, I believe. Dr. Naresh? Yeah, I think uh, most of them yeah. have got, yes. So you happy? what that I want to make here is that in the esophagus, it helps you pick up lesions better, uh, right? But in the stomach, when we use NBI, you have to pick up the lesion on, in, on white light endoscopy and use NBI to interrogate the lesion and then you decide whether it's malignant or non-malignant. Of course, artificial intelligence and other modalities are coming up, which may help us pick them up better. But as of now, I think NBI is in the stomach at least, because it's very large. You can't see all of it at one stage. Unlike a more tubular esophagus where you can use it to sort of pick up lesions, in the, in the stomach, it's a little different. So you can only, you depend on your experience and good white light endoscopy, and then integrate a small uh, part of it appropriately. Of course, in the colon, uh, we know that uh, how you look at the colon, whether there's a 2C, the size, and the vascular surface on these uh, microvessels, all of us tell us that, uh, you know, whether it's aggressive or not so aggressive, whether you can do a polypectomy, EMR, or you need to do an EST or surgery, all these decisions can be taken. I think the audience, almost all of them have got it right. They've done well. Any, I don't think there's any other poll, so we can move to the next uh, uh, speaker. Thank you, Dr. Bat. Stay with us if there are other further questions. Uh, okay, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce Professor Philip Chu. That is one of the men behind uh, the appeals as a, as a board member, but also uh, helping and supporting the organization since the beginning. He's a professor of surgery at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Is director of education and training at the Institute of Digestive uh, Disease at the same university, director of the Jockey Club uh, MIS uh, Surgical Skill, and I believe one of the latest achievements was become assistant dean for external affairs at the Faculty of Medicine of uh, CHUHK. Philip, I think you will talk about uh, resection, endoscopic resection in upper GI. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, David, for your introduction. So first, uh, let me share my uh, PowerPoint. So uh, you can see the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, yes, we uh, can it is, it. thank you. So uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to share with you um, the endoscopic resection to our upper GI. So uh, as uh, mentioned before, um, the uh, advanced uh, cancers have a poor prognosis uh, because uh, uh, for, especially for gastric cancer, most of them were diagnosed at the, early, uh, at the advanced stage and the treatment is usually radical surgery and uh, that uh, uh, would uh, also need to follow by adjuvant chemo or radiation therapy and uh, that give us to poor prognosis despite all this treatment. But, uh, uh, early diagnosis of uh, these uh, gastric cancer have uh, excellent prognosis. Uh, it is uh, actually across uh, all countries uh, where you are making a mucosal uh, diagnosis at the mucosal stage, then uh, the uh, overall survival is 90% uh, or more. So 
uh, for treatment of uh, early gastric cancer, if it is uh, located uh, with a local uh, limitation, just like an intramucosal lesion, you can treat it by endoscopic resection. But of course, if there's a risk of a nodal metastasis, then we have to treat it back by uh, minimal access surgery, uh, which will be a laparoscopic gastrectomy. So the advantage of endoscopic resection include a uh, locally curative intent treatment. Uh, it can preserve the organ, so you don't need to uh, resect the patient's organ. So it uh, ends up in a better quality of life and also uh, less post-gastrectomy syndrome and uh, probably also a better post-operative outcome uh, with a shorter hospital stay and early return of GI function. So in the past, we have been treating this uh, lesion by a conventional EMR. So uh, uh, the uh, outcome of this uh, EMR actually varies, uh, especially when the size of the lesion is uh, bigger than two centimeter. Uh, because um, the, uh, most of the EMR technique can resect a lesion uh, up to um, two centimeter. If it's bigger, we require a piecemeal resection and uh, that may uh, end up actually in a higher chance of a local recurrence. So with the development of endoscopic submucosal dissection, we can uh, achieve a good on-block resection of this lesion with a wide resection margin and a better specimen for histopathology. Uh, there could be some challenging uh, uh, point of practicing this uh, ESD. Uh, in the stomach, it may be difficult in the upper uh, part of the stomach, like at the gastric cardia. In the esophagus, it's also considered to be more difficult. So um, the practice of uh, ESD or uh, for resection of this uh, intramucosal uh, cancer actually uh, depends on the risk of the nodal metastasis. So this is one of the uh, publication from Professor Gotoda about um, the resected specimen uh, after gastrectomy showing you that uh, for overall lymphoid metastasis rate for T1 with uh, intramucosal cancer is 2.2%. And of course that would be uh, related more to a undifferentiated cancer. If it is differentiated uh, adenocarcinoma limited to the mucosa, the uh, risk of nodal metastasis is only 0.4%. So that uh, actually leads to a revision of the uh, uh, expanded indication for uh, early gastric cancer resection uh, from the Japanese Gastric Cancer Association. In the past, uh, they are only limited to mucosal cancer without ulceration less than 2 cm. But uh, right now, uh, it's been extended to uh, mucosal cancer without ulceration uh, uh, if it's an uh, in, intestinal or well differentiated type, uh, no matter what size, you can resect it by ESD. If it's an ulceration less than uh, 3 cm, it can also be treated by endoscopic resection. For some mucosal uh, cancer uh, intestinal type, uh, if it's uh, less than 3 cm, uh, it's uh, SM1, it is still uh, within the uh, territory of endoscopic resection. And in the future, probably a poorly differentiated or diffuse type uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, which is uh, less than 2 cm, may still be a potential uh, candidate for expanded indication for endoscopic resection. <coughs> so the first concept of uh, ESD comes uh, from, uh, reported from uh, Dr. Ono uh, and uh, the group uh, where they published in guts uh, about the uh, use of uh, IT knife, the very first uh, prototype of the IT knife uh, for uh, mucosal incision and followed by a snare resection for the uh, early gastric cancer, demonstrating a local recurrence rate of only 2%. And uh, subsequently, there are numerous uh, ESD devices being developed, uh, so including the insulated type and non-insulated uh, type, uh, like uh, the Hawk knife, the TT knife, flex knife, and uh, short needle knife, uh, fresh knife, and uh, there are also other knife, uh, SB knife, dual knife, uh, hybrid knife. And I think uh, the uh, ESD device is not only limited to the knife, we also need to pay attention to uh, the uh, venue that we are performing this. And uh, right now we are doing uh, in the endoscopy suite uh, and uh, 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 with a uh, facility uh, ready for uh, general anesthesia or MAC or IV sedation. Definitely we quite a intensive monitoring for deep uh, sedation. And uh, we also need a good electrosurgical unit 
And uh, I think uh, nowadays uh, we use either uh, Erby 300D or uh, Olympus ESG 400. And uh, the kind of energy that uh, we use uh, for the dissection, uh, uh, of course, uh, depends on the individual expert. Uh, but uh, this is my usual setting uh, for the Wild 300D. I use uh, Endocut uh, Q333 for gastric and uh, for uh, some mucosal dissection, I use a strip coagulation mode. You also need a good uh, injection solution for a some mucosal uh, injection because you need to raise um, the um, uh, you need to raise uh, the uh, kind of um, uh, some mucosa before you can actually um, uh, perform a good uh, some mucosal dissection. So uh, I uh, use a high molecular weight uh, compound, uh, including uh, the uh, sodium hyronate uh, or uh, glycerol and uh, uh, currently uh, the new uh, uh, high molecular weight compound like uh, all rice gel will be uh, used. So uh, this is a uh, short video clip to demonstrate uh, the performance of uh, gastric ESD. So firstly, like uh, what uh, Dr. Badger mentioned, we uh, mark around the lesion and uh, using the MPI to locate the lesion. And then the, after marking, we will have uh, some mucosal injection to raise the lesion. And then the sub starting with a uh, mucosal incision around the lesion, we need to pay attention to the good resection margin. And after exposing the submucosa, you can see the blue dye. Then the, we are dissecting at the submucosa uh, using the uh, dual knife, in this case, from Olympus company. And uh, it has also got an injection function. So uh, it's uh, easy uh, to inject and uh, continuous injection so that to enhance the submucosal um, dissection. And then the further injection and uh, opening up. And uh, this is uh, uh, considered as a difficult location because of um, the um, uh, uh, the location of uh, this lesion over the proximal stomach. And then the, uh, I also combined the use of the uh, IT knife together with uh, the dual knife for the dissection. So in this uh, location, uh, we need to work at a ritual vertical position so that uh, we can dissect. And uh, sometimes it's a bit difficult uh, uh, especially when we encounter some uh, dense adhesion. Uh, this is uh, quite common uh, to encounter uh, because uh, uh, a lot of endoscopists uh, take a more biopsy than usual. So that may uh, cause a difficulty in uh, performing the dissection. So this is a kind of lesion with a dense um, mucosal fibrosis. So uh, this is the uh, technique that I use, uh, close dissection with the dual knife. And uh, this is the final part of the resection uh, with a combination of the TT knife, I can uh, completely resect the lesion. So, and uh, if you are having a problem with the uh, retraction, so uh, this is one of the methods uh, that uh, we can use the uh, clip in attachment to a uh, dental floss or a string or a suture that you can uh, apply the clip per orally and apply it to the uh, edge of the mucosa and pull the dental floss or the string from the outside so that we can uh, achieve a good uh, retraction. And uh, from the, uh, uh, this uh, randomized control trial, you can demonstrate that the procedure time may have uh, some advantage with the use of the dental flows technique. Uh, when we are comparing the EML against ESD for treatment of uh, early gastric cancer, we found that, that uh, the ESD achieved a much better on block resection uh, especially for lesion bigger than two centimeter in uh, ten, uh, one centimeter in size, as compared to uh, EMR, and uh, also demonstrated by a meta analysis showing you that the on block resection rate was uh, better uh, with the ESD, uh, while the uh, recurrence rate is also uh, better. But there is a higher chance of complication, including uh, perforation and bleeding, with the use of the ESD as compared to EMR. Uh, while uh, our uh, unit actually uh, conducted a randomized control trial comparing uh, laparoscopic gastrectomy against ESD, showing you that the operative time is shorter for ESD and the hospital stay is also significantly shorter for ESD for treatment of uh, early gastric cancer, uh, the uh, complication rate is lower for uh, ESD as compared to laparoscopic gastrectomy, while 27% uh, of patients 
we acquired a uh, salvage uh, surgery, uh, uh, that means a laparoscopic gastrectomy. While the pain score was significantly uh, lower for ESD as compared to gastrectomy, as well as the C-reactive protein, protein uh, on the day one and day three. And the issue of e after ESD, including short-term complication like bleeding, perforation or structural formation, or incomplete resection that requires salvage surgery, while in the long term, we need to uh, assess uh, and follow up with a surveillance endoscopy uh, for risk of uh, local recurrence. And uh, functionally, the patient will be better with uh, ESD because it's an organ preservation. So selfish surgery should be offered for a treatment after ESD if uh, this is an incomplete or non-curative ESD. Uh, that would be defined as uh, lateral margin involvement or deep margin involvement. So most of the time, uh, lateral margin involvement, we just need to follow up. If there's a local recurrence, we uh, can perform a recur uh, re resection by ESD. While for deep margin involvement, then we require a surgical treatment. For example, if it's a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with a submucosal invasion and a lymphovascular permeation in the histopathology and also perineural uh, permeation, that uh, those are the features that uh, require a salvage uh, surgery uh, resection after ESD. So in summary, I think ESD achieved an overall resection for early upper GI cancer. Preoperative uh, careful case selection will be required that can result in a uh, curative on block resection by ESD. And ESD can be performed safely outside Japan and Korea in other Asian countries. Uh, but the, the technique of ESD should be acquired through standard uh, training protocol. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Philip. Uh, excellent uh, review. Uh, do we want to launch the poll? Uh, do we want to launch the poll? Do you have any poll, Philip? No, no, I, I think I don't have uh, any poll. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, do we, let me check, uh, uh, what is the next talk would be the lower GI? Uh, maybe we can have after uh, Dr. Amol a, a bit of discussion or you need to go? Yes, I think we can wait for uh, the final discussion, okay. yes. Excellent. Let me introduce now Dr. Amol Bapaye. They will talk about endoscopic resection on the upper GI. Just a moment. Uh, Dr. Amol is a director of uh, Shivananda uh, Desai Center of Digestive Disorder in uh, Pune. He's the managing trustee of the Foundation for Research and Education in Endoscopy and uh, also uh, is uh, in clinical practice since 20 years, uh, one of the pi pioneers. He also uh, got an award, uh, gastroenterology award at the World Endoscopy Organization in 2014. Uh, Dr. Amol, I would like to uh, pass the microphone to you to share with us about your uh, experience in the uh, endoscopic section for lower GI. Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. And uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me for this uh, excellent uh, program. I would like to share my presentation and uh, let us get going. So we had two uh, very interesting uh, talks by Dr. Naresh Bhatt and then Dr. Philip, from Dr. Philip regarding NBI and then endoscopic resections in upper GI. And now it's my turn to speak about lower GI. So we know that colonic polyps can be pedunculated or they can be sessi and pedunculated polyps can be usually easily removed by endoscopic snare polypectomy, whereas sessile polyps or flat polyps require specialized endoscopic measures called as EMR or ESD, or actually to uh, elaborate that further, it's called endoscopic mucosal resection or endoscopic submucosal dissection. So we know that colonic adenomas or polyps harbor the risk of malignancy and the risk of malignancy increases 
based on the size of the polyp and larger polyps have a higher risk of developing cancer or harboring cancer. And we also have seen from Dr. Naresh Bhatt's uh, presentation that NBI or image enhanced endoscopy gives us improved visualization of the vascular pattern, the pit pattern, and also it gives us an accurate estimation of the submucosal invasion. Based on that, several classifications have been described and the, one of the commonest ones that is being used in this part of the world is the, the JNET classification, where we have either a hyperplastic polyp, which is type one, or even a sessile serrated adenoma, which is called as type, uh, type one. And we have the type two, which is either a low grade or a high grade, or the type three, which also which indicates deep invasive mucosal, submucosal invasive cancer. So it is basically endoscopic resections are basically for type one and type two lesions. The type three are obviously going to go for surgery, but whenever these lesions are early, then we can probably consider endoscopic resection. Beyond that, colorectal lesions can also be classified the, especially the lateral spreading flat lesions can be classified as granular, where you have these, uh, the surface is uh, quite granular and nodular over here, as compared to the non-granular granular variant, where it is a really fine granularity or really, a, uh, you know, very flat lesions, not much of nodularity. And it is a non-granular lesions, which may also be depressed. And we also saw earlier that the depressed lesions have a higher chance of harboring malignancy even when they are small. We also know that the Paris classification based on the protruded superficial and excavated type. But what is most important is we need to understand that mucosal cancer spreads from the surface inwards deeper. And at the point where it starts invading the submucosa, the submucosa is also divided into SM1, 2, and 3 layers. And this we can understand a little bit better in this diagram where we can see that the submucosa, there is the lymphovascular plexus resides in the SM2 layer or in the central part of the submucosa. And once the cancer touches the lymphovascular plexus, we know that that can lead to lymph nodal metastasis. But as long as it is restricted to the mucosa or the superficial submucosa, the risk of lymph node metastasis is very low. Is less than 3% for mucosal lesions, whereas it can go as high as 18% when there is some mucosal invasion. So based on that, we need the endoscopic resections are described as, uh, and we need to perform an end block resection as far as possible because it has three important roles. We need, an, uh, we need to achieve a potentially curative resection. We need to allow for a accurate histological evaluation and also assess the risk of lymph node metastasis, particularly because larger lesions have higher increased malignant potential. And therefore, an end block resection is always desirable as far as possible. Therefore, whenever we, we perform endoscopic resections, it is according to this flow of events. We screen these patients for cancer, particularly the lower GI. If there, are, there is a polyp that is identified. We characterize it based on NBI and magnification endoscopy. Biopsies routinely are not recommended, particularly if you are performing an endoscopic resection because it can lead to fibrosis. Then we can perform one of the endoscopic mucosal endoscopic resections, either EMR or ESD, preferably in an end block manner, although piecemeal has also been described in certain situations. And then we submit the uh, specimen for histopathology, wherein the peripheral and the deep margins both are evaluated Invasive invasion, depth of invasion is calculated and vessel invasion are also looked at. And that gives us the final diagnosis wherein we can estimate whether the resection was curative or whether this patient would require some additional surgical therapy. So based on that, now EMR is basically a modified polypectomy. So what we do is for a flat lesion, we inject in the submucosa to elevate this lesion, to create a pseudo polyp and then we resect the lesion based on like using a polypectomy snare. End block resection of, you know, by using EMR is usually possible for lesions up to two centimeters in size, whereas larger lesions require a piecemeal resection. So these are just some videos, two videos. There, the right side, it's a larger lesion, whereas the left side, it is a much smaller lesion. 
So you can see we are injecting the submucosa to really get a very large lift, a wide lift, and then we apply a snare and then we resect. The left side one is being resected end block, whereas the right side, because it is very flat and very wide, it requires a piecemeal resection. So multiple pieces on the right side, whereas in the left side, a single piece and we can resect it out. Of course, we can get a clean margin using both. But then despite that, what are the problems that we have? End block resection, because we can do it only up to two centimeters and the larger lesions require a piecemeal resection. Sometimes there can be a higher rate of recurrence after piecemeal resection, even up to the tune of 20%. And the pathological examination can be suboptimal. And because of that, based on the resection size, the concept of ESD or endoscopic submucosal dissection was uh, developed because there was an increasing demand for devices for wild field EMR. And what do we do in an endoscopic submucosal dissection? We resect the, the tumor in an end block manner using a circumferential resection strategy. And we peel it off from the, from the muscle layer by dissecting it in the deep submucosa. Uh, uh, and that gives us a better accurate pathological staging and it can also be potentially curative for mucosal cancers with or without superficial submucosal invasion. So these are the steps of ESD. We mark the lesion, although in the colorectal, in the colorectum marking is usually not required. It is more often required in the upper GI. Then we lift the lesion up by injecting in the submucosa to create a bleb. And then we incise the mucosa either at one point or circumferentially and then we dissect to peel the lesion off from the muscle layer and then resect the lesion completely. So this is basically one video that I will probably run through a little bit. So here we are injecting, there's a large lesion in the rectum that you can see. We are taking a mucosal incision at the distal margin. It is a pretty large lesion, you will see that. Now this is the muscle layer and this is the submucosa. We use a little bit of indigo carmine or methylene blue in the uh, injectate to stain the submucosa so that it, it becomes easier for identification. And here you can see the tumor. Now we are doing the lateral margins. We, this, is, this type of ESD is called the pocket ESD because we have created a pocket in the submucosa over here. And then we are resecting the submucosa and the lateral margins. So gradually many of these procedures can be pretty painstaking and prolonged. But the beauty is that it is an organ, organ preserve, preserving resection and the patient's recovery is really very quick. Here you can see that the lateral margin is being resected and divided. And there is a fi final part of the resection now. What is important is we need to preserve the muscle layer because that can lead to a perforation if the muscle layer is divided or if there is breach of the muscle layer. This is the proximal incision that we are completing. And then the final specimen being delivered. So that is a specimen and that is a final defect. Now these defects heal very miraculously. And if the resection uh, margin is less than uh, two thirds of the circumference, the chances of stricture formation is much less. Similarly, very large lesions or even circumferential lesions can also be resected. I'm going to run through this video a little bit because otherwise it will be too long. Uh, you can see a circumferential is a resection over here, in a lesion over there, and we're injecting it. And then what we do is we use a tunneling technique as we also use it for the POEM procedure in achalasia. So we start incision at the proximal uh, or at the anal margin we create a tunnel in the submucosa and we go deep inside and we exit from the opposite side. And that is the opposite side now, you can see that. And then we create one or two tunnels and then you know, do the lateral margin dissection and the lateral margin uh, mucosal incision to complete the resection. So that is a complete circumferential resection being done, uh, having been done over here, you can see over there. And that is a 
ring of mucosa which has been resected completely. Once the resection has been done, the specimen also needs to be handled and therefore our pathologist also has to be part of the team. It has to be mounted on a rubber cart or a rubber plate or a cart with, the, the, with pins so that the specimen gets stretched and the pathologist needs to make sections at two millimeter intervals parallel to the line so that even the lateral margins and the vertical margins both can be commented upon and the depth of invasion can be evaluated very uh, accurately. Of course, endoscopic resections are not without their share of complications. Perforations can occur. As we can see over here, there is a lesion on this fold. We do an EMR and we see what is called over here as a target sign. Now, this is the muscle being divided user because of the diathermy effect. And this is the reverse target sign, which we can see on the specimen. And this, of course, requires closure and it will require endoscopic clips being placed. Similarly, bleeding can also occur. And most of the times, bleeding can be controlled endoscopically itself. You can see large spurting blood vessel. But using uh, several devices now, we have the coag rasper and we also have the flushing pump, which gives us the ability to clean the field while we are, while we are doing the uh, ESD. We can grasp, grasp the uh, bleeding vessel very accurately, make sure that there is no muscle layer damage and then coagulate this vessel very accurately. So what are the results of colorectal ESD? Several studies in many ways, but overall, if you look at it, that end block resection rates are more than 90% and R0 resection rates are more than 85%. Local recurrence, is about 7% and adverse events are to the tune of 18%, but most of them are mild and minor and they can be treated endoscopically. Now, when, when we are looking at n block resection rates and R0 resection rates, let me tell you one thing, that most of these resections have been performed based on the NBI appearance alone and without a preoperative pathological diagnosis regarding depth of invasion. So many of these resections, if they are not R0, they can still be followed up by conventional surgical techniques. So post-resection survival for early colorectal cancer is comparable when we are doing it uh, for early cancer. Uh, this is what was reported. And we can see that most of the results are quite comparable. Some limitations of EMR, we know that conventional EMR can be inadequate to, for larger lesions and the peripheral margin of the resection may be compromised. And because of diathermy artifacts in a piecemeal resection, pathological assessment can be suboptimal. And also the uh, plane of resection can sometimes be a little bit more superficial. So if there is submucosal invasion a little bit up to SM1 layer, then it may not be oncologically complete. And therefore higher recurrence rates and risk of leaving behind the cellular disease does remain. But remember that we are dealing with a diagnostic come potentially therapeutic procedure. So for these patients do require more follow-ups, but then these things can be also circumvented by performing ESD, although ESD is a little bit more challenging, particularly in the colon, because the colonic wall is thin, there is a higher risk of perforation and also a higher risk of delayed perforation. Very often the position and maneuvering the, of the endoscope is also a little bit more difficult and visualization and dissection on the proximal side can also be difficult. However, majority of these lesions are in the distal rectum and here this is a very easy and a very comfortable position to perform ESD. So when we choose between EMR and ESD, we do have to look at some of the tumor characteristics and sometimes a large nodule in a granular type, sometimes we still perform an ESD uh, whereas in the non-granular type, as far as possible, we should perform an ESD as much as possible. But otherwise, the granular type lesions can be treated with EMR and the non-granular with ESD. So these are the Japanese society guidelines for ESD as compared to EMR. I will not go into the details of that. But when we look at the European guidelines, and there are some similarities and some differences in that. So the non-granular ones, and the depressed ones more than two, centi uh, two, uh, two centimeters, ESD is the first option. Whereas the non-granular or the granular ones, uh, the smaller non-granular ones, 
he can perform an EMR safely. So these are some of the differences that uh, between the Japanese and the European guidelines are there based, basically based on the interpretation using NBI and that is how it is. So current treatment options for early colorectal cancers, we know that endoluminal therapy is important and they, it can be performed for T0 lesions and T1 lesions without lymph node metastasis. But the T1 lesions with potential lymph node metastasis is where, and this is the difference that we need to identify. And if we can, if we can do that preoperatively, then endoscopic therapy for these, procedure, for these lesions can be really effective. And that is important. And this is the recommended algorithm, a large colorectal lesion, referred to at advanced center and detailed examination. And they, there are, if there are no concerning features and a granular lateral spreading tumor, we perform an EMR. But if there are some concerning features or a non-granular tumor, then an ESD. And if there is suspicion of deep submucosal invasion, then obviously it requires surgery. So to summarize, N-block resection of collateral polyps and flat lesions is desirable. And ESD is superior to EMR or P, uh, piecemeal EMR for N-block resection. And ESD has significant advantages, but it is challenging. Complications are higher, but they can be easily managed by endoscopic methods. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ashad Amol, for a comprehensive. Uh, I think we are uh, good, well on time. And we can open the discussion. I don't know there's a poll here. Yeah? Uh, no, I don't have any questions for a poll. Okay, perfect. Then we will move on with a bit of discussion. There is a, uh, let me check the, okay. I have a question for uh, both Philip and uh, uh, Dr. Ramon. I think, uh, how do you rule out lymph node metastasis before proceeding with the EMR ESD? So yeah, how do you do in uh, upper GI, lower GI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, from the upper GI first, maybe. Uh, so in general, uh, we would rely on uh, preoperative uh, workup and uh, that will include a uh, more advanced endoscopic imaging technique uh, to differentiate whether it's a uh, mucosa or submucosal lesion. And uh, for submucosal lesion, there's a higher chance of uh, lymph node metastasis up to uh, 15 to 20 percent. So uh, in general, we use um, the uh, MBI together with uh, Magnify Endoscopy to recognize um, the changes in the microvascular and microstructural pattern, as uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Batch. And uh, afterwards, uh, we also uh, would do some imaging, uh, sometimes uh, with a CD scan, uh, or actually um, uh, there will be an argument whether we need an EUS to uh, differentiate between a submucosal uh, lesion or whether there's any suspicious enlargement of the block around uh, the uh, stomach. But uh, in general, um, there will be a problem with a lesion that has a suspected submucosal in invasion or superficial submucosal invasion. So for those lesions, even if you do the best uh, technique of uh, EUS is the, or the magnified endoscopy, you can probably only uh, achieve an accuracy of uh, 70 something percent uh, prediction of the death. Uh, so I uh, usually adopt a uh, diagnostic ESD technique. So that means uh, I explain to patient if uh, the uh, diagnostic ESD demonstrates a submucosal invasion, we will offer salvage gastrectomy. And then the, we would examine in detail the pathology and then decide whether the patient required the uh, follow-up surgery. Great. What about the lower GI now? Right. I think the principles remain the same uh, for upper GI and lower GI. I think whatever Philip has discussed for upper GI, majority of it applies to lower GI as well. Although EOS is less frequently used in lower GI, except for the rectum. For the rectum, we can use it, but for proximal lesions, it is very, it is practically cannot be used. The other thing is, uh, uh, the, in the lower GI, the accuracy of estimation of uh, submucosal invasion can go up to 95% or more because uh, um, uh, as compared to the stomach, because uh, we can estimate the, the submucosal invasion much more accurately. 
and uh, of course we can combine that with either a pelvic mri or a pelvic ct scan as it may be necessary to look for lymph node metastasis but very often we have to look we have to uh, remember that these lesions they are quite early and they will probably have only lymph lymphovascular invasion in the submucosa but may not have lymph node metastasis actually overt metastasis so it is going to be finally the submucosal invasion which is going to be important and as philip mentioned there will be some area lesions which are gray zones wherein we offer a diagnostic esd and follow it up with salvage surgery if the need be and we explain that to the patient thank you very much i think will be now the question uh, before i go back to philip and uh, you again i will go to dr uh, naresh uh, do you think that the nbi can predict the depthness of the lesion this is a question from dr kayasi from dubai yes i think uh, depth prediction so which which how, how deep can go nbi No, it's it's how you predict the depth is not like an eus where you can actually look at the invasion you look at the microvascular pattern and then sort of predict what may be the depth of the lesion whether there is submucosal or deep submucosal invasion so it is this is fairly accurate in the esophagus and fairly accurate in the colon but i think the big problem comes in the stomach where the accuracy is not very great and uh, again you have to in uh, undifferentiated cancers we know that submucosal invasion uh, is fairly frequent we can make a lot of mistakes so stomach is one area where depth prediction is a little sort of iffy there but in esophagus and stomach is pretty good so just to reiterate the previous uh, point is it's a two stage process on imaging if you can if you say i think there may be some because of invasion maybe you would certainly do an eus but if you say no i think it is superficial you go ahead and do the dissection and the pathologist tells you yes there is some because of invasion then you need to look further as to your strategy whether you want to upgrade to some kind of chemotherapy or surgery or whatever great So let me go back to Dr. Uh, now we go for lower GI first. So in case you have a lymph node of uh, out of the say the layer the submucosal layer uh, uh, finding uh, do it the thing the treatment will be change or, or not No now if so and the, if, how, how far you can go with your indication for uh, uh, endoscopic resection right so if there is the obvious evidence of lymph node metastasis or enlarged lymph nodes in the pararectal space or in the mesorectum on preoperative imaging then obviously these lesions are not meant for endoscopic resection at all then it will it will be a contraindication for end endoscopic resection and these patients require formal surgery or you know combination therapy with new adjuvant chemotherapy radiotherapy and then surgery so they are not candidates for endoscopic resection at all it is only for mucosal cancers or mucosal lesions wherein endoscopic resection would be of value and would be of benefit if whenever we find that there is already lymph node metastasis endoscopic resection is not the treatment of choice Philip Yes So I uh, how far you can go in case of uh, lymph node meds for yeah, so resection I or, think I think your your indication will change or not Yeah I think uh, if there's obvious lymph node metastasis I think this is currently contraindication so that means uh, when we have a preoperative CT pet ct or eus demonstrating uh, the uh, lymph node uh, around the stomach so a uh, lot of the time we have to uh, perform the surgical treatment but uh, right now there's also a experimental phase of uh, combining uh, sentinel node concept into resection of early gastric cancer 
where we may have a early gastric cancer uh, that uh, may have some superficial submucosal uh, invasion. Uh, the risk of lymphoid metastasis is still low. Uh, while uh, we want to preserve the stomach, one of the way is to do a ESD or endoscopic full fingers resection over the lesion uh, in combination with a laparoscopic uh, harvest of a uh, basin of the lymph node that uh, may be surfaced as a sentinel node. If those are negative, then uh, we just uh, uh, do the uh, ESD or the EFTL and then uh, we can uh, complete the treatment. That is a current uh, trend in the research, not the clinical practice. Yeah, you, you anticipate my next question. In fact, I was thinking, uh, what a combination, what is the role of combination of both endo and lab together for uh, yeah, full thickness? But let's see for the uh, lower GI. Okay. Yes. So when you can do a combined endo lab approach for uh, in, in, in a resection, in your experience? Okay, so honestly, I have I I do not have any personal experience of in a combined endo lab approach, although because you know fundamentally lesions that require and uh, that can be treated by endoscopic resection do not require a laparoscopic or a surgical approach, and uh, those lesions which require a laparoscopic approach do not require an endoscopic guidance. The only place where this would probably have a combination one would work is, you know, an on table, you know, identification or, you know, confirmation of a lesion or something of that sort. What we can do is tattooing is definitely a possibility for small lesions, as Dr. Butt mentioned, but with a deep submucosal invasion, which requires surgery where we can do an endoscopic tattooing followed by, followed by which the surgeons can perform a procedure, the surgery resection. But as clinic, as Philip mentioned, uh, the, the combined endolaparoscopic laparoscopic approaches are probably experimental currently to expand the indications for endoscopic resection, but probably in clinical practice, I don't think we have that currently. This does not hold true, of course, for for stromal tumors, for stromal tumors, we use this more often. We use this even in the upper GI as well as in the lower GI where a combined laparoscopic and surgical endoscopic approach can be performed for gastrointestinal stromal tumors where we start off with endoscopy, we resect the lesion partially with endoscopy and then the surgically the tumor can be taken out with a formal closure, but not for mucosal lesions. Great. Let me... There's a point, uh, David, there's a point I think is important, is when we think of mucosal cancers, I, I think uh, the moment it reaches the submucosa, we know that it's perhaps gone to the nodes. So you can't, there's really very little place for a combined resection. But for mesenchymal tumors, I think that's where the big place for a full thickness resection or for a combined approach. Excellent. Uh, there is any role, for example, for frozen section to assess the completeness of uh, ESD or EMR? Or NBI, for example, may be sufficient? Naresh, starting from you. I, I think it ultimately goes, I, I, I'm not aware of anyone doing frozen sections uh, for EMR or ESD. I think you end up resecting and then sending the whole tissue and uh, then you get a more accurate diagnosis. But uh, I think ultimately it goes on your experience and what you think is how reliable is your assessment. If you're a beginner, I think it'd be cautious to take biopsies and then proceed with the resection. If you are very experienced, then if your assessments are accurate, then perhaps you can proceed with the resection and send that whole resected specimen and then come up with a kind of a staging procedure, if I may put so. Philip, you want to? What is your experience? Yeah, yeah I, I think. Robotic, robotic uh, <laughs> advanced uh, excision. So, yeah, I, I think, uh, David, uh, you, I think an uh, important uh, principle uh, that you lay out is, in fact, uh, the margin. So, we have to ensure the margin. And uh, for that, the uh, endoscopic technique is probably more helpful than a frozen section because uh, even if you are doing the uh, 
uh, specimen uh, cutting, you need a very fine cutting in order to assess the, the uh, tumor invasion. So uh, probably uh, a uh, immediate intraoperative uh, frozen session will be able to help. But uh, in the contrary, uh, a better uh, preoperative endoscopic assessment uh, that you learn the technique of endoscopic assessment is important, and uh, especially in the lateral margin recognition. So sometimes uh, early cancer, like uh, early gastric cancer, the lateral margin may not be that easy to recognize. So you need a combination of technique, including MBI. Sometimes also need a chromoendoscopy uh, to ensure a good res uh, lateral resection margin. So more, uh, let's say, color-based uh, technique than frozen section. Yes. Everybody, I think, I agree. Okay, I think we have reached our time and uh, we can conclude the session by thank Dr. Amol, Dr. Naresh, uh, and uh, Dr. Philip, Professor Philip Chow, uh, Chu for the sharing with the, with the audience and uh, with the all, everybody your own experience and we we conclude the session. Uh, thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you so GV. much. Thank you. We pass the microphone to G V. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, that was a fantastic uh, session. Uh, welcome to the special guest lecture of April. Actually, for this, I invite my close friend Philip Chu. Uh, who holds a very good, uh, very high position in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is not only the professor of surgery at the Prince of Wales Hospital, Chinese University of Hong Kong, but is also the director of uh, medical education and training, and also the director of the most prestigious training institute, the uh, Jockey Club Training Institutes in Hong Kong, which has a lot of uh, newer innovations, new uh, equipment, which has been training surgeons and endoscopists across the globe. Uh, Philip Chu is not only a great academician, but also a true innovator, has got umpteen number of things to his credit, innovations to his credit. And uh, robotics is one of his fascination and is actively involved in the development of some flexible robotic endoscopic systems. And I think he's, uh, we'll have no better person than Philip Chu to talk on robotics in flexible endoscopy and how it is getting incorporated into clinical practice now. He's going to talk to us about the robotic colonic ESDs that are getting more and more popular. Initially, we have seen some upper GI ESDs being done, but with the advent of more advanced uh, robotics, flexible endoscopic robotic systems, we have gone into the new terrain and uh, Philip Chu is the best person to talk on this. And uh, this is uh, Philip Chu to you special guest lecture of APRIS. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, GV, uh, for your kind uh, introduction. So uh, first, uh, let me share uh, my screen. So, uh, so can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, Philip. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to uh, speak about um, the uh, robotic uh, colonic endoscopic submucosal dissection. And uh, right now, I think uh, the endoscopy has been developed uh, for the past uh, 60 years. Uh, since the era of uh, having the endo camera, we have the component of the endoscopy, including a light source, optics, processor, but at the very beginning, not as a diagnostic tool, but uh, in the recent uh, decade or two decades, Endoscopy has been increasingly applied as a diagnostic, uh, not only a diagnostic tool, but also a therapeutic tool. Uh, the modern endoscopy actually differs uh, from the traditional endo camera in that the light source has been upgraded. Um, the uh, optics has been uh, the uh, most modern type of optics and processor being the CMOS. So we have an excellent image that we can gather from the uh, endoscopy. But from the therapeutic side, we only have a working channel. And then the uh, instrument that we are using has been uh, uh, slow in the development. So we can only do very simple uh, therapeutic uh, pro procedures. So uh, kind of uh, what would be uh, the part of endoscopy that may improve uh, with the technology? I think uh, firstly, 
for the imaging processing, uh, AI is uh, coming up. And uh, for the steering and locomotion of the endoscope, probably image guided or uh, with the sensor and also with the robotic, we may help in the steering and the, the locomotion of the uh, endoscopy. So, but then the endoluminal therapy will be greatly enhanced with uh, technology. So the trend for endoscopy in the next uh, 10 to 20 years, I think uh, to improve on the efficacy and quality of diagnostic endoscopy, we should have an uh, AI system uh, in combination to, uh, with uh, the uh, improvement in the imaging, helping uh, a physician to make an uh, accurate diagnosis or early cancer. Then we have an increasing potential in the therapeutic endoscopy uh, for the treatment. So uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection, as uh, mentioned previously uh, by uh, Amol, uh, it's indicated for early colorectal cancer. Uh, it's especially in the advantage that uh, it's a locally curative intent treatment with a organ preservation and also a better post-operative outcome in terms of a shorter hospital stay and early return of GI function. So this video demonstrates uh, one of my uh, uh, rectal ESD procedure uh, where I'm dissecting uh, in between the, the mucosa and also the muscularis propria layer. And uh, if you look at uh, this uh, video, you can see that uh, uh, the uh, ESD performance uh, it's uh, depending on the steering of the endoscope uh, towards driving uh, the ESD device uh, over the uh, submucosa to achieve a good uh, resection. So this is uh, very much a uh, uh, not like uh, what we are doing for a laparoscopic or minimal invasive surgery. So uh, colorectal ESD has been indicated for uh, lesions uh, larger than two centimeter, uh, where on broad resection by EMR technique is difficult, uh, especially when uh, Dr. Amo uh, already uh, pointed out um, the uh, uh, lateral spreading tumor non-granular type, uh, lesions with uh, uh, kudos, uh, uh, type uh, 5 uh, pattern, um, carcinoma with uh, some mucosal infiltration. Uh, so uh, mucosal lesions with fibrosis uh, due to previous uh, biopsy or a rec local recurrent tumor. But uh, from our experience, uh, ESD is uh, difficult to practice outside Japan uh, when the, there's a limited uh, case uh, for experience. So this is one of our uh, previous uh, workshop conducted for uh, training of uh, ESD, demonstrating that uh, uh, both gastroenterologists and surgeons, when they are first performing uh, the ESD in a POSI model, there is a 62% chance of a perforation for the first procedure. So why would ESD be difficult? So I think this is uh, one of the nice photo uh, that uh, given to me from Professor uh, Nakajima from Osaka University. Uh, demonstrating the difficulty. So uh, when we are doing ESD, it is like um, uh, attaching the knife over your forehead and moving the knife together with your eyes and the forehead to make the dissection. Where in general, what we are doing uh, we, when we are eating, we are holding the knife and the fork and uh, we are looking uh, at the distance for the dissection. But uh, the uh, experience that we gain from uh, laparoscopic and robotic uh, surgery helps to uh, probably uh, inspire endoscopy in terms of uh, how to perform a high quality uh, surgical dissection. So this is one of my procedure of uh, robotic gastrectomy where you can see uh, we have a good uh, control of uh, the dissection field with a high quality of lymph node dissection by using the robotic system together with a 3D and 4K uh, display that uh, we can uh, perform a very accurate surgical dissection. So that actually would end up in a better uh, quality of uh, oncological clearance uh, as well as a uh, better post-operative outcome. So what would be needed for future therapeutic endoscopy? I think uh, we probably need a better imaging. So now we have a good imaging but uh, better with the 3D or 4K uh, endoscopic imaging. We probably need a good tissue retraction device and also for the dissection, like a multitasking robotic endoscopic platform. We uh, probably need a tissue approximation device uh, uh, like a surgical uh, suturing or stapling through the endoscopy 
to allow us to have a, a tissue approximation after resection. So uh, this is one of the system uh, which is the MED Robotics uh, being developed and uh, this is a robotically driven endoscopy uh, platform and uh, with the robotic system uh, driving the endoscope uh, there are two uh, mechanically driven uh, device that can pass through the uh, external channel for a performance of advanced endoluminal procedure like ESD. So currently FDA, US FDA approved uh, this device for use of surgical access to oropharynx, hypopharynx and larynx or the uh, rectum and anus uh, or the distal colon with the age uh, older than 22 years. So uh, this is uh, one of the video uh, demonstrated uh, uh, from a publication at the GIE. The other system uh, that was developed is uh, from ERCAD uh, France, uh, where they built up from the uh, previous uh, built mechanically driven animbiscope, and uh, they try to robotize this uh, system and now become the endolimital surgical triangulation 2.0. And uh, from the uh, ex vivo policy model testing, uh, they actually successfully performed a colorectal ESD using this system. So uh, from uh, our team, uh, the master system was being developed by Professor Lawrence Ho from National University of Singapore and uh, Professor Lawrence Free from Nanyang Technological University who is our chief engineer and uh, I served in the team as the clinical advisor. Uh, the first uh, concept uh, being uh, developed uh, while Professor Cindy Chung, our former uh, Dean of Faculty Medicine CHK, visited uh, Professor Lawrence Ho and uh, Professor Louis V and uh, developed this uh, crab core idea during uh, the enjoyment of the chili crab in Singapore. And uh, they, together with uh, Professor Ji Wao and Professor Nagi Reddy from uh, Hyderabad, India, we actually uh, conducted the first uh, trial on the use of this robotic system called the uh, master system for performance of a uh, gastric ESD. So two patients from Hong Kong, three patients from India received this uh, procedure. If you look into uh, the video, you can see that uh, this is a proof of concept study. Uh, we have uh, the uh, right hand able to re retract the mucosa and the left hand performing the uh, dissection. So with this concept in mind, we will be able to expose uh, the submucosa adequately uh, using the uh, master robot and uh, while we are performing the submucosal dissection. So uh, this, uh, you can see the surgeon is sitting over the bedside of the patient. We need the endoscopist holding the endoscope. And this system is built on the conventional double channel endoscope. Uh, in this publication in the Clinical Gastroenterology and the Hepatology in 2012, the editorial written by Professor Rob Hoss uh, have it the title saying uh, robotic endoscopy, a small case series, a giant step for endoscopy. But recognizing this system is uh, only a prototype. Uh, if you um, watch the Iron Man movie, you will know that the first Iron Man is only a prototype enough for escape. So uh, this will not be a system that we would believe uh, be able to carry forward for further um, uh, clinical uh, practice. So uh, that's why uh, we have uh, the company, the Endomaster company who have uh, redesigned the system into the Endomaster EC system. It has an independently designed a flexible robotic platform uh, with the built-in imaging system and also working channels for the two robotic arm and the one working channel for the accessories. So this is the idea of the Endomaster. So um, easy system with uh, the uh, two robotic arm being uh, passed over the newly designed flexible endoscopic platform. So uh, that would allow us to perform a ESD procedure with the two arm. So we have tested this system in the preclinical animal study for both uh, performance of uh, ESD in the esophagus in the stomach and also in the colorectum. So in a live policy model, so this is one of our procedure uh, demonstrating the uh, use of the master system for performance of ESD in the um, rectum, uh, 24 centimeter from the insertion. So um, we use this system to uh, lift up the mucosa, 
exposing the submucosa and performing the uh, dissection, you can see the uh, muscular propria layer, while um, with the lifting, we'll be able to expose the submucosa and perform a, a accurate submucosal dissection with the right robotic arm. So um, with this uh, testing, we confirm uh, the efficacy and safety of this uh, practice uh, in a uh, policy model. And uh, this is uh, published in the recent uh, GIE. So this is the final part of uh, the dissection. And then uh, we can take out the specimen uh, using this uh, robotic system. So uh, with uh, this uh, system, we uh, conducted uh, five uh, endomaster uh, ESD in the policy model and uh, showing the uh, dissection time. Uh, it's uh, overall operative time is around 70 minutes and uh, the uh, dissection time is uh, 51 minutes. So there's a one case where uh, there's a profuse bleeding during the uh, procedure requiring a, a more time to uh, stop the bleeding which I think simulates uh, what we will be facing in the clinical trial. So with uh, completion of this uh, development of the system and also uh, the preclinical animal study, we are ready to move on to clinical trial. So starting this year in May 2020, we started the first case uh, of the clinical trial at the Endoscopy Center Prince of Wales Hospital. So um, I'm happy to demonstrate uh, this uh, video about the use of the Endomaster for uh, treatment of a early uh, chloride lesion located in the proximal transverse colon, 90 centimeter from the anal verge. So this is uh, very deep inside uh, the colon and uh, we'll be able to pass uh, this system to the transverse colon and perform the ESD. So this video is a uh, four times speed uh, and it's around four and a half minutes. So the procedure time for the total procedure time for this procedure is around 25 minutes. So you can see uh, the two robotic arm is being strategically placed over six o'clock and nine o'clock position so that uh, it allow a best ergonomic for manipulation. And uh, when we are performing this procedure, one of the prerequisites is to uh, put the target lesion in the optimal position for, for the operation. So uh, it's better to put this lesion over the six o'clock or actually in a slightly tilted manner. So after opening the uh, mucosa, we then uh, grab the uh, mucosa with the uh, left robotic arm and perform the submucosal dissection using the right robotic arm. So uh, the uh, exposure will be enhanced by the lifting action of uh, the uh, left robotic arm while the right over arm will be uh, performing the submucosal dissection. So you can recognize uh, that the sometimes uh, actually we encounter bleeding at the submucosa, so it required uh, the uh, hemostasis with the use of the uh, robotic arm. So uh, at the present, the uh, uh, robotic arm is uh, quite efficient in stopping the bleeding uh, together with a good uh, adjustment of the diaphragm setting using the ERB system. So uh, at the submucosa, you can also see that uh, we injected submucosally and uh, now we routinely use uh, the uh, Boston Scientific All Rise Gel for lifting and creating of the tube cushion. So with the use of the robot, we are not only lifting the uh, mucosa, but uh, over the uh, hostration of the colon or the folding of the colon, we can actually compress on the folding to expose the submucosa. This is more like a surgical concept, so not unlike an endoscopic concept. So we can push away uh, uh, tissue to expose the dissection plane. So very much like uh, what we are doing for uh, laparoscopic surgery. So this is, I think, the advantage of uh, using this uh, robotic system. So pressing on um, the uh, recursal fold of the colon, exposing the submucosa and performing the uh, dissection. So uh, right now it's almost finishing uh, the uh, procedure, but we have to be careful about uh, the dissection uh, at the edge so that we will not be uh, missing or cutting into the edge or, or, and uh, uh, avoiding the uh, involvement of the lateral margin. So now it is the final part. So we uh, lift up the lesion, see clearly uh, the uh, border, the margin of the lesion 
and then the, we uh, complete the uh, mucosal incision at the very end. So, and then the completing the uh, dissection using the uh, robotic uh, system. So this is the uh, final part uh, of uh, the uh, mucosal incision and some mucosal dissection. So right now we have completed uh, the uh, ESD procedure. You can take out the tumor and you can see this is uh, the specimen uh, with a good resection margin. So I think in the future, we will be looking into uh, also a development of robotic uh, suturing. Hopefully that it will greatly enhance uh, the uh, performance of the procedure and allow us to close uh, any uh, uh, ESD defect or uh, allow us to perform other clinical application like uh, GI emergency, mention of bleeding, perforation fistula and small technique cage or morbid obesity like a sleeve gastroplasty or a endoscopic full fitness resection. So uh, endomaster is uh, one of the concept to we develop the endoscope and the robotic arm together while uh, at the Chinese University, we are also uh, having another concept of developing the robotic arm on existing platform. So uh, we actually built this uh, robotic arm on the uh, USGI transport. And the USGI transport is usually mainly focusing on performance of uh, morbid obesity surgery, uh, like the ROSE procedure. And, uh, and you can see that uh, we can uh, also, using the same concept, control the two robotic arms. And uh, so finally, in the future, I believe that uh, with the combination of uh, this clinical experience in the using the uh, Endomaster robotic system, uh, we'll be able to uh, manage uh, ESD in the easier way with the robotic uh, system. And uh, secondly, with the enhancement of the imaging uh, together with the uh, ro robotic endoscopic platform available uh, for uh, suturing. Uh, we'll be able to enhance the future development of endoscopic surgery uh, with a pioneering more procedure, uh, more advanced uh, intervention, uh, like endoscopic full fitness resection. And uh, <clears throat> also there will be a potential of uh, some automation in some of part of the procedure. Uh, like if you are doing a ESD marking, you may be able to just use a robot automatically mark around the lesion to ensure a good resection margin in combining with uh, good imaging. So the computer will be able to recognize the lesion and automatically mark the lesion before we perform the uh, procedure. So finally, I'd like to invite you all to uh, attend a workshop uh, this year at the, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong Life Endoscopy Workshop, uh, which uh, we have organized the 34th time. And this year will be totally uh, online uh, workshop. So welcome everybody. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Philip. That was an outstanding uh, April's lecture of what is happening on the robotic side of uh, flexible endoscopy. The incorporation of robotics into flexible endoscopy seems to be the next in thing, along with artificial intelligence, which is going to be the game changer in endoscopic practice. Uh, congratulations for all the excellent work that is being done at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and the, uh, the Jockey Club uh, Training Center and the Innovation Center at uh, Chinese University. Congratulations. Uh, we hope that uh, all your system that you're working on come into clinical practice very soon and uh, it will be of immense benefit to the patient. Thank you so much once again on behalf of APELS for that fantastic lecture on the future of robotics and flexible endoscopy. And Thank with you. that, actually, Thank I you. think we're just running uh, on time. Actually, I'll hand over to my co-host, Dr. Rai Patanga, to take the proceedings for the next special lecture of APIS. Thank you, JV. Uh, outstanding lecture, Philip. It's, you set the tone for what promised to be a wonderful day ahead. And uh, it is my proud privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to, to introduce to you Professor Michael Lee, who is the, the Honorary Consultant General Surgery Director of Minimal Invasive and Robotic Surgery at the Hong Kong Sanatorium. He's an honorary advisor to the International Advisory Board for Minimal Access Surgery in uh, Nethersole Eastern Hospital, Hong Kong. He's honorary advisor to the uh, Jockey Club Minimal Invasive Surgical Skill, one of the finest training centers in Asia. He is also honorary clinical associate professor in surgery in the Department of Surgery, Prince of Wales Hospital, Hong Kong. 
more than that ladies and gentlemen he is the the man who set up apels who's brain child and he's toiled huge big time in the last few years to make apels into the body it is thank you michael for all your efforts in this and i welcome you to give your talk on the future of endolap surgery professor michael lee oh chairman thank you for such a fine introduction uh, i hope over the next 20 minutes i'm going to go through with you the concept of endolap uh, surgery and possibly a look into the future Okay. Major advances in surgical care in our current century to me have been the development of our endoscopic treatment and laparoscopic surgery. Both aim at providing minimal invasive treatment to patient with for better outcome and less morbidities. here complicated slide but really we're talking about develop of endoscopic work from the days of this diagnostic camera fiberscope videoscope and then ability to do simple procedure like biopsy polypectomy moving on to high vision uh, hd vision magnif uh, um, uh, magnification AFI, NBI, doing EMR and ESD. And then we move on to the era of POEM. And then now we're talking about robotic endoscopic surgery. Of course, I think if you look at what happens in surgical treatment, a lot of the previous surgical treatment that we used to do is replace no longer are we have to operate on a uh, bleeding peptic ulcer we can uh, have reflux surgery replaced by gastroplasty obstructive jaundice we can do ERCP and stone extraction for stenosis we can do dilatation destruction stenting various various procedures But of course, laparoscopic surgery had developed from days of just a simple resection of gallbladder, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And with the advances over the years, you can see various type of lap procedure is being performed. And in effect, of course, we have the ultimate uh, laparoscopic surgery by the robot. And the scope of procedure, you can see from a very basic lab cholecystectomy to appendix, even up to Whipple operation, liver resection, live donor transplantation, that's all made possible. Despite this, both advances and maturity and technique, each has its own uh, limitation. Endoscopic treatment is not suitable for large near circumferential lesion, technical difficulty at flexure behind mucosal fold for resection, and for laparoscopic surgery, there's a lack of tactile sensation for small lesion inside the lumen, and that's why it's difficult to locate early lesion. So the concept of endolaparoscopic surgery came along. That to me back in the early 2000s as a both as a trained endoscopist and laparoscopic surgeon i thought to myself why not combine the two techniques to use it on the right disease process so the two can be complementary in the application for patient's benefit I thought that will be an important setting to allow us to operate on patient with this combined technique because previously operative theatre is only for laparoscopic work, endoscopy suite or endoscopy surgery. When you have to do endoscopy in an operating suite, you have to either 
install uh, uh, endorsory equipment from outside or push it from outside and uh, it takes time to do that. But what about having an OR which is friendly to both imaging system and, uh, and this is the concept of the endolab OR. This is the first one built in my previous hospital, Family United so Eastern Hospital at 2005. That's 15 years ago. After building that OR, we had uh, a look at the efficiency of this endoscopy theater. And really, if you look at this paper published in Surgical Endoscopy, we've shown a 38% reduction in uh, OR time, 46% reduction in turnover time for our patient, and 60% reduction in time required to set up an additional scope. You know, in this OR, all the scope are compatible to the same camera system. And this need to plug and play is what I call. And of course, with the concept of that running well, I developed the next stage of the robotic endolab OR. Basically, same concept, except there's the introduction of the advanced MIS laparoscopic equipment, which is the robot. So I'll give you some example endolaparoscopic surgery. Here you are. We're talking about laparoscopic cholecystectomy and intraoperative ERCP. I have to stop sharing for a minute just to get my video going. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to put your questions in the chat box, which we'll put to Michael at the end of his talk. So this patient came with acute cholecystitis and uh, with abnormal liver function, young patient, and operative cholangiogram showed blockage at the lower end, probably from a small stone. So we decided to do an interruptive ERCP using the railroad technique of guy wine insertion through the cystic duct. And as you can see, with this technique, you can get 100% uh, cannulation rate into the non-dilated CBD. Philip, we're not seeing your video. Oh, okay. Michael, we're not seeing your video. All right. All right. Uh, uh, um, Kadora, can you pull up my video, please? I'm having problem here. Need to use the surgery. I'm missing the file that's here. This is a lot of times I will record it over. Any luck? Any luck with my video? Um, just hold on a second. I'm trying. Sorry. Yeah. In the meantime, Michael, do you think uh, surgeons should be doing US and ERCPs or restricting to upper GI and lower GI? Are you seeing the video? Yes, we are seeing your video yes, right now. Yeah, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, I'll leave the question after this. Go. Cholangiogram show no... Um, flow of contrast in the low end of CBD.
So in this young patient that decided to do a balloon plasty rather sphincterotomy for the patient because the stone is small and I don't want to cut the sphincter. And the uh, stone was extracted with the balloon. And the stone came out. And this is followed by the cholecystectomy for this patient. So one stage operation for this procedure and use of endolab this patient was very successful. So these are the figures that we did on the study. Uh, basically uh, comparing transistic ECBD and on table ERCP. There are no statistics significant uh, between the procedure. What about laparoscopic repair PP and common perforation site? Well, if you can't locate it on laparoscopy, you can always put a scope in and see. Another technique is the endolaparoscopic resection of gastric stromal tumors. And I hope oh, this is working. Okay. That's great. This patient had a stromal tumor at the cardia. So we decided to go ahead and use a combination of endolaparoscopic technique. We actually described this procedure in the literature called um, There's a name for it. I forgot. <laughs> Short name for it. But it required two surgeons, of course, or surgeon or gastroenterologist. So one puts in the um, endoscope to locate the lesion. The laparoscopic surgeon does a transgastric approach. Of course, um, this was the early development of our endolaparoscopic technique when, the, when we described this operation. I don't think the maturity of uh, endoscopic resection was so good then. That's why we thought of doing this. But you can see Philip is doing a lot of intra-gastric uh, uh, resection even for cyst tumor nowadays. It's just another modality of dealing with the condition. So this mucosal cyst is very near the cardia. So if you open transgastric approach, it's not easy. Open surgery is not easy. But a transluminal approach. And of course we use very hemostatic equipment. And we can repair the defect with intracorporate operative suture. And of course, the, the lesion then can be extracted using the endoscope over tube. And of course, there are uh, endoscopic resection, laparoscopic central lymph node, Biopsy. This is again uh, another technique to combine procedure.
What about small bowel lesion? Same thing. You can do small bowel and enteroscopy. Uh, after you located the lesion, then the laparoscopic surgeon can remove the segment of small bowel for resection. No. I think, uh, uh, okay. Right. Somebody's talking. So, um, okay. For lower GI tract, you can see here after anastomosis, you can do inspection straight away with the colonoscope, and you can see if there's bleeding. You can arrest it straight away and without having to face postoperative reactionary bleeding. So, both uh, minimax surgery tools have been developed for many years. There are new approaches with new tools. Just to introduce the robot and the uh, TEO instrumentation, a rigid endoscope. With this rigid endoscope, previous for TEO resection of rectal tumor, we extended to use colectomy uh, without having have a mini laparotomy extraction wound, but tumor extracted through the anus. I won't show this video, I'll show it this morning. This is a randomized literature of our, this is a randomized trial of the literature that we produce and you can see here you can see here that we have a very uh, good long-term result for any new collaboration or endolab surgery in the future definitely philip uh, move on to show a very futuristic endo laparoscopic approach that means using a robot and then a laparoscope an endoscope with robotic arms. That's coming, and he's just showing you that. So I think this is the future to go, to go totally uh, endo laparoscopic work. So these are the current application of the endoscopic robot at the moment. I won't go through this because Philip just went through all that. Finally, I would say young future, uh, young surgeons are future. I think good surgical training is the utmost important and it's our responsibility to propagate the future of endolaparoscopic surgery. Well, I hope to say hello to you, all of our uh, audience from APELS. And really our aim is to train and promote education of endoscopic laparoscopic surgery and even more importantly, on the continuous professional development. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Prof. Michael, for an excellent talk. Um, one question that I have in mind is, do you think as surgeons, we ought to be doing ERCPs as well as upper GI and lower GI? What is your vision for the future? I, I think ERCP is a technique uh, more reserved for surgeons doing hepatobiliary surgery. Because uh, obviously the, uh, the procedure is not as common as uh, OGD and colonoscopy. I think surgeons should be trained to do OGD and colonoscopy uh, uh, on the whole. ERCP, uh, really you should be uh, uh, dealing in the, in the specialty interest because uh, you've got the, uh, the demand for uh, expertise in training ERCP is a lot more. And uh, if you are a surgeon uh, trained in ERCP and you, you, you have a problem, you have the ability to deal with it uh, uh, yourself as well. And I think I'm a ERCP man and uh, hepatobiliary trained. And I thought my advantage with having that is to be able to judge when to use which technique. You know, there are uh, certain type of situation when ERCP can be quite dangerous when your lab surgery could do just as well and be just as good. So you have the decision making on your side because you have the training on both sides. 
Thank you, Prof. Michael. It's been an excellent session. I think Philip and Michael have really opened eyes about where the future of endolap surgery will be in the years to come. Um, any any other questions? Please put it in the chat box. I'll pass it on to the speaker. Um, Karen, are we ready to go live to AIG? Yes, we are ready. Great. So thank you for a wonderful session, Philip, Michael. And we'll move on now to live surgery at AIG. Uh, good morning, uh, welcome. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the entire uh, APELS board, all the board members, Chairman Michael Lee, for giving us this opportunity to do a live transmission from Hyderabad, India. For the next three hours or so, we have a, uh, around 15 cases that are planned for endoscopic surgical procedures from basic to advanced, which would involve the upper GI and the colonic procedures. I'm sure that all the younger surgeons and endoscopists who have logged in to see this program would benefit in immensely from the faculty at AIG as to how to do these procedures very safely and effectively. A lot of these procedures can be very uh, done very effectively, even at a peripheral hospital by younger surgeons who are getting trained in upper GI and colonoscopy. And as our chairman has said, actually, surgeons should restrict themselves to upper GI and endoscopy and colonoscopy and ERCP is obviously restricted to people who are uh, very keen in practicing or pursuing endoscopic career. In a few words, I'll uh, take you on to the endoscopic studios of AIG hospitals to start the live transmission of endoscopic procedures, which would go on till about 2.30, 2.45 Indian Standard Time. Thank you once again for the opportunity given, and I hope you'll enjoy viewing the endoscopic procedures from AIG hospitals, Hyderabad. Thanks, Jilip. Uh, the clinical history is the patient is an elderly female who is a known case of nash related CLD, presented to us with jaundice and abdominal distension since one month, and she had history of malinas one week back. The endoscopy showed grade 3 esophageal varices with red color signs, and the plan is endoscopic variceal ligation, which will be performed by Dr. Pradev Vinod. You know. Over to you, Dr. Pradev. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, this is a old patient uh, presenting with uh, uh, CLD and uh, uh, bleed. Uh, so uh, we're doing a endoscopy, uh, screening endoscopy as to what uh, is the reason for a bleed. So uh, screening endoscopy showing uh, uh, Varices, grade 3 varices with uh, red color signs. You can notice the red color signs which, which indicate that the, uh, the cause of bleed might be due to this uh, uh, esophageal varices which the patient has. But in, that also indicates that the uh, wall of the varices is very thin and uh, that uh, is a reason for the bleed in this patient. And before uh, we uh, do a variceal ligation, uh, we would like to rule out uh, any other source of bleed in this patient. Uh, as such, as a, as a game or uh, any uh, gastric angiotasia or gastric, uh, any ulcer bleed, 
uh, which can be a cause of bleed in patients with CLD also. So we need to rule out this uh, cause of bleed before we uh, do the variceal ligation. And most importantly, we also need to rule out any gastric varices, uh, a fundal varices, before we do the uh, variceal ligation, because uh, variceal ligation can increase the pressure if there are gastric varices, and that can be that can lead to bleed after the variceal bleeding. So, so we can this, see the mucosa pattern. So we can talk about something. The PHG yes, there, I think. Yes, there is PHG in this patient. Portal hypertensive, Portal gastric hypertensive gastric 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 gastric. but there are no gastric viruses. So you have ruled out uh, gastric viruses here. Yes. yes. And uh, we'll come back to the esophagus, and then we'll. <clears throat> so esophagus looks to be the source of bleed yeah. because there are red color signs yeah. and large esophageal viruses. Yeah. So we'll eradicate them using uh, variceal banding. Yes. So what are the other options you will consider, Pradev? We'll just uh, quickly load the uh, band. Can we show them first, this one? So this is the Saeed six-shooter six band, band. And uh, this uh, will be loaded onto the distal end of the scope. And uh, this allows us to band continuously uh, six bands. Uh, so, uh, so this is a, a band ligator, and there is a multi-band ligator, there are bands loaded onto the uh, end of the barrel and it is loaded It is loaded to the scope at one of the end and uh, there is a shooter uh, band deployer to the handle of the scope which is fixed to the handle of the scope which is used to deploy the bands. Okay. So here uh, we have uh, Put the ba uh, barrel with the scope with the band loaded onto it, uh, onto one end of the scope, and uh, the shooter or the band deployer to the handle of the scope. This is turned and used to deploy the band. Okay. So I'm introducing the endoscope with the band. This can be a little tricky, uh, a little difficult to intubate with the band uh, loaded because the size of the end of the scope might be a little uh, larger than a normal endoscope. Yeah. So uh, we should not push it too hard because it can lead to bleeding because of, uh, uh, already the uh, liver patients are little uh, high risk of bleeding because of the coagulopathy. So slowly uh, we need to slide it through the upper esophageal splinter. So uh, after reaching the G-junction, from the G-junction, we will start to band it. Uh, and uh, we should be careful that we don't band uh, two varices uh, on the same uh, area because it might lead to a stricture. So I, I would start banding from here. So I suck the varix into the barrel and read it out and then apply the band. So we have applied the band here. You can see there is no bleeding. And then uh, so slowly I pull back the scope a little and then select another varix and read it out again and band it. My loose can occur. It should not be a problem. It will stop. And uh, two varices should not be banded uh, at the same time. So, so this is how we do it. And then um, slowly I'm coming up and I should be careful uh, so that I don't band too high up. Uh, it is the first five centimeters from the GE junction is where the bleed usually occurs. Usually the viruses are more uh, likely to bleed from 
the first five centimeter from the D junction. So we select the uh, we select the, that area to bang. So, the, so there we can see a, a different color band here. Yes, yes. This is a, uh, the, this indicates that I have one more band left. The uh, it is a fifth fifth uh, band which is there on the uh, loaded with this uh, uh, band ligator which yeah. we have. So the penultimate so, band is uh, a yellow in color. Other bands are black in color. So you will know that the, now we are left with only one one band. band. So almost the viruses are eradicated. Yeah. You can see at six o'clock. Huh. Yeah, this one. So you are rotating the scope uh, because the up angulation is more uh, in scope. So he has rotated the scope and brought the posterior uh, varix anteriorly, and then he has applied the nicely the band. So now we can see that the whole uh, six bands have been applied. Yeah. And wh what will be the follow-up, brother? How will you follow uh, these patients? These patients, uh, we would like to see them back in two to three weeks, okay. uh, so that we, uh, whether we have eradicated all the viruses or not. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if they are not eradicated yet, we would like to ban them again and uh, see to it that they are eradicated. Somebody, some patients might take three to four sessions before we eradicate the viruses. So what are the likely complications? One is stricture you told. Yes, one is bleeding, which we can see right now. Uh, it might be mild, sometimes there can be heavy bleeding also. So uh, that is one of the most common uh, causes, I mean most common complications in this patient. And others uh, are, uh, uh, perforation can be there very rarely. Uh, what about post EVL ulcers? Yes, post EVL ulcers are very common. Uh, post EVL ulcers uh, do bleed if a uh, uh, patient has coagulopathy or uh, uh, any high tendency of bleeding. So it needs to be kept in mind after a patient has underwent a uh, variceal ligation and has come with bleed. So in those cases, we usually uh, stop bleeding with uh, banding if there are any other viruses left over, which would like, which would be the cause of bleed, or we would put in a glue if there is an active bleed, or we'll uh, put in a sclerosing okay. agent yeah. to stop the bleed. Thank you, Pranay, for that excellent uh, demonstration. I think you showed us very nicely how to do banding. It's a basic procedure, but I think uh, for surgeons, it's very important to learn this basic procedure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pranay and Mohan. So we'll go to the next uh, room where we have another interesting procedure for a patient with portal hypertension with a large fundal varices. Dr. Razim is going to show us this procedure and to, uh, take us through this procedure. Azim, we are on. I, just, I think we have a history of the patient first. Uh, so this, uh, Azim, you want to tell us about the history in this patient that is wrong? Or I think I will tell you this. In case of HCV related decompensated liver disease, Present a case with a liver tumor with elevated alpha fetoproteins with an episode of black pari schools and hematocysia. There was a fall in the hemoglobin and there was mild thrombocytopenia consistent with liver disease. So I have just immunoscope. your scope. You have seen a case of variceal band ligation. The other scenario in case of a liver disease is fundal varices. So here we can see that gastric varices are not very large and most probably they do not have any signs of basal cell hemorrhage. So that is not the source. It is very important to determine the source of bleeding before deciding on any endotherapy. So that is my PAG. And meanwhile, if my camera can just show the accessories we have kept ready, I'm just going to retroflex here and pull back the scope. So here I can see large fundal varices. You need good inflation for this as the folds get flattened out. So here you can, if the cameraman can just, because we had a liver disease, she is liver disease and she is funny varics, we have kept N octal cyanoculate, which is glue. We have distilled water loaded and the syringe. And my expert techniques, I would like to introduce Mr. Srinivasan and his able team and our anesthetist, Professor Gaud. So now we are all set. Regarding the positioning, 
the thing to be kept in mind is the patient, the scope comfort, and my technician. So there should not be too much of a difficult angle where there will be difficulty in putting the accessories in. So this seems to be a comfortable position. And if I take the scope all the way around, even this seems a comfortable position. But in this, there might be a little jiggle. So the other varics, maybe I'll take it in the other way. So I'm just pushing it. And we're just starting the procedure now. So this is a standard Olympus upper GI scope. And I'm introducing a cleotherapy needle through this. Now you can see that the needle comes out. The thing to remember is there is a dead space of around 2 cc. So I asked my assistant to just flush it. So the dead space has been done away with. And they just get comfortable. And now the glue is ready. The technique is to get the glue into the very cell and then push out 2 cc of distilled saline water. Saline is to be avoided because of polymerization. In this case, we are lucky to have a very clear vision, but sometimes there might be blood which can obscure the vision. So I'm going to just probe the varix to be sure that they are soft before deciding to inject them. So these are soft. Maybe I'll go over to the other position. I'm just sucking out all the fluid. Another useful point is once the needle is in, your scope suction channel is going to be compromised. So either this varix is soft or this varix is soft. So I'm going to inject here this early so that the glue gets in. And this is stable portion now. So I'm requesting the my helper to just, yeah. And I'm giving the gentle from poke in and glue inject. And I'm keeping the nail in. This is what is the dead space is done. Okay. And one more CC of dead space is done. Yeah. And I'm slowly just pushing away the scope. This is a trick. And you just gently pull out the needle. And so this is done. And now I can just probe this. The solution. So there is some moves. This is not to be worried. So we're taking another needle. The molecule you have injected acts a little faster. So within 30 to 43 seconds, this must have solidified. And I'm just going to probe gently around it to decide my next point of injection. The important thing is I've got a fresh needle and a stable scope position. And I'm just probing it. It is still a little soft. Maybe I'll just inject a little okay, needle out. And I'm just injecting here. Yeah. So one more CC of glue goes in. The distilled water goes in. Yeah. The bleeding seems to have stopped. And one more CC of distilled water goes in. And slowly I'm just withdrawing it and just flushing it out. And with the same needle, now, I'm just gently waiting here, and I'm going to probe this entire area to see whether it has been solidified. In this case, there was a tumor thrombus of the portal vein, and we of doing the renal parameters getting the CT scan, so we had a roadmap approach. But there are a lot of collaterals just around the gastric curvature and the spinorenal, and there was no large shunt. So, yes. So as you can see, it has all been solidified. And in this case, it looks as if with 2cc, the job has been done. The risk to be borne in mind is there's an immediate risk of pulmonary thrombosis because this glue can get into systemic circulation. So the peri-monitoring of this patient in the recovery is essential. And I will have a close watch on her hemoglobin. And I will keep my intervention radiology colleagues in the loop in case the patient has a re-bleed Tips, if you have the luxury of an intense radiologist, you can plan a tips. Or a second tube is another very important thing to be kept in the emergency because sometimes these viruses bleed in the middle of the night and you can't get a perfect vision. Even you put an overtube and try to suction it. In that case, you can just inflate a second balloon. The point is you have to just inflate a gastric balloon only. There is some controversy whether you need the esophageal balloon, but the chance of perforation are more. 
250 cc to 100 cc of air in the gastric balloon. The trick is to keep this in second tube in the fridge overnight. So it becomes rigid and with the magnets easily it can be inserted. And with a simple ultrasound you can screen and see whether it has been inflated. And you pull it and you keep it in the stomach. So the next day you can go in, meanwhile start the patient on octotide or telepatient based on the cardiac status. And then rescue with a second session of either an endoscopic glue or if a unit has, you can assess by an EUS. So, Dr. Azim, uh, yes. wonderful presentation of hemostasis of uh, fundal varix. Uh, we go to the next room. Thank you. Uh, the clinical, we'll go to the next room where Dr. Mohan Ramchandani is going to demonstrate a case. The clinical history of the case is that a young lady who presented to us with chest tightness and retrosternal pain Sir. associated with dysphagia. The upper endoscopy showed mildly dilated esophagus with fluid stasis. Uh, the esophageal manometry showed uh, jackhammer esophagus with DCI more than 9000 in more than 30% of the swallows with normal IRP. So the plan is for oral endoscopic long myotomy. This procedure will be demonstrated by Dr. Mohan Ram Chandani. So you are live. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so, uh, this lady has presented to us with a history of chest tightness and the pain is so severe that she is not able to sleep. Uh, so, this patient needs a treatment and uh, uh, the diagnosis itself is sometimes challenging because uh, you have to have a very strong clinical suspicion to to diagnose this because most of the time if you do endoscopy and if you are not vigilant enough you will say this endoscopy is normal there is no food stasis the LES is absolutely open but if you see carefully uh, you can see very much spastic contraction in the esophagus so this is a very very uh, difficult to diagnose patients sometimes are treated for psychogenic disorders uh, before actually diagnosing this. So if a patient who has chest pain uh, uh, and, uh, and the cardiac workup is negative, one should always do either a barium swallow examination, which is a very typical of uh, sometimes you can see the contraction in the esophagus, but the gold standard diagnosis uh, to such patient and is a very important armamentorium when you are dealing with non-cardiac chest pain is to have a high resolution esophageal manometry and as you saw in the tracing we saw very high amplitude contractions and uh, as I told this can be passed off as a normal endoscopy but patient who has a very high symptom, uh, symptoms and your manometry is showing uh, high uh, amplitude uh, contractions in the esophagus as you can see now but here the LES is normal the lower esophageal sphincter is normal in ecclesia cardia you will see uh, a very spastic LES here and the LES will not open with the uh, uh, swallow and that is why we calculate integrated relaxation pressure that is IRP uh, in, in all cases of uh, swallowing disorders and if we find IRP is high the disease is in ecclesia variety while if you find very high contraction in esophagus but LES is normal then there can be only two things one is diffuse or distal esophageal spasm or there can be jackhammer's esophagus. So jackhammer's esophagus has very high amplitude contractions while distal esophageal spasm have simultaneous contractions. So uh, I will not go into the details of manometry. So this patient requires myotomy. This is not going to improve with any other things. The other options in this patient can be like injection of the <coughs> uh, some paralyzing solutions or you have to do 
uh, people have used balloon, but balloon will never be effective in such. So either you do a laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. The disadvantage with that is that uh, with the laparoscopic approach, you will not be able to do a longer esophageal myotomy. In this patient, we require at least 15 to 20 centimeter of esophageal myotomy because as you saw the contractions, all of the esophagus is involved. So in such situation, you have to do per oral endoscopic myotomy, which will allow you to do very long esophageal myotomy. Or you can do thoracoscopic, uh, uh, you know, the, the longer uh, uh, approach for thoracoscopic uh, laparos uh, myotomy or thoracoscopic myotomy. But I think with the introduction of per oral endoscopic myotomy, this has become the gold standard for uh, the treatment of esophageal disorders, esophageal uh, spastic disorders. So here, I will just go through quickly the steps. The first thing which I have to do is to see where is the GE junction. So I have marked the GE junction at 35 centimeter. And then I will keep on coming out, measuring around 15 centimeters. So I will come, this is 10 centimeter and this is 15 centimeter. So this is my I'm going to do at least 15 centimeter myotomy in this patient. So I'll start from very high up. This is 20 centimeters. So G junction was at 35 centimeter and I'm starting myotomy from almost post required region, almost 20 centimeters. So uh, the second thing which I do is now I have decided I have to do uh, from here. So this you can see the uh, close needle in. So Patient is in position and this is anterior and the vertebral column, you can see the vertebra bulging on the esophagus, this is posterior. So this is 6 o'clock position, this is 12 o'clock position. So you can either do an anterior myotomy at 1 o'clock position or you can do a posterior myotomy at 5 o'clock position. So either of the approaches are equal, that depends on the operator from how he has been trained. Uh, posterior approach has advantage that you don't have, will not encounter the vital organs like pericardium uh, here, but posteriorly you will be much more comfortable. Second advantage is that the accessories are coming out at seven o'clock position and then there is no angle uh, if you are working at five o'clock position. While if you are to create an angle, once you are working at one o'clock position. So anterior may be slightly technically difficult as doing posterior. So we'll start the posterior myotomy. Vertical length is 15 centimeter proximal to LES. So first thing which we have to do is separate the mucosa from muscle. So that we will do by injecting a saline which is colored with indigo carmine and we will deposit it in submucosa. So needle out. So I'm just going to inject saline between the muscle and mucosa. You can see uh, a very nice bulge is being created. <clears throat> and that is very important. Once you separate the mucosa from the muscle, then you can selectively cut the mucosa. So I'll cut the mucosa so that I can get entry into the submucosal space. So this all is known as third space endoscopy, where we do endoscopy between the muscle and mucosa. So this is the triangle tip knife, which I am using it. And I'm just cutting this mucosa. You can see I'm using uh, <clears throat> endo cut mode and I'm creating a vertical mucosal incision which is selective for mucosa. I'm not going into such depth that I, can, I cut the muscle. So this is the blue fibers or loose areolar tissue of submucosa. You can see here, this is the loose areolar tissue of submucosa. So I'll just deepen my cut a bit so that my scope goes into this submucosal plane. So no hurry, I'll just keep on dissecting between the mucosa and the muscle. There is some submucosal fibrosis, 
but that's all okay and then you can see how easily i have gone into the sub mucosa and i'll gradually deepen this cut trying not to injure any vessel which may cause some bleeding and then we'll gradually <clears throat> deepen our incision so i'm working slightly away from the and these are the loose areolar tissue you can see here which is firmly attaching the mucosa to the muscle and there is a big vessel there i will try to avoid it <clears throat> so this is basically creating a tunnel to go into the submucosal plane and you can see here uh, the white color of the muscle and i i can see a big vessel here but gradually first thing i will do is clear off these loose areola tissue which is anchoring the mucosa to the muscle so once it is done i will push the scope down and now i have a very clear identification of muscle layer here sub mucosa here and mucosa there so i'll tackle this blood vessel first by using a technique known as quag grasper which is like a endoscopic hemostasis forcep i'll grab this big vessel and pass the coagulating current and then once it is coagulated i will cut it off so that i can move in vertically downward direction so this is the forcep it catches the vessel then i turn the soft coagulation and you can see how nicely the vessel is blenching and once the both the ends have blenched completely i cut it out and then it i have one more vessel on this side so i'll blench this also and now i have a very nice road ahead of me which is clear cut showing me the muscle layer the mucosa layer so i'll keep on injecting and widening this space which is a potential space this space is not available we have to create this space by keep on keeping on injecting the saline expanding it that is why we are creating a, another lumen and this lumen is known as third space so this is the new advent which have been almost a decade old now we are doing third space endoscopy which allows us to separate the mucosa from the muscle layer and then we can selectively treat <coughs> either the muscle disease or the mucosal disease so you must have heard about esds that is known as endoscopic mucosal dissection that also are now done by tunneling method where we separate the mucosa away from the muscle and those early cancers which are located in mucosa and upper submucosa easily removed so you can see i am just progressing here keep on progressing just above the muscle layer and i will take the guide from this circular fiber you can see this circular fiber of the muscle i will draw an imaginary line which guides me going perpendicularly downwards <clears throat> and you can see here there is a vessel so i am using the mix of either a spray coagulation or a endo cut and the challenge here is you can see how closely the mucosa inject how closely the mucosa is towards muscle in this disease because every time there is a very high spasm going on which creates a very narrow space while well, if you are doing poem for ecclesia everything is wide open that's why the doing poem in jackhammers is slightly difficult as compared to the <coughs> ecclesia and you can see this is the blue discoloration of the loose areolar tissue which is which helps me in delineating the submucosa 
if i use indigo carmine this bluish discoloration or bluish coloration of this loose areolated tissue happens and the delineation between muscle layer submucosa is very clear and in this disease we are going to cut the muscle and expose the mediastinum so our mucosa should always be intact so our whole aim is to protect the mucosa so i'm not going in this direction there is mucosa so i'll keep on going just above the muscle layer protecting the mucosa and i can see here vessel here which is <clears throat> which may bleed so i'll use a quad grasper quickly and that allows me to have a bloodless field most of the time these small bleeds are never a hemodynamic problem to us but they spoil the the separation of the layers close see that i am deliberately doing some coagulation of the muscle exposing the circular fiber and that makes the road map for me <coughs> more clear <clears throat> sometimes when the ecclesia you are treating uh, the esophagus is massively dilated and you lose path you may go laterally and that is why the road map using the exposure of the circular fiber and then following you can see how spastic it is very spastic and there is a one hole in the muscle there while coagulation that that also is not a problem because ultimately you have to get rid of the muscle because it is the spastic <clears throat> so preserve the mucosa as far as possible i mean that is the dictum if you if you don't preserve the mucosa you have created a perforation so we'll keep on going down you can see on i'll just go very laterally also unfortunately amyl nitrite is not available dr harnath is our anesthesiologist and he is taking care of the patient and i was just asking him that suppose there is a too much of spasm going on can he help uh, amyl nitrite is available or is it available in india no so we not available uh, but uh, sometimes if you have amyl nitrite you can have a relaxation of these fibers so that you can travel down very quickly so this is submucosal dissection and i have to keep on palpating the abdomen <clears throat> because sometimes this co2 which we are using can seep into the into the peritoneum and cause high intraperitoneal pressures so this is a dissection which is going on vertically downwards to our les there is a debate going on in this disorders whether to cut the les or not because if you cut the les you may cause more reflux and in this disorder les is absolutely normal so whether to cut les or not is a debate and nobody has quick clear answer but majority of the operators they do cut the les <clears throat> so dr harnath is asking me to decompress the abdomen because he is feeling that there is some uh, peritoneal air and you can see i'll go into the i'll show you i'll use this opportunity to show what we are doing we are creating a tunnel separating mucosa from muscle and we have done i have almost three fourth way through you can see the tunnel here and then we, we this is the mucosal incision and then we are going above the mucosa into the lumen of the abdomen into the stomach and i'll suck out all the air i see that stomach is too much distended so that will give relief that will release the abdomen it has relieved and then we go back to our work again thank so, you mohan i think a uh, fantastic demonstration we'll come back to another case and then come back to you don't cut the muscle because the surgeons like to see the muscle being cut sure 
and then we will come back to you. Okay. Right. Okay. So we come to the next case. I think Hardik is going to present this case. Yes, sir. The clinical history of the patient is uh, the patient is a 42 year old male who had uh, consumed Corosive eight weeks ago. Corosive agent. Presently, he presented to us with dysphagia and vomiting. The barium picture shows a stricture in the uh, mid and distal esophagus, which was confirmed endoscopically. And now the plan is endoscopic uh, dilatation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am here along with Dr. Santosh, who is Chief of Endoscopy Anesthesia, and Mr. Srinivas, who is a, a technician who is expert in this. Uh, Roy, can you hear us? We are not getting any response from there. Roy? Uh, who is moderating? Is it Roy? Okay. So, what we are going to demonstrate in this case of the corrosive stricture, again the audience is predominantly surgical audience, so we wanted to tell you some basic principles of how you deal with a patient who comes with corrosive stricture. The first important thing is if endoscopy has to be done in this patient, it has to be done within 48 hours. And then we have the Zargas classification based on that, you can say how the disease progresses. If you don't do it within 48 hours, you wait for at least two weeks before you want to do an endoscopy, preferably four weeks. So this patient eight weeks are already over. So we have to wait for at least four weeks before you do an endoscopy again to assess how much is the damage. You saw the barium x-rays. Barium sometimes doesn't give a good picture because the barium is not flowing through completely through. So what I want to do first in this patient is to actually assess how much is the damage which has been done by the corrosive. And because it's eight weeks, I know that already strictures would have formed. I want to know how much damage is esophagus. I want to know how much damage is stomach because in our patients, most of them are acid intake. We have some amount of damage uh, to the stomach also in addition. So I want to assess that to see. This patient has difficulty in swallowing, so he has probably esophageal stricture and a gastric outlet obstruction also. Now, because this procedure, I'm going to use a pediatric scope. This is a very uh, thin scope, six millimeters. Always, principal, use the thinnest scope available in patients with corrosive strictures first when you're doing assessment. So I'm going to use this thin pediatric scope of six millimeters from Olympus company. Uh, it's Olympus scope with a 2.0 channel with a guide wire can be passed inside. I'm going to use this first to assess. So let's start first. You can see that although in the very tiny score, the quality of image is quite good. I will pass it through. Uh, so I'm going to assess first the oropharynx. You can see very nicely going through the oropharynx. I'm going to assess the ocal cost to see if any damage ocal cord. Little lady matters, but I don't find any ocal cord damage. I'll go behind the ocal cord through the trichopharyngeal area. That is where most of the strictures are. Fortunately, he doesn't have here. There is some resistance which I can feel here in the mid part. This is where the stricture is. I could get through. Because the pediatric scope, I could get through. It's approximately 25 centimeters. There was a stricture there. I got through. Now, another small stricture you can see here. This is at about 30 centimeters, what you saw in the barium. So two strictures, 25, 30, and then you can see a nice scarring there. But this is not bad, and I go to the stomach. Uh, when I go to the stomach, I can see a lot of fluid there, which means there is probably gastric outlet obstruction. You can see scarring of the pylorus, and you can see very nicely as I go off, the whole antrum area is showing an scar with, with a lot of scarring. What happens in this patient is usually the pylorus is pulled up. You can see the pylorus in the distance there pulled up. So I'm just trying to see if we can negotiate through the pylorus. It's not so easy. It's difficult. I'm not able to go through. So what I'll do now is first I'll hide through and dilate uh, this uh, esophageal structures. For esophageal structure dilatation, I'm going to use a type of dilators called the SG dilators. So the guide wire inside, I leave the guide wire in place. Now, after now, there is no need for fluoroscopy, but now I just use the fluoroscopy to see that the guide wire is in place. So once the guide wire is in place, the stomach you can see is quite distended because the air is trapped between the, the esophageal structure and the gastric structure. I'm using, a, and we can use any type of guide wire which we want to use at ERCP, and this is a, either a busy guide guide wire or the beam wire you can use. Now once the guide wire is in place, now I'm going to use SG dilators. I'm going to use first uh, seven, 
7 millimeter diameter because 6 millimeter score went in. I'm going to use 7 millimeter, 9 millimeter, and 11 millimeter. That will allow my scope to go through. Again, I have to be very careful not to be wasting. You now, these SG dilators are not very commonly used, but surgeons again are familiar. These are, these are polythene material. I'm going to use my left hand to push the dilator, the right hand to hold the guide wire. I'm pushing it through now and watching fluoroscopically as it's going through. It's gone through easily. Now, we'll, you, which is 7 millimeter. Now, I'll go to 9 millimeter and then 11. So, this has gone through without much resistance. You can see I'm not pushing too much into the stomach because the stomach uh, structure has to be dilated with a CRE balloon. We'll go to that next. Uh, it's not even you can dilate this way, but stomach you can't dilate with these dilators as they tend to buckle. They don't have enough strength to go across the gastric structure. So now I'm using 9 here. And you can see when I get to the structure, sometimes I use a twisting movement like this just to massage it through the structure. It's gone in again easily. Then I'll go to 11. Why? Can you still hear us? We are not getting any response from the other side, so wondering whether we are on the line or not. Now you can see that I am using 11 dilator. I scope changes. 11 dilator and if it is very smooth, I might even go to 12.8 also. 11 also is going very smooth, so maybe I'll use a 12.8 and then also then we'll go with a regular adult scope through which we'll pass a 2.8 ch channel, a CRE balloon to dilate the gastric structure. Okay, so now I've done, uh, gone, gone to 12.8. There's no 13 millimeter diameter because of sentimental reasons, it's all to 12.8. Uh, hopefully, that should not profit it. And then after this goes in, we know that the adult scope is going to go very easily. The adult scope is only 9. A little resistance, but it's going in now. It's going in, going in, yeah, it's going in. So what I'm going to do is I'm leaving the guide wire in place because if sometimes the big tear is there, we may not find the lumen very easily. So the guide wire will help us. I'm going to pass the adult scope beside the guide wire. So I switch to the adult Olympus scope which has a 2.8 millimeter channel. Huh? 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 Adult uh, channel, adult scope, uh, which has got uh, a, uh, two point eight channel. It's if you have a therapeutic scope of three point seven channel, it is sometimes better because the CRE balloon goes through, but doesn't matter. So I'm using the Olympus uh, 170 scope, two point eight channel. It's got also narrowband imaging in this. Then you can see that I'll try and pass this through. There is a little structure. You can see the structure is dilated. That's why you see the bleed. But I'm following the guide wire, so that helps me. So again, a small amount of necrotic tissue. So next step for me is to try and see if I can dilate this hyaluronic structure. Because right now it's very tight. Even the baby scope couldn't pass through. So I'll remove this guide wire and aim myself at the pyloric area. It's very raw. There is a lot of uh, scar type of tissue there. So what I'm going to do is first use a ball tip catheter to pass a uh, guide wire across. See there, this is a ball tip catheter. And I'm very carefully trying to, because it's very, very uh, friable tissue, you have to be careful that you don't injure the tissue. And now the catheter is just passed through the area. And we'll see you know, with the guidance. Can you show the guide? fluoroscopy? We'll see the fluoroscopy to see where the wire has gone through. Yeah. The wire is now... The wire has gone through. You can see very nicely on fluoroscopy. The wire has gone through very deeply. So we place it here, very deep inside, in the fourth part of the duodenum. Fourth, uh, third, fourth part of the duodenum. My catheter is deep inside. Ah. And then I'm going to keep the wire in place in the third, fourth part of the dead now. So we went in with a thermo wire initially. I'm now going to shift to a contrast, little contrast will put, so that we will see that we are really in the third part. We are not perforated through into the peritoneal cavity. And you can see it very nicely we are in the third part of the duodenum. I'm now going to put a regular guide wire, O35 guide wire, just a stiff guide wire. It's called the FX guide wire that we're using. This is good for 
dilating or using it under a balloon so that it's very stiff. And you can see now that as the guide wire goes through, I will now pull my catheter back. I'll pull my catheter back. Right. Yeah. The guide wire is in place, the catheter comes out. Now I'll follow this with a CRE balloon. Now we can use, uh, in this case, better to dilate only up to 10 initially. Second setting, we can go up to 14, then 15. Usually 15 is sufficient in most cases. Uh, so I'll now use a CRE balloon and dilate up to 10 millimeters. It is very friable, that's the reason why I'm very careful. Another important thing you notice is that the esophageal lesions heal faster than the gastric lesions. Gastric lesions take some more time. But then the gastric stricture which is formed is more fibrotic than esophageal stricture, so sometimes it's very difficult. The alternative in this patient, of course, is surgery, but surgery will be a major surgery in form of a, a colon bypass, which uh, is, I think, uh, not, not only not an easy surgery, the quality of life is not so very good. So that's why we try and see if we can uh, use this technique to give a patient good quality life and hopefully if you're able to achieve full dilatation both esophageal and gastric you can see that uh, I'm passing my balloon on the guide wire and as the balloon comes out you can see the balloon going in now the balloon is coming out I'll go to the edge of the balloon before I actually do a, a dilatation yeah now you can see the balloon completely will dilate up to 10 huh. awesome. now contrast is contrast will put little contrast We'll put a contrast in the balloon. This is a wasting that comes. Huh? Okay. This is. So we'll put contrast. This is um, using a water dilator. No, no, going in. Come back, come back. So decrease. So you see the balloon is going in. So I'm just come, trying to come back here. Yeah. Now we are back again. The balloon tends to go in or come out. You have to balance it carefully. Now I'm holding again the balloon now. Yeah, good, good. Now you can see the dilatation now. The waste is completely gone. 10 in the, yeah, so waste is completely gone. I'm pulling back on the balloon towards the endoscope and then uh, we'll see the opening that was created. So we want to be very careful. Huh? Available. Philip, can you hear me? Yes, Naki, hello. You're very silent. Why is what happened? Yeah, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, but you're very silent. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, uh, I am now an interim chair of the session. Just, uh, <laughs> I was not supposed to be the chair of this session, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I can see uh, this is a very challenging. Uh, so do you have any tips and tricks in the identifying the, uh, the track for the dilatation? Yeah, so, so yeah. that's a good point. Uh, the track is very important. So what we do, we have used a special uh, catheter, ball tip catheter. It's very soft, and then they have put it on a guide wire. So the guide wire goes to the track, and with no doubt, we get some contrast. I mean, deflate, and then they diff. And the mind constantly we get uh, and now inflate. And you see the oh, now stricture through through the stricture, we can see the balloon inflate. Wow, yeah, we can see it's uh, opening up quite well. Very well, yeah. It's opening up nicely. And so now we are sure you're in the right uh, track. Yeah, so now I think this is uh, dilated up to 10. We can go a little more, a few millimeters more. Yeah, okay. So and now, uh, Nagi, yeah. I, I wish to ask you, so what would be, uh, you know, this is the obviously challenging. At the very beginning, do you want to dilate, uh, you know, fully or you, you, you would like to do it like a sequentially? Yeah, that's a very good question. I like to do it sequentially. Now we'll deflate. We are, I, I'm doing up to 11 now, so I'll see if the score pass through, and then I'll call him back again after two weeks, and then go up to 14, and then 15 finally. Uh, so I will better do it sequentially. So we are now dilated it up to 11, and uh, my score will go through because it's dilated that way. But there is some, uh, the whole stomach is completely, you know, rotated because of this. And you can see very nicely the opening has already become quite big. We'll watch the patient uh, symptomatically. We'll remove the balloon now, as you can see, and now you can see the opening more more clearly. You can see it's, it's, it's quite big now, Philip. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, do you, uh, Nagi, do you see any role of uh, placing a stent, or no. you are like, well, rather like to do a serial dilatation? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have 
uh, use stents in some cases because you have a large experience with these curvy strictures. The problem with the stents is migration rate in the pylorus is very high because yes. those cover stents you can't use uncovered stents, and because migration rates are so high, we tend to do it uh, without any stenting. But uh, we have some experience now with biodegradable stents. Uh, sometimes we do a lot of hyperplasia, but if you have to put a stent, I would strongly recommend a biodegradable stent. But there are not many studies using this yet, and I think this may be one of the options. So, Philip, we finish this procedure. Thank you for being there with us. We now move on to Mohan, who is going to do, he is doing the jackhammer. He has already done the poem tunneling, and he is going to cut the muzzle. We asked him to wait before he cuts the muzzle. So, we will go to Mohan's room then. Thank you, Naki. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mohan. Hello. Good, good. <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you too. I mean, I can't see you, but at least I can listen to you. And uh, Philip, uh, we started yeah. with this patient who is a case of jackhammer esophagus, and you can see how nicely the alias is opened up. So that is different from what we do in ecclesia. And uh, uh, this was at around 35 centimeter. And then we started doing tunneling way up uh, into the esophagus. It is around, say, uh, 15 centimeter that the mucosal incision which we made. And then we completed the tunnel right across the G junction. You can see this is the tunnel which we have made. And this is very long G junction. This is the G junction. And then we come into the posterior part of the stomach. So, that, so the question was whether we need to do a LES myotomy in patients who are having jackhammer's esophagus or just a long esophageal myotomy is enough. Uh, at our center, we uh, do a LES myotomy but not long into the stomach, just maybe one centimeter beyond it. Uh, what is your uh, take on this, Philip? Yeah, I think uh, in general, we may not need to you know, take a, uh, the LES or actually we can just uh, take a short uh, length because uh, most of the time the spastic contractility is over the soft gel body, not the LES. Yes. Yeah. I agree. I fully agree with you. Yes. So, 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 uh, so this is uh, since uh, all the uh, uh, beginner also seeing, so uh, whole aim of this tunneling is to separate mucosa from muscle and then we'll selectively cut the muscle, keeping the mucosa, which is at 12 o'clock, intact. And you can see clear differentiation between the muscle, which is at 6 o'clock, or uh, spanning from, say, 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and the mucosa is from above, from 3 o'clock again to 9 o'clock. And whole of the submucosa is gone now. So, so this is the flap wall technique where this is the uh, lower end of the mucosa, so we'll just get into this and do not cut the muscle uh, right behind the mucosal incision. We get, give a gap of say 1.5 centimeter uh, before we start cutting the muscle. And here I will start cutting the muscle. This is the six o'clock position. And then we'll give a small nick first and I just elevate whatever the muscle which have come and then try to probe the, my depth. And I can see there is a clear uh, differentiation between the longitudinal and circular fibers. And then I keep on cutting towards the uh, LES. And you can see now I have exposed the uh, linear fiber, the longitudinal fiber, and I'm selectively cutting the circular fiber. So, uh, uh, Mohan, so I think you must have mentioned that uh, if a surgeon wanted to do this procedure, it has to be a thoracoscopic uh, long martomy. So, probably the morbidity is uh, much higher because we need to collapse uh, the right lung before we can approach uh, this uh, yeah. to perform the long martomy. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, that's why the poem uh, in various trials also, I mean, there's no... A prospective randomized trial, but we have a lot of data in a retrospective series is available showing that OEM has got distinct advantage over laparoscopic procedures because of the mere fact that we can do a longer esophageal myotomy uh, and also uh, uh, the <clears throat> you can have a choice of anterior versus posterior because sometimes you may have fibrosis 
on anterior plane if somebody has under, already undergone some procedures and you can have uh, less fibrosis in opposite direction. So this gives a lot of flexibility as far as myotomy is concerned if you do per orally and uh, uh, because of the less morbidity as you told as compared to thoracoscopic technique, uh, this becomes the treatment of choice. Uh, for esophageal spastic disorder. And you can see, though I am trying to preserve these longitudinal fibers, they are ultimately getting separated. So, uh, for me, uh, longitudinal fibers are just indicator of the depth, that I am in proper depth. Otherwise, preserving them or not preserving them ultimately does not make any change in the ultimate outcome of the patients. So gradually we are cutting downwards and you can see I am exposing the longitudinal fibers. So Mo Mohan, may I ask, uh, is there any role of uh, uh, having an intraoperative uh, assessment to confirm a completeness of the myotomy, for example, like doing an endoflip? Yeah, endoflip has been shown good in LES assessment. But I don't know whether it will help in assessing the, uh, uh, the spastic disorder like this because this is a long segment involved. Uh, uh, I don't have any uh, you know, experience with endoflip and uh, we do not uh, usually, and if you're doing some trial, okay, but for, uh, as far as clinical, day-to-day uh, -day clinical practice is concerned, I think endoflip uh, has got uh, not much role. And I don't uh, change my, uh, you know, the, the procedure based on endoflip finding because here we are con completely <laughs> disrupting the continuity of circular fibers. And uh, once you completely disrupt it, I think uh, there is no way you, you will have a residual spastic <laughs> segment over there. I, I, I will definitely I, I like to listen from you. How do you use endoflip in your own clinical practice? Well, uh, <clears throat> actually, Mohan, I, I use uh, only as a research tool, as you mentioned. So just to see whether this is a, a complete uh, multimedia, especially for achalasia. But I guess for your case, it's uh, probably difficult because uh, endoflip yeah. As the elasticity, but uh, in a long length for myotomy, it's probably very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, also agree with you. So, uh, like a surgical procedure, most important for the uh, poem is uh, probably the anatomical identification of the landmarks. Yes. So now we learn more from what we have done than uh, the anatomical landmark of uh, how we define complete uh, myotomy and also to avoid. Uh, uh, cutting into the uh, sling fiber to uh, reduce the risk of uh, gastroesophageal reflux is uh, important. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so a very nice procedure. <laughs> uh, thank you. So, uh, so uh, as you see, the mucosa is falling on my field of cutting. I'm using a more precise cut like endo cut so that I don't uh, damage this mucosa. This is very important. This cover is very important because you can see we have exposed the mediastinum here and this mucosal cover is important. So don't cut uh, more aggressively so that you, you, you should not create uh, holes in this mucosa. So Philip, uh, what is your technique? You have changed from spray to, because Mohan now does spray plus endocart, like what Inouye also does. Do you change yes. the technique or are you spray? So I, I uh, usually use a spray coagulation during the myotomy. I selectively do just inner circular, but uh, fully agree with uh, Mohan and Nagi. So when we are cutting on the muscle fiber, we need to be really controlled not to damage the mucosa. So not past pointing. So there are also other techniques, for example, like uh, cutting, uh, lifting the mu muscle fiber like what Mohan is doing. The other is actually to hook up the muscle and cut on the other direction. So from uh, the uh, uh, cordially uh, cutting to the cranially, there are also some people who practicing that as well. So I think this brings to the end of my myotomy and we can just see how you can see the, by the end is very thick. Yeah, very thick. And also the spastic 
segment is are so so tight that uh, um, uh, the cap keep on dislodging once you are doing the tunneling and uh, you can see the tape tape almost coming out once i am withdrawing the the yeah the scope uh, yes yes so that has completely the this is the my mucosal incision i will just quickly change this tape uh, and then we can quickly uh, now the type of cap they are using there lot of uh, i think uh, many of us use a tapered cap yes. i don't know what the um, philip is using but you are using a different type of cap yeah the, uh, not, the, not the sd tapered cap i think uh, sd cap the the uh, the uh, fujinon cap which yeah. is the tapered cap has distinct advantage once you are doing uh, ecclesia cardia especially tight les where you need a uh, more you know that helps in negotiating the tight spaces but uh, because of uh, the ease and also second thing is you cannot apply the clips yeah. so you have to change the uh, uh, tapered cap to the cylindrical cap so you may have to use two caps so in olympus cap so olympus cap and once you don't i think 10 to 15 cases then i don't think uh, st hood has uh, any distinct advantages on over the cylindrical so cap so what do you what do you use what is your choice just a short uh, cap 4 mm uh, olympus cap so yeah. i also agree uh, so the uh, st hood may be advantageous at very beginning at the learning phase otherwise yeah. uh, no advantage so okay. and also we encounter same uh, problem when the muscle is so spastic sometimes after you pass the uh, spastic area the yeah. cap cross uh, you know uh, cross by the uh, muscle fiber and uh, it become dislodged Yeah. Okay. So, so here uh, the most important thing is to assess the integrity of mucosa, and you can see we are seeing the tunnel discoloration there, and there is no breach of mucosal integrity at all, and completely there is a very long esophageal myotomy. So this is our mucosal incision. I'll just go quickly and check for hemostasis if there is any bleeding occurring, and this is the myotomy. You can see yeah, very nice. complete, uh, and you can see the posterior mediastinum there. and then this is the whole uh, yeah. esophageal myotomy and this is the just in proximal stomach so so that brings to the uh, i mean we have to just close now the mucosal incision so can you show the clipping yeah. amount to you because yeah. many surgeons have not so, done this procedure and this is very important you can see there is a segment where uh, i usually divide this into zones This is the zone where muscle is deficient but mucosa is intact. Okay. Then second zone is when the muscle and mucosa both are intact and the last zone is when the mucosa is deficient but muscle behind is intact. Yeah. So this max is a, a Z type or zigzag fashion which act as a flap wall technique and that prevents the leakage. So now whole aim is to just approximate the mucosal edges. No need to do a air tight closure. because by the end of 24 hours everything sticks together because the way the technique has been evolved like doing a zigzag mesh so what clips are you using and tell us the technique man so the the clips i'm using is the olympus clips and the first thing which i use is, is the cap i press cap down and expose the cut end no. and then uh, just bring this clip just distal to this cut end and suction okay. and then apply this yes yeah. So this yeah. creates a tenting of the mucosa, and then so you start from uh, proximal, from uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And distal then, to the proximal, yeah. And then, Amon, superb job! I think you probably have one of the largest experiences of poem in the world now. Yeah, two questions for you, Amon. Yeah, Are there any patients where you wouldn't do a poem? And number two is, would you add an anti-reflux procedure to uh, in AIG as? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so regarding your second question, first, uh, the the reflux in poem has been totally exaggerated, and uh, now the recent papers are coming up, which are which are severely criticizing that patient who have heartburn post poem and who have acidic pH on manometry, all are not uh, reflux. There is fermentation. There is poor clearance. So. there is need to assess true reflux after poem and i think the true reflux is around 10 to 15% not more than that uh, that is why these patient do not require 
anti reflux procedure in all patient and there is a theoretical background to this also if you do a laparoscopic procedure you do lot of dissection to reach esophagus and during that process we have to dissect many esophageal attachment to the diaphragm and that causes they are also very important anti reflux mechanism so they all are intact in poem so you are attacking directly at the disease that is the les and that is why i think the reflux should not be 50 to 60% has been reported in many studies so we have to critically analyze it and in fact we are doing a prospective trial already on this uh regarding your first question <clears throat> so uh, so the uh, answer to your question is that all patient will not require anti reflux but yes there are definite subset of patient who develop reflux they can majority of them can be managed with ppi but those who are having uh, uh too much of reflux or you have documented that they are too true reflux by doing impedance um, manometry then yes they may require additional anti reflux procedure so you can either do a anterior uh, endoscopic fundoplication the it is really in infancy and we have to do a lot of research on uh, to develop what are the best method to have a robust uh, fundoplication uh, so uh, still i will not recommend endoscopic but yes we have some device assisted procedures like gardex can be done or we can refer this to a laparoscopic surgeon to do uh, a laparoscopic fundoplication so these are the methods by which we manage post om reflux i think mohan agree with you there the problem with uh, for pomf i think uh, again mohan has huge experience with this pomf is that we can't predict which patient is likely to develop a reflux right so what we tend to do is we can wait if they develop a problem we can uh, do a gardex procedure which is more elegant which in our experience has shown better results so that's much easier So two special situations, Nagi. One is patients who have a sigmoid esophagus, yes, and second yes. is those who have a epiphrenic diverticulum. Yeah. Ah, uh, so yes. So sigmoid esophagus. Uh, I think sigmoid esophagus now again. So so-called double S uh, configuration. My experience now we have is that doing shorter myotomy, and this is a study we published comparing short versus long myotomy, randomized trial, and shorter myotomy is as good enough. So very sigmoid esophagus is better to do a shorter myotomy. And this is something the diverticulum to take the other side of the wall, but even then you can actually go through the same thing and cut the muscle in the diverticulum area, and you can open up the whole area completely. So again, significant experience with that. I think uh, very nicely, Mohan has finished this procedure. Uh, the patient, uh, we can see the anesthetist is checking the abdomen to see if there is any distension. Uh, sometimes, occasionally, we put in the needle to let out the air, yeah. and I think. Uh, Hey, Mohan, thank you very much thank for the fantastic you. procedure. Fabulous, fabulous procedure, Mohan. Great job. Really impressive. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll shift to the other room. Uh, Roy and Philip, we have uh, Dr. Sandeep ready with a case. This is a patient with a gastric oral obstruction, and he's trying to show an alternative to uh, GJ. What can be done in this patient? Sandeep. Hello. Hmm. Uh, the clinical history of syringe. 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 This patient is a known case of renal cell carcinoma. Uh, status post left nephrectomy three years ago, with bone metastasis. Uh, he has underwent radiotherapy and spine fixation six months uh, ago. Now he is presented with history of vomiting that is postprandial 30 minutes after food intake with intermittent abdominal pain and loss of appetite with significant loss of weight. In the CT, we can see there is a circumferential irregular thickening involving the second and third part of duodenum, uh, causing gastric outlet obstruction. The plan is enteral stem placement uh, by Dr. Sandeep Lakhtakia. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Hardik. Good afternoon, Roy, and good afternoon, Philip. So, as you heard, the history: this patient has gastric outlet obstruction because of a duodenal uh, narrowing. It's a malignant structure in the duodenum, and that has occurred because of past renal cell carcinoma. The past of a jumbo forwarding scope. This has 3.7 channel diameter of the accessory. And a, a, a diameter of 11.5. Clean the stomach to save time. And as you can see, the pylorus. I cross that. The first part of duodenum looks fine. I enter the second part, and you can see this narrowed segment. I'm using a ball tip cannula to negotiate this structure with a thermo wire. 
A patient is in supine position. You have the fluoroscopy view. Okay. Good. Nicely seen, Sandeep. Good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure listening to you. Let's come very close to the narrowing part. And just the tip of my ball tip will be out. And Shrinivas is gently passing the. This is the most crucial step, actually. Unless the wire is in the distal duodenum, beyond the stricture, can turn to side, brother. I just turn the patient to the left side. Sometimes that gives the little advantage, uh, the angulation point of view. Yeah, it's a very friable and a vascular tumor. Most renal cell carcinoma are like that. No, no, no. No, no. Let it go. Can I take an angle to it? Okay. No, no. No, it's different. Close, close, Okay. So I'll just give a little more try. Uh, it's a little bit of hit and trial, and we can't see the lumen, so they have to probe the narrowed segment. Right, rather left. Hit with angle tip, sir. Hi, Sandeep. It's yes. Philip. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, Philip. Hi. Um, so uh, the, the scope you are using is a double channel endoscope? It's a single channel therapeutic. Single channel. I see. I see. Uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult to cannulate, uh, you know, uh, and find the dying the lumen because uh, sometimes tumor has uh, difficult, uh, you know, and the uh, tortuosity inside the lumen and uh, it seems to be really tight. Uh, so, uh, any tricks on the, you know, like uh, using the different type of guy wire to try to prop it? I'm using a hydrophilic wire. Okay, okay. I'm using a perimo, uh, which generally ah. is most uh, tight structures, and using an angled wire so that uh, it can negotiate the. I'll come very close, very close. Sometimes we can. Yeah. Screen? So. Those are important tips and tricks of selecting the guy wire, especially for a difficult uh, stricture, uh, how to pass. So um, uh, use a hydrophilic uh, wire and, uh, and actually having some uh, curve so that uh, you can able to uh, negotiate through. Screen, screen. No. Yes, I think I'm. I'm now. Yes, looks to be better part of the structure. You can push. You are. You are. Yeah, going beyond a little bit more. <laughs> I'll put some contrast and see where it goes. So that give us a good idea. So that's another strategy. So if we are not too sure, we can actually see a flow of the contrast if we are inside. Yes, it's not going beyond. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it's a really tight stricture. <laughs> That's true. I'm going to come back and then maybe station myself just inside the stricture. There should be no hurry in this part. Otherwise, if you make a false passage and you place a stent, 
we actually cause more problem. Yeah, fully agree with you. So uh, we need the patience and uh, try our best uh, to uh, find a way. So a false track is uh, really the most, uh, you know, nightmare sort of condition that we will see. And if we put a stand over a, 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 a false track, it's a kind of uh, difficult to manage. Okay, right. Sometimes cap helps there to efface the folds. No, 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 it's okay. I think I got that. Oh, can you make him super now? I think that's, I think I am, I am inside. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's okay. So because of the left lateral position, the anatomy was not very perfect. Now you can see in fluoroscopy. Yes. yes. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> yes, a ball tip catheter with the guy wire passing through, right? That's right. So we we'll now the uh, perimo wire with the. I should be okay. Hmm. So just put some contrast. Yes, to define the. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> and using now a stiffer uh, guide wire, exchange the previous uh, hydrophilic perimo wire with the FX wire, which is very stiff. And that allows. So Mm, so your it. strategy of uh, putting the stiff wire is actually to allow a better passage of the stent. Is that your strategy? That's right. I see. Important tricks, uh, tips and tricks, especially when we are it's passing important. the stents through a very tight uh, structured tuber. Uh, it's better to have a stiff guy wire. I will also use a double lumen canal after this over the wire so that I can define the length of the stricture because you could not see the distal length that is important for my final stent position although I know that the, till the third part of the diodonum the stricture is not there it is, you see this patient has two vertebral uh, screws they are also acting like my landmark in this patient that is for the spinal fusion right? yeah spinal fixation for his uh, tumor metastasis yeah yeah so this is a double lumen cannula. One lumen accommodates the wire and the other lumen will provide the contrast to go in, which will tighten please, which will help me define the length of the stricture. Although apparently it looks to be short, but I want to be more confident of uh, that that will help me select my stent size. You agree with that? Yeah. Yes, I think uh, very important. So uh, because uh, we don't know the distal end of the stricture, so if yeah. we are going to place a good stent, uh, of course, if we fail uh, to uh, uh, cover the whole tumor, we may be able to put in another stent, but that complicated the process. So the best is uh, to do just uh, one time of uh, insertion of a stent and then be able to identify both the proximal and the distal part. Because we cannot pass uh, the scope through, the only way that we know about the distal part is to inject some contrast and uh, to locate it. If we can pass through the scope, sometimes we just uh, inject uh, lapido to label the distal end. But uh, for this, definitely we cannot pass the scope beyond. So it doesn't look like a very long structure. It's a short yes. structure. It's at the second and third part of the other, at the junction of that. So open the 14 centimeter. I will use a longer stent, a 14 centimeter long stent because these stents will shorten the passage of time. It's an uncovered stent and they, just, they shorten by at least one third that length. So it may look very yes. long at the time of placement, but if you see them a week later, they would uh, be much, much shorter. One step. Yes. So I'm using a tie wound, 14 centimeter uncovered. So this is the stent that I'm using. 
Yes, <coughs> we can see that. So, uh, <coughs> so uh, uh, what what is the uh, you know the comparison between the use of the uncover versus a cover stand? Yeah, that's a very important question. So we use uh, uh, preferably uncovered so that the it doesn't migrate. The drawback of the covered scent is that they migrate quite often, and that's a, that's a major issue. And then you cannot retrieve them. They can cause more problem to the patient who is already suffering with malignancy. So uh, an uncovered scent or a partially covered scent are sometimes better. Yeah, I, I have the same uh, <clears throat> thinking as you, Sandeep. So I like to use uncover because uh, the problem caused by the cover stem my distal migration is uh, difficult because uh, that would require surgical retrieval and uh, for a, uh, advanced malignancy or metastatic disease, we don't want a surgical intervention. So now I have passed this uh, stent, which is uh, a distal part of the stent is in the fourth part of duodenum. There is a central mark on the second part. Yeah, that's the arrow on it. And rest of the stent is inside my scope. So I will start deploying now keeping the central mark of the stent overlapping the stricture center part. Okay. Yes, please. Okay, okay. I'll pull back, pull back. So I my, I'm looking mainly at my central mark, which is overlapping the center of the stricture. Okay. And I can only pull back. So that's why, yes, I'm gently keeping it tight. Is releasing the stent. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, just let me get you a better frame. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, in this process, uh, experience is very important yes. uh, because uh, in the uh, deployment of the stand, no. uh, the positioning is uh, sometimes difficult to uh, assess or to predict uh, because um, the stand can actually be uh, uh, quite uh, <clears throat> shrunken a bit when we are put, putting in the stand. So. Uh, a lot of time we require good experience and prediction. So you see, it looks to be a, a fairly long structure actually, which was not very yes. obvious at the time of placement. But uh, the proximal end is just across the pylorus, but I presume this will, with passage of time, this may go inside the first part as the stent opens up. So this patient yeah. will liquid diet for the next few days. No residue is important. And as you can see on the fluoroscopy, it's a fairly long structure. Yes. Well, it's really long, but the two uh, French, the proximal distal French are opening very well. Yeah, satisfactory. So uh, when will you start a uh, diet for this patient? I would start him on uh, liquid diet by today evening, about six hours later after the procedure. And uh, we'll do a repeat screening 24 hours later for to see how the stent is opening up. And uh, maybe he'll get discharged by tomorrow uh, on a low residue diet. We'll call him a week later and uh, get another X-ray to see that's totally expanded. And then uh, he'll be on a low residue diet. We have to avoid fibers because sometimes they can entangle in the fiber mesh inside the stent and that can uh, cause a blockage at times. I think with that, we move to the next room. Uh, where Excellent. Uh, Thank Dr. you, Sadir. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so the next case uh, is a, uh, the clinical history is that the patient is a case of diaphragmatic hernia, uh, status post uh, laparoscopic mesh repair done in April 2019. Now he is presented with history of vomiting, which is intermittent since last six months. Uh, in endoscopy, we can see an eroded mesh at G. So the plan is to do an endoscopic APC and mesh regrival, which will be done by Dr. G. V. Rao. So you are live. Hi, Philip. Hi, Hi. G. V. Hello. Yeah. Actually, this is one of the complications of laparoscopic surgery. Actually, we all keep doing on the other side. We think everything goes on well. This is one patient who underwent a laparoscopic diaphragmatic hernia repair using a dual mesh. And then now he's come back with recurrent upper abdominal pain. And sometimes, sometimes melina is got on and off melina. Now you can see that upper view endoscopy. Now there is a mesh that is eroded here at the J junction here. Uh, yes, yes. Now I'll show you one of the. You can, you can even see the packer. One of the packers here actually. You can see the packer there actually. Can you see the packer there? 
Uh, oh, yes, I can see. It's a curl up tacker. That, that's like a coil, like the endoscopic coil. Yes. The packet, yes. the endoscopic tacker actually. And you can see this is the part where it is eroded through. So, and it is causing some amount of ulceration here, uh, but he doesn't have any intra-abdominal collections, anything of that sort right now. So, uh, I thought personally, suppose if you excite this part of the mesh which is protruding into the lumen, it is likely that the thing will epithelize and close because it doesn't have any uh, collections, sub-diaphragmatic collections on the other side. Uh, as in today, we don't have any robust instruments to take a scissors or something of that sort to make a cut on this side. Uh, the best tech, uh, technology that we have as in today on the endoscopic side would be to use this APC to see if we can cut through this uh, mesh. Uh, what do you think, Philip? Yeah, so we, uh, I, I have uh, one or two case experience in the, having a mesh. Uh, that is uh, it's actually very difficult to pull in. Uh, and, uh, but then, uh, as you mentioned, uh, most of the time, this kind of mesh has been le uh, long term and well formed. So basically, there will be no uh, perforation or leak outside uh, the lumen. It's been fibrotic. And uh, so it's only the thing that this uh, foreign body invaded inside the lumen. So if you can take this mesh out and remove this as a foreign body, the track will heal and the patient will improve. So I think uh, strategically we should uh, perform the endoscopic treatment, but it's always difficult to pull out this mesh because of this uh, fixation by uh, the tacker and also the uh, kind of um, foreign body material, difficult to grasp and no, no way to cut. So uh, I, I haven't been using the uh, APC uh, previously for the mesh. So uh, do you have experience of using this argon plasma coagulation to cut the mesh? Yeah. Uh, we have some experience using the sargon plasma because it's a fairly large size defect to which the mesh is coming out. And I think because the smoke is one of the issues regarding during this procedure, you have to repeatedly going to suck out the smoke on this other side. Actually, Santosh is here. I don't really have to bother about uh, the patient here. But uh, it is, uh, it's cutting through the thing, actually. Yeah, good. I think it may take maybe one or two okay. sessions. The, thing, but I think okay. the, the only thing that I, I have uh, tried is uh, to use the APC to cut the stent, and that works well, but uh, I haven't ever cut the mesh. Yeah, this is actually, uh, mesh is more easy to cut than metal stent actually. So uh, this is a kind of, uh, what kind of material is this uh, mesh? This is a dual oh, mesh, yeah, it's a dual mesh basically. Oh, do mesh, do mesh, yes. Plastic mesh actually, so it should be able to... So, but uh, I think uh, firstly is that uh, this uh, mesh, if we do not remove it, the patient will keep on having pain. And uh, maybe also the... Uh, problem with the detector uh, because it's a spiral with a sharp end so without removing it there might be a chance of uh, perforating the GI tract so I think uh, we have to uh, remove this uh, foreign body. So uh, actually uh, endoscopically we have uh, some good scissors but I don't know if uh, it can actually cut uh, through uh, the mesh but uh, we have been uh, trying to, those are uh, uh, disposable uh, sharp scissors endoscopically uh, that uh, can cut the uh, suture and uh, sometimes uh, I don't know whether you can cut the mesh or not. But that, uh, that scissors is not robust enough to cut the mesh actually. And it's yeah, like, yeah. If it's a suture or something of that sort, we can easily cut through the thing actually. Yes. So uh, while uh, I think uh, uh, some of the audience, uh, most of the audience probably surgeon. So uh, with this kind of complication in mind, do you think, uh, GV, that in the future for repair of a large diaphragmatic hernia, we should still use the mesh or not? You can see that it is literally cutting, cutting through the mesh actually. Yeah. So how about the future? Do you? 
do, do you still use a mesh to repair a diaphragm, diaphragmatic hernia? There is, uh, the, I mean, that part is actually, there is no, uh, this thing actually, ambiguity of using a mesh during diaphragmatic hernia repair. The only thing is the positioning of the mesh actually, this patient obviously had some infection in the post-operative period. Ah, okay, okay. okay. Wrote the thing actually. Okay. You can see this part of the mesh is cut through now. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. That part of the mesh is cut through now. Yes, very nice. So, uh, GV may I ask, uh, is this procedure being performed under general anesthesia or IV, uh, deep sedation? Actually, I, uh, I had the comfort of having Dr. Santoshia in just managing it with IV profile sedation, actually. Yeah. So, I think it all depends on uh, the anesthetic comfort that you have. I have with me Dr. Santoshia, I really don't have to bother. The only thing is I'm going is repeatedly I'm going to suck in the into the stomachs to support the gas, this uh, obviously distends the stomach and also limits the visibility of the mesh actually, okay. Yeah, I think almost about, yeah. Well, very nice, you have uh, cut, <laughs> you have uh, good progress. <laughs> I think nice, I think it's So uh, one one of the front body that uh, we may encounter is a mesh uh, that uh, after repair of a diaphragmatic hernia uh, become invaded in at the uh, G junction uh, below G junction at the gastric cardia. The other that uh, may happen will be a laparoscopic band after uh, implantation of the laparoscopic band. Uh, sometimes uh, as a front body it invade into the uh, gastric cardia. Uh, so that also, uh, we have uh, some experience encountering that uh, for endoscopic removal. I think most of the things seems to have been cut through actually. Yes. <clears throat> yes. We can see it's uh, quite uh, loose and a little, uh, uh, yep. much more than before.
can keep doing this if you want to go to the other theater and come back actually we can go that actually nagi actually i think maybe nagi is ready for other case actually you can go to the other theater and come back i think by the time i think we'll be starting yeah. to can we move yes thank you <clears throat> so the next case is uh, uh elderly male who has presented to us with uh, blood in stool since last three months with significant loss of weight uh, he also has intermittent episodes of pain abdomen It is a past history of rectal polypectomy in 2017 when the biopsy was showing tubular villus adenoma with low grade dysplasia. Uh, presently, the colonoscopy picture is showing a small uh, recurrence of the polyp in the rectum. So, our plan will be uh, surveillance of the polyp using endobrain technique uh, by Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, I am here with uh, Mohan and uh, Srinivas again. So this is very interesting. We just want to show a new technology. Just five minutes to show a new technology. So this patient had uh, resection and then there's a recurrence of a polyp. So we want to see what type of polyp, hyperplastic or neoplastic, or is it a carcinoma with infiltration? Uh, of course, with those who are very experienced, like Philip by naked eye, they can tell us what exactly it is. But for some of us who are starting, it may be important to look at exactly what you are uh, uh, seeing to find out what it is. Now what I'm doing is, if you can get the colonoscopy picture now onto your screen, we have done the colonoscopy. There is one polyp here down, rectus rectum, and this polyp uh, to me, white light endoscopy. Uh, Philip, can you guess what it is? It, do you think it's hyperplastic, neoplastic, adenomatous? I, well, from the uh, appearance, I think uh, the uh, in the center may be some hyperplastic uh, component. uh but uh i'm not too sure because uh, there's a mixture of a uh, pattern at the surrounding as well yeah yeah so it could be so even if the experienced person like philip says that then that must be really something that uh, we can't be sure of so what uh, we will do now do is when steps in this uh, using endobrain is you see the polyp is delineated very well i'm going to now switch on to narrow band imaging and maybe look at it carefully with narrow band so we go further down and you're looking at it carefully in narrow band so it now looks a little more adenomatous and as you said there's some areas which look have plastic but predominantly you can see we take the kudos uh, pit pattern more like adenomatous now i'm not doing yes. a staining because i don't want to do a dye staining because of this uh, endocytoscopy and the brain so basically and the brain is an endocytoscope which is very intelligent and what we're going to do next is that we get this polyp very close to our uh, to the polyp the endoscope and after getting it very close in fact you have to be in touch with the polyp after touching it we are going to use a zoom which is uh, 500 times zooming it up and now you can see we are very very close i'm going to use the zoom freeze it and then i'm going to release it and endoscope will tell us what exactly this is so it's it's a dinomatous geoplastic 94% chance so philip you agree so we'll come back again well you know <laughs> well mm -hmm. now we don't need to be agree or not because uh, the uh, computer told us uh, this is uh, the yeah. the answer but uh, it's very interesting i think uh, the uh, endo brain actually uh, help us to differentiate uh, immediately so and then the, we uh, i think from this uh, ai system uh, the analysis uh, is not based on what we know about kudo or jnet or nice but uh, totally uh, ai kind of conf yeah. uh, you so know, diagnosis So I think, uh, of course, we can't argue with the endobrain. If it says that, we have to say okay. <laughs> so, <this laughs> is, so I think this has to demonstrate this technology to the surgeons there, Philip. So I think this is a fairly interesting technology, and we seem to sort of uh, actually, at least uh, at the present, it's a good tie. And uh, over a period of time, once we get used to it very well, maybe we can use it more intelligently then. Okay. So Naki and. Uh... And I think for the argument's sake, so for example, if we are not too sure, at the same time we do the endo brain, and yeah. then the, it comes up with the neoplastic. So if during the diagnostic endoscopy, then do we still need to take a biopsy, or actually we can just go directly to do endoscopic resection? Yeah. So even if there's no endo brain in a case like this, we still go around and do a resection. Uh, do in this case, you can do an EMR. You know, I think ESD is not needed. You can, you can do an EMR because I don't see any side effects. Yes, uh, yes, just, uh, just like uh, Janet B, two B to suggest an ESD. So this would be, uh, in my opinion, 
can be taken off by an EMR. Uh, so we'll inject below, take it off with an EMR, and then get for histology. Do you agree with that? Or you will take a biopsy, Philip. Well, I I think now we have a more confident that we can uh, provide a one step, uh, you know, treatment. Uh, yeah. Especially in this case, uh, if you think the EMR is amendable, we can yeah. actually do you know direct uh, EMR. Yeah. So the uh, point is uh, still we follow the guideline if it's too large or uh, you know yeah. uh, if it's not uh, removed by one uh, snare, then we can actually do ESD. But otherwise, just uh, take it out. I think this uh, yeah. is the right direction. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Just want to show this, uh, demonstrate this new technology on the brain from Olympus, which I think is very exciting. Uh, so then we go on to the next room. Then I think GV is doing his case, probably finishing. But we also have another very interesting case for a EMR, a gastric polyp, which I think uh, probably the next room Mohan is already ready. Okay. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you. Hi, uh, GV. And if you can see that is eroded in two places. Now this part of the thing has come out here from here. The two areas of duration actually here. Now this part has come out from here. Yes. Now, another place here actually which we are trying, trying to cut through. This is the bigger one. This is one area which is where it is eroded through. This part is clear now, here. Can you see that, uh, Philip? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, it's uh, very nice. Yeah, so this part, I think this is the second part which needs to be... I think you can always go to the other theatre and come back. I think I'll finish this actually. Okay. So yeah. while you are still burning uh, your your pathway through, we can change to another room if yeah. there is another case. Ready? Yeah. So GV, as you're doing this, bone is ready. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Okay, you can go to the other theater and come back. So the next case is the clinical history. She is a young female who is a, a known case of Hughes Jagger syndrome. Uh, she has past history of small bowel interception and has underwent small bowel resection in 2018, 2008. Now she has presented with severe anemia, intermittent abdominal pain since last three months. CT is suggestive of multiple polyps in the uh, stomach and small bowel uh, with HB 9.2. So the plan will be upper endoscopy and polypectomy by Dr. Mohan Ram Chandani. Over to you, sir. So, hi. hi, Mohan. Hi. hi. So the, the, this demonstration is for uh, uh, all the surgeons who uh, just to know how the polypectomy is done because this is Peutz Jagger syndrome, and you can see there are multiple hematomatous polyps over there, and then. Uh, we need to remove these polyps because they are the cause of uh, the blood loss and uh, GA bleed. So we can see here there are multiple small polyps there in the stomach, yes. right at the G junction and uh, multiple tiny polyps which we may not remove them. But those which are larger one will remove, will go into the duodenum and see what is happening there. D1 is okay. Then we go to the D2. Yeah. Yeah. So Here, actually, wow, we can also see some duodenal polyps. Yeah. So uh, what we'll do, we'll start from here to keep on cutting them and come back to the stomach. So duodenum is a very thin structure. So I always, even if there is some pedicle I can see, but I would like to elevate this polyp using the saline. And I'll yeah, just. I think uh, right now for the duodenal uh, EMR or polypectomy, there are actually two techniques. Either you lift it up or you actually do it under the water. Yeah. So here. So either one is uh, important because uh, it would safely lift the lesion and avoid the perforation. Yes. So you can see I have lifted this polyp now. Very I... nice. 
So, and I think uh, right now for the push trigger syndrome, well, we also need to screen for the upper GI because as uh, Mohan mentioned, uh, that the uh, polyps sometimes happen and they give rise to symptom of anemia because of the uh, slow or cold uh, bleeding. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so we need to manage this lesion. Yeah. Uh, the small bowel also are very important one. They can cause into susception, intestinal obstructions. Uh, so, Enteroscopy is definitely required in such patients to completely, uh, uh, you know, do the polypectomy because patients with them have Peter Jagger have or should always be on surveillance because they can develop malignancy in other parts also. So they, they need to be on surveillance, and uh, the GI polyps basically can cause the GI bleed, and also if they are in small intestine, cause into susception. So I have just blended this polyp and I'll do suction. Please close. And we have caught this polyp completely now. Can you spray some water? So now I'll just do, a, a, I'll use endocut Q. So for all snare, use always endocut Q. Q is for snare, and I endocut. Another is endocut I. Endocut I is for needle type of uh, accessories like sphincterotom or what we were using in poem. So I'm just uh, cutting through this. You can see here. So so there is a residual polyp. So I, I'll just. Uh, Grab this and by you can put water, please. This is quite a big polyp, so I am doing a piecemeal resection. So these are not neoplastic polyps, so we should not be worried about the <clears throat> the residual polyp because we'll ultimately remove it by doing piecemeal also. So I am just trying to grab this polyp from here. I'll remove this and then go back to try to bring at six o'clock like this. <clears throat> we'll go near to that. So either you can do in a long loop or a short loop. You can see this is the cut end of the polyp. I think it's completely removed. No? This one. So, so that's almost removed. Some some part is remaining, which I will catch like this. Close. So that's also removed. Flush. So you can see nice base over there, flush. So that is the base of our polyp, which is completely, and you can see nice submucosa are there, and this is completely removed, this polyp. <clears throat> so, uh, so we'll go back to the next one. You want to apply a clip here? One because sometimes the dinner polyps tend to bleed post polypectomy. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. So we'll apply here one clip. So I agree with you, uh, Mohan. Uh, maybe for duodenum, it's better to apply the clip at the base. Uh, the other one is uh, if the patient is on anticoagulant, definitely we apply the clip to prevent the uh, delayed bleeding. So that one is renal polyp which we have removed. We'll go back to the big gastric polyp and then apply a clip till we... Uh, I'll just remove all the water from here. We'll remove the gastric polyp and then apply the clips. Here is the gastric polyp, that one. Polyp, polyp, injection, injection. So that... 
So we have to remove uh, all large polyps which are cause of GI bleed in the Peutz Jäger syndrome. And you can see here, this is another polyp in the stomach. Oh. Will elevate. Mohan, what will be the follow up in these patients as far as endoscopy is concerned? So, uh, we will call these patients every yearly uh, and, uh, and do a trans abdominal uh, or you know trans sectional imaging, also including CT. This is a lady which they, they have very high incidence of ovarian cancers, breast cancers. So, we have to do. Uh, uh, the mammography and uh, the uh, CT scan along with endoscopy. Endoscopy usually uh, is done yearly for colonoscopy and upper GI endoscopy. And also if you find uh, some polyps on a small bowel, they may require uh, uh, enteroscopical removal also. Open, open, slightly open. So we'll remove this polyp from the stomach. Go there. Close. So all patients with Peutz Jäger syndrome should have a surveillance program. Uh, you can see here nicely removed the base is uh, base is exposed. Uh, there is no residual polyp. The submucosa, which is uh, colored with the indigo carmine, is being seen. There is a small bleeder over there. I'll tackle it with the quack grasper. You can see at right at 6 o'clock, there is a small bleeder which can be easily tackled. So I'll apply clips uh, at both the, uh, both the polypectomy site and I think uh, that is the end of my uh, demonstration. I think I'll remove this big polyp from the duodenum here. Excellent job, Mohan. Great job. Thank you. We'll go back to the next room. So that is our duodenal polypectomy site. Clip, clip, oh. clip. So we'll apply the clip here on the first area, and then we'll apply a clip on the gastric side. And I'll try to remove as many as possible the small uh, polyps, which may subsequently grow in size and may cause other problem like GI bleed. So I'll just clip this base. Open. A little unconnected question, Mon. Yes. Yes. Are any of you using respirators or N95 masks when you're doing scopies, upper GI? Uh, uh, we are all all our therapeutic procedures. Uh, patients are being screened for the COVID PCR, and. Uh, uh, most of the people are using N95 respirator. I am not using because I am uh, always... <laughs> open. Close. You've got a good antibody level, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I measured my IgG antibodies. They are very, very high. So I am bit uh, towards relaxation because I can breathe now. <laughs> because I did all my efforts to, uh, you know, and get myself protected from COVID. I was using N95. I was using huge respirators, and ultimately I got it. So I thought now better to breathe at least. <clears throat> but this is not a, a guideline or anything. I think we have to keep ourselves safe. We have to use. We are we are doing multiple level uh, precautions, including screening all patients for the uh, for. Uh, 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 for uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, PCR, those who are negative are being taken, and then we are using barrier methods. You can see here. Can you show here, please? The second barrier method is between patient and doctors. A nice thin film of transparent polythene is being used, which is airtight. Patient is being uh, given oxygen inside. The third is the N95 respirator. Uh, I am being. Uh, since I have recovered from COVID recently, I'm just a bit relaxed. Otherwise, everybody is using, uh, including my technician, N95 respirator. <clears throat> yeah, excellent. And GI bleeds, you do an antigen test, is it? Uh, we do uh, PCR. So what about active GI bleeds who come unstable? 
Uh, then, and then we are using all the gowns and full, full PPE without testing. We are taking them up. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next case, uh, the clinical history is, is a 40-year-old male smoker with history of intractable cough. Uh, on endoscopy, there is a small opening in the mid esophagus uh, with bronchoesophageal fistula at 28 centimeters. He has underwent overscope placement in 2019. Uh, Presently, he has come with recurrent cuff and the endoscopy is showing a tiny residual opening in the mid esophagus. So, uh, the plan is an overscope placement that will be done by Dr. Nagesh Pradi, sir. Over to you, sir. Hmm. Hi, so this patient, uh, certain important principles that we are going to show, how to treat this benign uh, bronco or tracheal fistulas. I mean, uh, generally, when these chronic fistulas are not so easy to treat, recurrence is high, as you can see. But if you apply certain principles, then you can actually avoid differences. So I'm first doing endoscopy uh, to see this patient. is already confirmed as both by imaging and other modalities as a benign small bronchial fistula that we have. Uh, but it persists in cough and you can see that there is a, a polypoidal area here, probably from the previous uh, overscore that was put. I'm trying to locate the fistula somewhere. And as I go there, it's getting caught, which means it's somewhere here. Yeah, it's there. It's, uh, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to see if I can localize it very well. There is a small pseudopolyp there, which you can see. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, nicely seen, Nagi. Yeah, nice pseudopolyp there. So the way to get this fish fly is to, when I go near this location, I can uh, restart coming. Can you see the fish fly now here? Yeah, we just got a glimpse of that. Yeah, it's being covered by this polyp there, which I don't want to touch anyway. Ah, see, that's the one. Okay? Yeah, nicely seen. Nicely seen. So, what the principle of this here is, I'm first going to use APC to close this. Uh, so, uh, what the APC does is, it causes one edema, close it a little, and also it causes uh, de-epithelialization. So, the epithelium is taken off. So, that when you put an oil score, it gets approximated uh, well. And later on, the approximate continues. The, one of the major issues that the reason why this often fails is if this is not done. If this step is not done, then uh, it tendency to fail. So again, I'm going back. Hey, how do you choose between OSCO and padlock? They uh, are similar. We are more used to OSCO, but exactly similar. The padlock uh, is uh, it's a different mechanism. You can actually, uh, actually push out the clip. In OSCO, we actually grab the tissue, take it in, and then release it like very cell banding. But uh, I think uh, there is no comparative study between both, but I think both can be used, anything can be used. Certainly. I'm trying to go there, now get my hobby out, and then I'll manipulate the force for that. So as soon as we go near the fistula, it's getting a lot of, you can see it's getting a lot of cough, with an indication that you are near the fistula. So he's coughing a lot. So what I'm trying to do is if they can take the track and then, uh, yeah. I'm using, uh, going into the track a little also. And then trying to, yeah. So they just, you can actually use this APC. Uh, so now we have used this so that completely the edges are involved. And this area now I have to put the OSCO. One of the problems that can come up is that you can two ways of putting the OSCO. You can suck the tissue inside and then apply the OSCO. Or you can pull the tissue with the forceps. But this tissue, I don't think, come very well with the forceps. So I preferably use a suction technique. Now, we are, we'll demonstrate how OSCO can be mounted also. It's a very simple technique. Standard up with the OSCO. If the camera can focus on that. If there are several diameters, we're taking the 11 mm OSCO here. And uh, it's like a very simple banding device, it's mounted onto the scope here. And then uh, the releasing device, the wheel is a little bigger, right? you can see the wheel is a little bigger compared to the very simple banding device, but it's fixed in a similar fashion. Uh, you have to be very careful when you're actually applying a scope because one, the scope becomes bulky, so the angle is not very good. And second important thing is that uh, you, there's a tendency uh, sometimes to cast the opposite room and it should not be done, then you're closing the thing completely and we have to use a special forceps to try and break that. We have the releasing forceps also. Yeah, so now uh, 
I hope you're seeing this how it's mounted. You can see that uh, it's similar like various varices you mount it on. Uh, yeah. yeah, right, go ahead. No, no, you're watching, Nagi. Nicely seen. Yeah. So now we have to pull it back again. Yeah, pull it. Uh, pull the thread back through the biopsy forceps. So Nagi, may I ask, uh, so what size of fistula do you consider uh, to be close by the Ovesco clip? Yeah, so any fistula which is uh, less than a centimeter, usually five to six millimeter types, they are the ones which you can close. If the fistula size is more than one centimeter, then we cannot close with Ovesco because Ovesco basically is the maximum one centimeter. The problem with Ovesco is the perforations are very well treated. You can treat them very well with Ovesco, especially acute perforations. But chronic fistulas, the recurrence rates are very high, and there is a very nice study by Moin Prasad and others who showed that success rate with chronic fistulas with Ovesco is only 60%. But then the problem is in the case like this, the alternative is a major surgery. So I think um, that worthwhile a trial of this. Yes, Naki. Actually, uh, I also tackle with some of these. Uh, it's a really difficult uh, kind of operation. So if you can manage by this, it's a uh, kind of good news for the patient. Yeah. Uh, so some the other uh, options are padlock, as Rahul is mentioning. But we are more used to Ovesco, but padlock has similar effect. Uh, with Ovesco, I think a larger uh, opening can be tackled than padlock. Padlock, again, same for uh, similar thing, except also for bleeds, you can use the same thing. The other uh, issue is regarding uh, cover stand. Sometimes you can put an Ovesco and then put a cover stand for a short period of time on this. Like you have to fix the stand with the stand fixer. That's the issue. But if you can completely take the fistula in it, then you can actually, it's quite good. So we're just testing that with suction because suction is very important. Like So this is mounted now Ovesco onto the endoscope. But what happens now is there's going to be some difficulty. Can you have some... Uh, this one, the jelly. We'll also get the anchor ready if needed, but I'll try and do the suction technique here. The problem with the uh, thing now, you see, it's quite big, so the view goes down a little, and therefore getting to that area is not going to be so easy, but uh, we already have an APC that area, so, so no, good. No. Yeah, please go ahead. No, no, we, we are not getting the endoscopic view earlier, but we got it now, no worries. Yeah. So I'm trying to now, it becomes, it makes it a little more bulky, so going to the kyphopharynx is a little difficult. So now this, we can see this, in the beyond the area that I have to. So I'm going to use here uh, a suction. As soon as I go there, patient is having vigorous cough, you know. So I feel that I exclude this poly and take only this tissue. And I'm taking the tissue and then I'm going to release the OSCO now. Okay, it's released now. And you can see how nicely it is to close the fistula completely. Beautifully done, Nagi. Very nice. Very nice job. It uh, looks uh, very easy under your hands. Made a difficult job, very simple, Nagi. Thank you. Thank so you. One question, would it be worth intubating these people so they don't gag or cough during the procedure? Uh, you can technically, but then you are adding another layer to this. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it's a larger fistula, we had some instances where it's impossible to do it because the patient is coughing. We then go and intubate and then do the procedure. Right. But beautifully done. What is a difficult procedure? You may, you, I think everyone in the audience thinks big deal. I can do it as well till you get the scope in your hand. No, I think it's not too tough. It's just that you have located very well. And once you demarcate it, the APC becomes very easy to suck it and get it. Out. So, Nagi, Nagi, may I ask, uh, the, uh, is it uh, definitely necessary for the argon plasma to apply before we, you clip it? The APC. APC. Uh, the reason is we found that if you do it without the APC, when the, when the uh, opposite layers oppose each other, uh, when the, by chance if Ovesco drops off after some time, you'll find they separate again. But uh, that's the reason why the first time this failed in this patient, I think. Now, if you do a good APC, especially into the track, and then apply, AP, uh, apply the Ovesco clip, over a period of time, the surfaces which are very raw come together, uh, and then they sort of get uh, fibrous, and then the track goes off. There's a question from Dr. Rajiv Rajendran about the cost of the Vesco. Vesco, each clip costs about 40,000 rupees. Uh, so it's not too bad. 
No, and the option is to do a thoracotomy and do this, which is a huge undertaking in an unfit patient. Yes, I think this is one of the areas that Philip was also always saying. Compared to a massive surgery, a procedure like this is much more simpler. With the outpatient procedure, patient goes home the same day. Okay, so thank you. Then I think now we finish with the procedure. Probably we have two or three cases more remaining. We will shift to the next room. I think probably JB is ready with one picture there. Is available picture. Thank you, Nagi. Excellent demo. Thank you. Thank you. So the next case is a 60-year-old male who has presented to us with dysphagia. The upper endoscopy uh, done shows a stricture at 35 centimeters at the lower end of esophagus. The biopsy to rule out malignancy has shown it's a benign peptic stricture. The recurrence uh, of the dysphagia is there since uh, uh, one month. So the plan is upper endoscopy with CRE balloon dilatation, which will be done by Dr. J V Rao. What do you say? Yeah, uh, Roy, actually this is the peptic stricture, a large hiatal hernia with a reflex peptic stricture. Ideally, this sort of stricture, I don't know whether he will uh, respond to this sort of an endoscopic treatment, but we want some time for any surgical intervention, so we thought for the time being to alleviate his dysphagia, we thought to dilate the thing actually. So I'm just using the CRD balloon directly uh, here, and then I'll use a guide wire to negotiate the stricture. Already initially we have done a scope with the pediatric scope. Right. So it's a hiatal hernia with a peptic stricture. Okay. Can you pass a guide wire, please? Chloroscopy. Okay. Gone into the thing. So, so the guide wire is positioned well into the thing now. You also get a uh, CRM picture, G. Yeah. CRM. Can you show the CRM picture, please? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Go into the thing now. So I'm going to use a CRE balloon, just dilate this and then see if we can get into the thing. Alleviate his symptoms temporarily and then maybe we can get him back for surgical intervention later because of his age actually. Okay. The biggest advantage of this using the CRE balloon is actually you can literally see the fibers stretching. Yeah. GP, considering it's a recurrent structure, would you consider uh, intralesional steroids as well? Yeah. Now, Actually, I plan to do this after the dilatation. There are two ways of doing this, Roy. Right? Actually, either you can inject before or dilate subsequently, or you can dilate the stricture and subsequently inject the steroids into the thing. Actually, you can see that. Actually, you can see the fibers breaking here through the balloon here. Beautifully seen, the GV. Excellent. Okay. That's the biggest advantage. I mean, if you're using any uh, contrast, we'll not be able to appreciate this very well. But uh, we know that actually once we dilate this, we can railroad the scope along with the balloon into the stomach and we know the picture is dilated. And even here, actually, if you're having a vision like this, the base thing can be seen very clearly sometimes. Actually, you can see that small bump sort of a thing through the balloon, actually. So literally, we really don't have to use contrast, actually, it boils the balloon also. And you can see this, I'm turning all around to make sure that you're seeing all the fibers which are broken here. Okay. The duration of dilatation varies from about 30 seconds to one minute, variable from center to center. Can you see this? Excellent. Yes. Nice to see. You can see the, the distal end through the thing balloon there, actually. So now what I'm going to do is I just railroad this scope along with the thing here. Okay. So that's a 13 millimeter balloon. So I'll take this out right now, actually. GV, how do you handle a stricture if it comes back again after three months, three times around? What would your strategy be in that case? Those patients go for surgery, right? There's no doubt about it. Any role of uh, removable stents or biodegradable stents in an elderly unfit patient? I think an elderly patient, 60 plus or something like that, I think those uh, we can try the biodegradable or the fully covered stent for the timing. But in the patients, actually, uh, I think it's always better that you take them for surgery if they're not responding to initial two, three sittings of dilatation. Yeah, some of these patients will also have a shortened esophagus. Have you ever needed to do a cholesis gastroplasty in these type of patients? Yes, if they have to go for surgery, yes, they'll require some sort of gastroplasty. So now I'm going to inject some steroid here. Need now, yeah, inject some steroid, all four quadrants. Inject. Uh, the, the second way of doing it actually you can inject mitomycin also there are some trials to show that mitomycin also helps in the stricture. pictures 
So we can use uh, the steroid or mitomycin actually for refractive pictures like this. You can see that that's the hiatus there. And I literally come into the hiatus now to show that where this picture is. Can you appreciate that? Yes, we can, Jibi. Nicely seen. I can be the thing to show that the hiatus there. But this patient, suppose if he does not respond and wants to come back for surgery, I think we'll take him for surgery. Uh, now, other thing that uh, we do is actually, what you said is absolutely right. Mitomycin is uh, fully covered stent or uh, biodegradable stents which are coming into clinical practice can also be used right now. Uh, any other questions from your side, Roy, actually? No, I think this is an excellent uh, demo, Jivi. Yes, actually, a uh, lot of people actually ask whether you're injecting contrast into the balloon to show, see that wasting, actually. Yeah. The, the maximum diameter that you're achieving, actually, uh, would be more than, you're using a 13 millimeter balloon. And uh, literally, when you're as you're looking through the CRA balloon, you should be able to appreciate the fibers breaking. Sure. And you can see the bump also disappearing on the balloon. That itself is a good indication to show that. But if you're using contrast and the visibility through the thing, because it's more viscous, the visibility of the balloon becomes less. So I prefer using sign actually, and then we take it as a thing actually, and we make sure that we get a complete dilatation. Of in the meantime, that sorry, I, we could not show that mesh. Actually, the mesh has been completely removed. Right, actually, it came okay. out. Yeah, completely it came out. Uh, I think maybe you have to recheck the patient again after maybe about two weeks time just to make sure that the whole thing is epitalized. Right. Well, and all the patients that were underwent surgery are doing well. Actually, uh, all of them are doing well. Actually, just to give a feedback, all the patients, the three patients who underwent surgery here, went actually. Uh, just from the board that actually all the procedures that were done yesterday were all done. Excellent. I think both our patients then the ecclesia and fundal application also were discharged this morning. Yeah. Fully. Excellent. Thank you so much actually then being yeah. uh, here. Yeah, so right, Philip, we come to the end of the session. It's almost uh, two thirty here. Yes. It's five o'clock in Vincent. Uh, like to thank everybody for giving us this opportunity. We are told it's going to be only apogee and colon no uh, ERC yeah. So we try to show a variety of these procedures. Uh, we like to thank Apple very much for giving us this opportunity, and uh, thank uh, I think. It's been an absolute feast, Nagi. Some fantastic cases, some great calf, both yesterday and today. Most impressed with your uh, team and the effort that they put. GV obviously has been a pillar throughout organizing this meeting as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Nagi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so Roy, I think we, Roy and myself actually, uh, is Kadora there? Actually, she's the mine. Are you able to get Michael by any chance? So Michael is busy with something, GV. It's uh, going to be up to you to do the closing remarks. Kadora said you need somebody with grey hair and then I am out of that. So Philip is also not grey hair. No, so I, I, think, I think Philip, Philip is still online, so maybe you can uh, ask him as well. <laughs> so, uh, actually, the senior most person from our side would be Nagi. I think I'll ask Nagi to do the concluding remarks, actually. I don't know. I am actually. Sure. That makes me impressed. Uh, and also, probably a lot of brain hair. And I think I'm actually I'm not directly involved with Apple, but I think uh, watching what's happening over the last two days has been very impressive, especially for the younger surgeons. And I'm very thankful that senior surgeons like GB, Philip, uh, Roy, all of you are taking so much interest, uh, and Michael taking so much interest to educate uh, all the younger surgeons. Uh, we've had. A series of very interesting cases which were basics to high level so they could get an idea of what is happening and we are extremely thankful to Olympus. I think Olympus has been uh, driving this from behind for very long. Uh, they have invested a lot in terms of time, money, everything into this and we are extremely thankful to them also for giving this opportunity. I am sure it has been a great learning experience for everybody. We enjoyed doing it. We learned a lot during this process and thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Maybe you got a quick word from uh, Professor Philip before we close. Thank you. Thank you again. My sincere thanks to the entire the anesthesia team headed by Dr. Santosh here. The technicians here, both in the endoscopy room and the operating room, who have been assisting us. 
Uh, thank you so much. And uh, on behalf of uh, both myself and Roy, we profusely thank the Chairman Mike and me for giving us this opportunity to do this program in India. And uh, actually, the Secretary tells me that there's been a huge growth. Actually, more than about 1,600 people started doing this. I think I don't know. I think Kadora will give us the today's latest pictures. But I think the viewership has uh, been tremendous, and then we are quite happy that it has reached so many people uh, directly and indirectly. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of myself and uh, my co-host, Dr. Raj Patankar. Thank you very much once again for giving us this opportunity to hold a uh, uh, meeting in India. And also a special thanks to uh, Kadora and Karen for behind the scenes work. They have effortlessly and seamlessly taken care of the entire program. So we'll end by uh, letting uh, Professor Philip have the final word. Okay. Philip, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the uh, wonderful program and uh, lectures and also live demonstrations from all the faculty from India and also uh, internationally from other country. So uh, on behalf of Ape House, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for the uh, nice organization, especially um, uh, Dr. Jiwi Rao and uh, Roy and uh, also Nagi for all these organizations. Uh, this is Saturday and uh, you are working so hard for mm. this live demonstration. We appreciate so much uh, for the high quality of educational uh, value for this uh, training course. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and goodbye all. Look forward to seeing you on future April's meetings. Please stay in touch.